12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Forward. Rules? More rules, really? Isn't life complicated enough, restricting enough without abstract rules that don't take our unique, individual situations into account? And given that our brains are plastic and all develop differently based on our life experiences, why even expect that a few rules might be helpful to us all? People don't clamor for rules, even in the Bible. As when Moses comes down the mountain after a long absence, bearing the tablets inscribed with Ten Commandments, and finds the children of Israel in revelry. They'd been Pharaoh's slaves and subject to his tyrannical regulations for 400 years. And after that, Moses subjected them to the harsh desert wilderness for another 40 years to purify them of their slavishness. Now free at last, they're unbridled and have lost all control as they dance wildly around an idol, a golden calf, displaying all manner of corporeal corruption. I've got some good news. I've got some bad news. The lawgiver yells to them. Which do you want first? The, the good, good news. news. The hedonists reply. I got him from 15 commandments down to 10. <laughs> cried the unruly crowd. The and the bad? News. Well, adultery is still in. So rules there will be, but please, not too many. We are ambivalent about rules, even when we know they're good for us. If we are spirited souls, if we have character, rules seem restrictive, an affront to our sense of agency and our pride in working out our own lives. Why should we be judged according to another's rule? And judged we are. After all, God didn't give Moses the ten suggestions. He gave commandments. And if I'm a free agent, my first reaction to a command might just be that nobody, not even God, tells me what to do, even if it's good for me. But the story of the golden calf also reminds us that without rules, we quickly become slaves to our passions. And there's nothing freeing about that. And the story suggests something more. Unchaperoned and left to our own untutored judgment, we're quick to aim low and worship qualities that are beneath us. In this case, an artificial animal that brings out our own animal instincts in a completely unregulated way. The old Hebrew story makes it clear how the ancients felt about our prospects for civilized behavior in the absence of rules that seek to elevate our gaze and raise our standards. One neat thing about the Bible story is that it doesn't simply list its rules as lawyers or legislators or administrators might. It embeds them in a dramatic tale that illustrates why we need them, thereby making them easier to understand. Similarly, in this book, Professor Peterson doesn't just propose his 12 rules, he tells stories too, bringing to bear his knowledge of many fields as he illustrates and explains why the best rules do not ultimately restrict us, but instead facilitate our goals and make for fuller, freer lives. The first time I met Jordan Peterson was on September 12, 2004, at the home of two mutual friends, TV producer Wodek Zemberg and the medical internist Esther Abekir. It was Wodek's birthday party. Wodek and Esther are Polish emigre who grew up within the Soviet Empire, where it was understood that many topics were off-limits, and that casually questioning certain social arrangements and philosophical ideas, not to mention the regime itself, could mean big trouble. But now, host and hostess luxuriated in easygoing, honest talk by having elegant parties devoted to the pleasure of saying what you really thought and hearing others do the same, in an uninhibited give and take. Here the rule was, speak your mind. If the conversation turned to politics, people of different political persuasions spoke to each other, indeed looked forward to it, in a manner that is increasingly rare. Sometimes Wodek's own opinions or truths exploded out of him as did his laugh. Then we'd hug whoever had made him laugh or provoked him to speak his mind with greater intensity than even he might have intended. This was the best part of the parties, and his frankness and his warm embraces made it worth provoking him. Meanwhile, Esther's voice lilted across the room on a very precise path towards its intended listener. Truth explosions didn't make the atmosphere any less easygoing for the company. They made for more truth explosions, liberating us and more laughs and making the whole evening more pleasant. Because with de-repressing Eastern Europeans like the Zembird Beckiers, you always knew with what and with whom you were dealing, and that frankness was enlivening. Honoré de Balzac, the novelist, once described the balls and parties in his native France, observing that what appeared to be a single party was always really two. In the first hours, the gathering was suffused with bored people posing and posturing, and attendees who came to meet perhaps one special person who would confirm them in their beauty and status. Then, only in the very late hours, after most of the guests had left, would the second party, the real party, begin. Here the conversation was shared by each person present, and open-hearted laughter replaced the starchy airs. At Esther and Wodek's parties, this kind of wee hours of the morning disclosure and intimacy often began as soon as we entered the room. Wodek is a silver-haired, lion-maned hunter always on the lookout for potential public intellectuals who know how to spot people who can really talk in front of a TV camera and who look authentic, because they are. The camera picks up on that. He often invites such people to these salons. That day, Wodek brought a psychology professor from my own University of Toronto who fit the bill. Intellect and emotion in tandem. Wodek was the first to put Jordan Peterson in front of a camera and thought of him as a teacher in search of students, because he was always ready to explain, and it helped that he liked the camera, and that the camera liked him back. 
That afternoon, there was a large table set outside in the Zemberg Becker's garden. Around it was gathered the usual collection of lips and ears and loquacious virtuosos. We seemed, however, to be plagued by a buzzing paparazzi of bees, and here was this new fellow at the table, with an Albertan accent, in cowboy boots, who was ignoring them and kept on talking. He kept talking while the rest of us were playing musical chairs to keep away from the pests, yet also trying to remain at the table because this new addition to our gatherings was so interesting. He had this odd habit of speaking about the deepest questions to whoever was at this table, most of them new acquaintances, as though he were just making small talk. Or if he did do small talk, the interval between, How, how do you know Wodek and Estera? Or, I was a beekeeper once, so... I'm used to them. And more serious topics would be nanoseconds. One might hear such questions discussed at parties where professors and professionals gather, but usually the conversation would remain between two specialists in the topic, often a corner, or if shared with the whole group, it was often not without someone preening. But this Peterson, though erudite, didn't come across as a pedant. He had this enthusiasm of a kid who had just learned something new and had to share it. He seemed to be assuming, as a child would, before learning how dull adults can become, that if, if he thought something was interesting, then so might others. There was something boyish in the cowboy, in his broaching of subjects as though we had all grown up together in the same small town, or family, and had been thinking about the very same problems of human existence all along. Peterson wasn't really an eccentric. He had sufficient conversational chops, had been a Harvard professor, was a gentleman, as cowboys can be, though he did say damn and bloody a lot in a rural 1950s sort of way. But everyone listened, with a fascination on their faces, because he was in fact addressing the questions of concern to everyone at the table. There was something freeing about being with a person so learned, yet speaking in such an unedited way. His thinking was motoric. It seemed he needed to think aloud, to use his motor cortex to think. But that motor also had to run fast to work properly, to get to lift off. Not quite manic, but his idling speed revved high. Spirited thoughts were tumbling out, but unlike many academics who take the floor and hold it, if someone challenged or corrected him, he really seemed to like it. He didn't rear up and neigh. He'd say in a kind of folksy way, Yeah and bow his head involuntarily, wag it if he had overlooked something, laughing at himself for overgeneralizing. He appreciated being shown another side of an issue, and it became clear that thinking through a problem was, for him, a dialogic process. One could not but be struck by another unusual thing about him. For an egghead, Peterson was extremely practical. His examples were filled with applications to everyday life. Business management, how to make furniture, he made much of his own. Designing a simple house, making a room beautiful, now an internet meme, or in another specific case related to education, creating an online writing project that kept minority students from dropping out of school by getting them to do a kind of psychoanalytic exercise on themselves in which they would free associate about their past, present, and future, now known as the self-authoring program. I was always especially fond of Midwestern prairie types who come from a farm where they learned all about nature, or from a very small town and have worked with their hands to make things, spent long periods outside in the harsh elements, and are often self-educated and go to university against the odds. I found them quite unlike their sophisticated but somewhat denatured urban counterparts, for whom higher education was preordained, and for that reason sometimes taken for granted, or thought of not as an end in itself, but simply as a life stage in the service of career advancement. These Westerners were different, self-made, unentitled, hands-on, neighborly, and less precious than many of their big city peers, who increasingly spent their lives indoors manipulating symbols on computers. This cowboy psychologist seemed to care about a thought only if it might, in some way, be helpful to someone. We became friends. As a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who loves literature, I was drawn to him because here was a clinician who also had given himself a great books education, and who not only loved soulful Russian novels, philosophy, and ancient mythology, but who also seemed to treat them as his most treasured inheritance. But he also did illuminating statistical research on personality and temperament, and had studied neuroscience. Though trained as a behaviorist, he was powerfully drawn to psychoanalysis with its focus on dreams, archetypes, the persistence of childhood conflicts in the adult, and the role of defenses and rationalization in everyday life. He was also an outlier in being the only member of the research-oriented Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto who also kept a clinical practice. On my visits, our conversations began with banter and laughter. That was the small-town Peterson from the Alberta hinterland. His teenage years right out of the movie Fubar, welcoming you into his home. The house had been gutted by Tammy, his wife, and himself, and turned into perhaps the most fascinating and shocking middle-class home I had seen. They had art, some carved masks, and abstract portraits, but they were overwhelmed by a huge collection of original socialist realist paintings of Lenin and the early communists commissioned by the USSR. Not long after the Soviet Union fell, and most of the world breathed a sigh of relief, Peterson began purchasing this propaganda for a song online. Paintings lionizing the Soviet revolutionary spirit completely filled every single wall, the ceilings, even the bathrooms. The paintings were not there because Jordan had any totalitarian sympathies, but because he wanted to remind himself of something he knew he and everyone would rather forget. That over a hundred million people were murdered in the name of a utopia. It took getting used to. This semi-haunted house decorated by a delusion that had practically destroyed mankind. But it was eased by his wonderful and unique spouse, Tammy, who was all in, who embraced and encouraged this unusual need for expression. 
These paintings provided a visitor with the first window into the full extent of Jordan's concern about our human capacity for evil in the name of good and the psychological mystery of self-deception. How can a person deceive himself and get away with it? An interest that we share. And then there were also the hours we'd spend discussing what I might call a lesser problem. Lesser because rarer. The human capacity for evil for the sake of evil. The joy some people take in destroying others, captured famously by the 17th century English poet John Milton in Paradise Lost. And so we'd chat and have our tea in his kitchen underworld, walled by this odd art collection, a visual marker of his earnest quest to move beyond simplistic ideology, left or right, and not repeat mistakes of the past. After a while, there was nothing peculiar about taking tea in the kitchen and discussing family issues, one's latest reading with those ominous pictures hovering. It was just living in the world as it was, or in some places, is. In Jordan's first and only book before this one, Maps of Meaning, he shares his profound insights into universal themes of world mythology and explains how all cultures have created stories to help us grapple with, and ultimately map the chaos into which we are thrown at birth. This chaos is everything that is unknown to us, and any unexplored territory that we must traverse, be it in the world outside or the psyche within. Combining evolution, the neuroscience of emotion, some of the best of Jung, some of Freud, much of the great works of Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, Solzhenitsyn, Eliade, Newman, Piaget, Fry, Frankel, Maps of Meaning published nearly two decades ago, shows Jordan's wide-ranging approach to understanding how human beings and the human brain deal with the archetypal situation that arises whenever we, in our daily lives, must face something we do not understand. The brilliance of the book is in his demonstration of how rooted the situation is in evolution, our DNA, our brains, and our most ancient stories. And he shows that these stories have survived because they still provide guidance in dealing with uncertainty and the unavoidable unknown. One of the many virtues of the book you're reading now is that it provides an entry point into Maps of Meaning, which is a highly complex work because Jordan was working out his approach to psychology as he wrote it. But it was foundational because no matter how different our genes or life experiences may be, or how differently our plastic brains are wired by our experience, we all have to deal with the unknown, and we all attempt to move from chaos to order. And this is why many of the rules in this book, being based on Maps of Meaning, have an element of universality to them. Maps of Meaning was sparked by Jordan's agonized awareness as a teenager growing up in the midst of the Cold War that much of mankind seemed on the verge of blowing up the planet to defend their various identities. He felt he had to understand how it could be that people would sacrifice everything for an identity, whatever that was. And he felt he had to understand the ideologies that drove totalitarian regimes to a variant of that same behavior, killing their own citizens. In Maps of Meaning, and again in this book, one of the matters he cautions readers to be most wary of is ideology, no matter who is peddling it or to what end. Ideologies are simple ideas, disguised as science or philosophy, that purport to explain the complexity of the world and offer remedies that will perfect it. Ideologues are people who pretend they know how to make the world a better place before they've taken care of their own chaos within, the warrior identity that their ideology gives them covers over that chaos. That's hubris, of course, and one of the most important themes of this book is set your house in order first, and Jordan provides practical advice on how to do this. Ideologies are substitutes for true knowledge, and ideologues are always dangerous when they come to power, because a simple-minded, I-know-it-all approach is no match for the complexity of existence. Furthermore, when their social contraptions fail to fly, ideologues blame not themselves, but all who see through the simplifications. Another great U of T professor, Louis Foyer, in his book Ideology and the Ideologists, observed that ideologies retool the very religious stories they purport to have supplanted, but eliminate the narrative and psychological richness. Communism borrowed from the story of the children of Israel in Egypt, with an enslaved class, rich persecutors, a leader like Lenin who goes abroad, lives among the enslavers, and then leads the enslaved to the promised land, the utopia, the dictatorship of the proletariat. To understand ideology, Jordan read extensively about not only the Soviet gulag, but also the Holocaust and the rise of Nazism. I had never before met a person, born Christian and of my generation, who was so utterly tormented by what happened in Europe to the Jews, and who had worked so hard to understand how it could have occurred. I too had studied this in depth. My own father survived Auschwitz. My grandmother was middle-aged when she stood face to face with Dr. Josef Mengele, the Nazi physician who conducted unspeakably cruel experiments on his victims, and she survived Auschwitz by disobeying his order to join the line with the elderly, the gray and the weak, and instead slipping into a line with younger people. She avoided the gas chambers a second time by trading food for hair dye so she wouldn't be murdered for looking too old. My grandfather, her husband, survived the Mauthausen concentration camp but choked to death on the first piece of solid food he was given just before Liberation Day. I relate this because, years after we became friends, when Jordan would take a classical liberal stand for free speech, he would be accused by left-wing extremists as being a right-wing bigot. Let me say, with all the moderation I can summon, at best, those accusers have simply not done their due diligence. I have. With a family history such as mine, one develops not only a radar, but underwater sonar for right-wing bigotry. But even more important, one learns to recognize the kind of person with the comprehension, tools, goodwill, and courage to combat it, 
and Jordan Peterson is that person. My own dissatisfaction with modern political science's attempts to understand the rise of Nazism, totalitarianism, and prejudice was a major factor in my decision to supplement my studies of political science with the study of the unconscious, projection, psychoanalysis, the regressive potential of group psychology, psychiatry, and the brain. Jordan switched out of political science for similar reasons. With these important parallel interests, we didn't always agree on the answers, thank God, but we almost always agreed on the questions. Our friendship wasn't all doom and gloom. I have made a habit of attending my fellow professor's classes at our university, and so attended his, which were always packed, and I saw what now millions have seen online, a brilliant, often dazzling public speaker who was at his best riffing like a jazz artist. At times he resembled an ardent prairie preacher, not in evangelizing, but in his passion, in his ability to tell stories that convey the life stakes that go with believing or disbelieving various ideas. Then he just as easily switched to do a breathtakingly systematic summary of a series of scientific studies. He was a master at helping students become more reflective and take themselves and their futures seriously. He taught them to respect many of the greatest books ever written. He gave vivid examples from clinical practice, was appropriately self-revealing, even of his own vulnerabilities, and made fascinating links between evolution, the brain, and religious stories. In a world where students are taught to see evolution and religion as simply opposed by thinkers like Richard Dawkins, Jordan showed his students how evolution, of all things, helps to explain the profound psychological appeal and wisdom of many ancient stories, from Gilgamesh to the life of the Buddha, Egyptian mythology, and the Bible. He showed, for instance, how stories about journeying voluntarily into the unknown, the hero's quest, mirror universal tasks for which the brain evolved. He respected the stories, was not reductionist, and never claimed to exhaust their wisdom. If he discussed a topic such as prejudice, or its emotional relatives fear and disgust, or the differences between the sexes on average, he was able to show how these traits evolved and why they survived. Above all, he alerted his students to topics rarely discussed in university, such as the simple fact that all the ancients, from Buddha to the biblical authors, knew what every slightly worn out adult knows, that life is suffering. If you are suffering, or someone close to you is, that's sad. But alas, it's not particularly special. We don't suffer only because politicians are dimwitted, or the system is corrupt, or because you and I, like almost everyone else, can legitimately describe ourselves in some way as a victim of something or someone. It is because we are born human that we are guaranteed a good dose of suffering. And chances are, if you or someone you love is not suffering now, they will be within five years, unless you are freakishly lucky. Rearing kids is hard. Work is hard. Aging, sickness, and death are hard. And Jordan emphasized that doing all that totally on your own without the benefit of a loving relationship or wisdom or the psychological insights of the greatest psychologies only makes it harder. He wasn't scaring the students. In fact, they found this frank talk reassuring because in the depths of their psyches, most of them knew what he said was true, even if there was never a forum to discuss it. Perhaps because the adults in their lives had become so naively overprotective that they deluded themselves into thinking that not talking about suffering would in some way magically protect their children from it. Here he would relate the myth of the hero, a cross-cultural theme explored psychoanalytically by Otto Rank, who noted, following Freud, that hero myths are similar in many cultures, a theme that was picked up by Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, and Eric Newman, among others. Where Freud made great contributions in explaining neurosis by, among other things, focusing on understanding what we might call a failed hero story, that of Oedipus, Jordan focused on triumphant heroes. In all these triumph stories, the hero has to go into the unknown, into an unexplored territory, and deal with a great new challenge and take great risks. In the process, something of himself has to die or be given up so that he can be reborn and meet the challenge. This requires courage, something rarely discussed in a psychology class or textbook. During his recent public stand for free speech and against what I call forced speech, because it involves a government forcing citizens to voice political views, the stakes were very high. He had much to lose and knew it. Nonetheless, I saw him, and Tammy for that matter, not only display such courage, but also continue to live by many of the rules in this book, some of which can be very demanding. I saw him grow from the remarkable person he was into someone even more able and assured through living by these rules. In fact, it was the process of writing this book and developing these rules that led him to take the stand he did against forced or compelled speech. And that is why, during those events, he started posting some of his thoughts about life and these rules on the internet. Now, over a hundred million YouTube hits later, we know they have struck a chord. Given our distaste for rules, how do we explain the extraordinary response to his lectures which give rules? In Jordan's case, it was of course his charisma and a rare willingness to stand for a principle that got him a wide hearing online initially. Views of his first YouTube statements quickly numbered in the hundreds of thousands. But people have kept listening because what he's saying meets a deep and unarticulated need. And that is because, alongside our wish to be free of rules, we all search for structure. The hunger among many younger people for rules, or at least guidelines, is greater today for good reason. In the West, at least, millennials are living through a unique historical situation. They are, I believe, the first generation to have been so thoroughly taught two seemingly contradictory ideas about morality simultaneously at their schools, colleges, and universities by many in our own generation. 
This contradiction has left them at times disoriented and uncertain, without guidance, and more tragically, deprived of riches they don't even know exist. The first idea or teaching is that morality is relative, at best a personal value judgment. Relative means that there is no absolute right or wrong in anything. Instead, morality and the rules associated with it are just a matter of personal opinion or happenstance, relative to or related to a particular framework, such as one's ethnicity or one's upbringing or the cultural or historical moment one is born into. It's nothing but an accident of birth. According to this argument, now a creed, history teaches that religion, tribes, nations, and ethnic groups tend to disagree about fundamental matters, and always have. Today, the postmodernist left makes the additional claim that one's group morality is nothing but its attempt to exercise power over another group. So the decent thing to do, once it becomes apparent how arbitrary your and your society's moral values are, is to show tolerance for people who think differently and who come from different, diverse backgrounds. That emphasis on tolerance is so paramount that for many people one of the worst character flaws a person can have is to be quote-unquote judgmental. And since we don't know right from wrong or what is good, just about the most inappropriate thing an adult can do is give a young person advice about how to live. And so, a generation has been raised untutored in what was once called aptly practical wisdom, which guided previous generations. Millennials, often told they have received the finest education available anywhere, have actually suffered a form of serious intellectual and moral neglect. The relativists of my generation and Jordan's, many of whom became their professors, chose to devalue thousands of years of human knowledge about how to acquire virtue, dismissing it as passé, not relevant, or even oppressive. They were so successful at it that the very word virtue sounds out of date and someone using it appears anachronistically moralistic and self-righteous. Start note on the word judgmental. Some argue, mistakenly, that Freud, often mentioned in these pages, contributed to our current longing for a culture, schools, and institutions that are quote-unquote non-judgmental. It is true that he recommended that when psychoanalysts listen to their patients in therapy, they be tolerant, empathetic, and not voice critical, moralistic judgments. But this was for the express purposes of helping patients feel comfortable in being totally honest, and not diminish their problems. This encouraged self-reflection and allowed them to explore warded off feelings, wishes, even shameful antisocial urges. It also, and this was the masterstroke, allowed them to discover their own unconscious conscience and its judgments, and their own harsh self-criticism of their own lapses, and their own unconscious guilt, which they had often hidden from themselves, but which they often formed the basis of their low self-esteem, depression, anxiety. If anything, Freud showed that we are both immoral and more moral than we are aware of. This kind of quote-unquote non-judgmentalism in therapy is a powerful and liberating technique or tactic, an ideal attitude when you want to better understand yourself. But Freud never argued, as do some who want all culture to become one huge group therapy session, that one can live one's entire life without ever making judgments or without morality. In fact, his point in Civilization and its Discontents is that civilization only arises when some restraining rules and morality are in place. Continuation the study of virtue is not quite the same as the study of morals, right and wrong, good and evil. Aristotle defined the virtues simply as the ways of behaving that are most conducive to happiness in life. Vice was defined as the ways of behaving least conducive to happiness. He observed that the virtues always aim for balance and avoid the extremes of the vices. Aristotle studied the virtues and the vices in his Nicomachean Ethics. It was a book based on experience and observation, not conjecture, about the kind of happiness that was possible for human beings. Cultivating judgment about the difference between virtue and vice is the beginning of wisdom, something that can never be out of date. By contrast, our modern relativism begins by asserting that making judgments about how to live is impossible, because there is no real good and no true virtue, as these two are relative. Thus, relativism's closest approximation to virtue is tolerance. Only tolerance will provide social cohesion between different groups and save us from harming each other. On Facebook and other forms of social media, therefore, you signal your so-called virtue, telling everyone how tolerant, open, and compassionate you are, and wait for likes to accumulate. Leave aside that telling people you're virtuous isn't a virtue, it's self-promotion. Virtue signaling is not virtue. Virtue signaling is, quite possibly, our commonest vice. Intolerance of others' views, no matter how ignorant or incoherent they may be, is not simply wrong. In a world where there is no right or wrong, it is worse. It is a sign you are embarrassingly unsophisticated or possibly dangerous. But it turns out that many people cannot tolerate the vacuum, the chaos, which is inherent in life, but made worse by this moral relativism. They cannot live without a moral compass, without an ideal at which to aim in their lives. For relativists, ideals are values too, and like all values, they are merely relative and hardly worth sacrificing for. So, right alongside relativism, we find the spread of nihilism and despair, and also the opposite of moral relativism, the blind certainty offered by ideologies that claim to have an answer for everything. And so we arrive at the second teaching that millennials have been bombarded with. 
They sign up for a humanities course to study the greatest books ever written, but they're not assigned the books. Instead, they are given ideological attacks on them based on some appalling simplification. Where the relativist is filled with uncertainty, the ideologue is the very opposite. He or she is hyperjudgmental and censorious, always knows what's wrong about others and what to do about it. Sometimes it seems the only people willing to give advice in a relativistic society are those with the least to offer. Modern moral relativism has many sources. As we in the West learned more history, we understood that different epochs had different moral codes. As we traveled the seas and explored the globe, we learned of far-flung tribes on different continents whose different moral codes made sense relative to or within the framework of their societies. Science played a role, too, by attacking the religious view of the world and thus undermining the religious grounds for ethics and rules. Materialist social science implied that we could divide the world into facts, which we all could observe and were objective and real, and values, which were subjective and personal. Then we could first agree on the facts and maybe one day develop a scientific code of ethics, which has yet to arrive. Moreover, by implying that values had a lesser reality than facts, science contributed in yet another way to moral relativism, for it treated value as secondary. But the idea that we can easily separate facts and values was and remains naive. To some extent, one's values determine what one will pay attention to and what will count as fact. The idea that different societies had different rules and morals was known to the ancient world too, and it is interesting to compare its response to this realization with the modern response, relativism, nihilism, and ideology. When the ancient Greeks sailed to India and elsewhere, they too discovered that rules, morals, and customs differed from place to place, and saw that the explanation for what was right and wrong was often rooted in some ancestral authority. The Greek response was not despair, but a new invention, philosophy. Socrates, reacting to the uncertainty bred by awareness of these conflicting moral codes, decided that instead of becoming a nihilist, a relativist, or an ideologue, he would devote his life to the search for wisdom that could reason about these differences, i.e., he helped invent philosophy. He spent his life asking perplexing, foundational questions such as, what is virtue? And, how can one live the good life? And, what is justice? And he looked at different approaches, asking which seemed most coherent and most in accord with human nature. These are the kinds of questions that I believe animate this book. For the ancients, the discovery that different people have different ideas about how practically to live did not paralyze them, it deepened their understanding of humanity and led to some of the most satisfying conversations human beings have ever had about how life might be lived. Likewise, Aristotle. Instead of despairing about these differences in moral codes, Aristotle argued that those specific rules, laws, and customs differed from place to place. What does not differ is that in all places, human beings, by their nature, have a proclivity to make rules, laws, and customs. To put this in modern terms, it seems that all human beings are, by some kind of biological endowment, so ineradicably concerned with morality that we create a structure of laws and rules wherever we are. The idea that human life can be free of moral concerns is a fantasy. We are rule generators, and given that we are moral animals, what must be the effect of our simplistic modern relativism upon us? It means we are hobbling ourselves by pretending to be something that we are not. It is a mask, but a strange one, for it mostly deceives the one who wears it. Scratch the most clever postmodern relativist professor's Mercedes with a key, and you will see how fast the mask of relativism, with its pretense that there can be neither right or wrong, and the cloak of radical tolerance come off. Because we do not yet have an ethics based on modern science, Jordan is not trying to develop his rules by wiping the slate clean, by dismissing thousands of years of wisdom as mere superstition and ignoring our greatest moral achievements. Far better to integrate the best of what we are now, learning with the books human beings saw fit to preserve over millennia, and with the stories that have survived, against all odds, time's tendency to obliterate. He is doing what reasonable guides have always done. He makes no claim that human wisdom begins with himself, but rather, turns first to his own guides. And although the topics in this book are serious, Jordan often has a great fun addressing them with a light touch, as the chapter headings convey. He makes no claim to be exhaustive, and sometimes the chapters consist of wide-ranging discussions of our psychology as he understands it. So why not call this book of guidelines a far more relaxed, user-friendly, and less rigid-sounding term than rules? Because these really are rules. And the foremost rule is that you must take responsibility for your own life, period. One might think that a generation that has heard endlessly from their more ideological teachers about the rights, rights, rights that belong to them would object to being told that they would do better to focus instead on taking responsibility. Yet, this generation many of whom were raised in small families by hyper-protective parents on soft-surface playgrounds and then taught in universities with safe spaces where they don't have to hear things they don't want to, school to be risk-averse, has among it now millions who feel stultified by this underestimation of their potential resilience and who have embraced Jordan's message that each individual has ultimate responsibility to bear. That if one wants to live a full life, one first sets one's own house in order, and only then can one sensibly aim to take on bigger responsibilities. 
The extent of this reaction has often moved both of us to the brink of tears. Sometimes these rules are demanding. They require you to undertake an incremental process that over time will stretch you to a new limit. That requires, as I've said, venturing into the unknown. Stretching yourself beyond the boundaries of your current self requires carefully choosing and then pursuing ideals. Ideals that are up there, above you, superior to you, and that you can't always be sure you will reach. But if it's uncertain that our ideals are attainable, why do we bother reaching in the first place? Because if you don't reach for them, it is certain you will never feel that your life has meaning. And perhaps because, as unfamiliar and strange as it sounds, in the deepest part of our psyche, we all want to be judged. Dr. Norman Deutsch, MD, is the author of The Brain That Changes Itself. 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Overture This book has a short history and a long history. We'll begin with the short history. In 2012, I started contributing to a website called Quora. On Quora, anyone can ask a question of any sort, and anyone can answer. Readers upvote those answers they like and downvote those they don't. In this manner, the most useful answers rise to the top, while the others sink into oblivion. I was curious about the site. I liked its free-for-all nature. The discussion was often compelling, and it was interesting to see the diverse range of opinions generated by the same question. When I was taking a break, or avoiding work, I often turned to Quora looking for questions to engage with. I considered, and eventually answered, such questions as, What's the difference between being happy and being content? What things get better as you age? And, What makes life more meaningful? Quora tells you how many people have viewed your answer and how many upvotes you received. Thus, you can determine your reach and see what people think of your ideas. Only a small minority of those who view an answer upvote it. As of July 2017, as I write this, and five years after I addressed what makes life more meaningful, my answer to that question has received a relatively small audience, 14,000 views and 133 upvotes, while my response to the question about aging has been viewed by 7,200 people and received 36 upvotes. Not exactly home runs. However, it's to be expected. On such sites, most answers receive very little attention while a tiny minority become disproportionately popular. Soon after, I answered another question. What are the most valuable things everyone should know? I wrote a list of rules or maxims, some dead serious, some tongue-in-cheek. Be grateful in spite of your suffering. Do not do things that you hate. Do not hide things in the fog, and so on. The Quora readers appeared pleased with this list. They commented on and shared it. They said such things as, I'm definitely printing this list out and keeping it as a reference. Simply phenomenal. And, you win Quora. We can just close the site now. Students at the University of Toronto, where I teach, came up to me and told me how much they liked it. To date, my answer to, what are the most valuable things, has been viewed by 120,000 people and been upvoted 2,300 times. Only a few hundred of the roughly 600,000 questions on Quora have cracked the 2,000 upvote barrier. My procrastination-induced musings hit a nerve. I had written a 99.9 percentile answer. It was not obvious to me when I wrote the list of rules for living that it was going to perform so well. I had put a fair bit of care into all the 60 or so answers I submitted in the few months surrounding that post. Nonetheless, Quora provides market research at its finest. The respondents are anonymous. They're disinterested in the best sense. Their opinions are spontaneous and unbiased. So I paid attention to the results and thought about the reasons for that answer's disproportionate success. Perhaps I struck the right balance between the familiar and the unfamiliar while formulating the rules. Perhaps people were drawn to the structure that such rules imply. Perhaps people just like lists. A few months earlier, in March of 2012, I had received an email from a literary agent. She had heard me speak on CBC Radio during a show entitled Just Say No to Happiness, where I had criticized the idea that happiness was the proper goal for life. Over the previous decades, I had read more than my share of dark books about the 20th century, focusing particularly on Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great documenter of the slave labor camp horrors of the latter, once wrote that the pitiful ideology holding that human beings are created for happiness was an ideology done in by the first blow of the works of Seiner's cudgel. In a crisis, the inevitable suffering that life entails can rapidly make a mockery of the idea that happiness is the proper pursuit of the individual. On the radio show, I suggested, instead, that a deeper meaning was required. I noted that the nature of such meaning was constantly represented in the great stories of the past, and that it had more to do with developing character in the face of suffering than with happiness. This is part of the long history of the present work. From 1985 until 1999, I worked for about three hours a day on the only other book I have ever published, Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief. During that time, and in the years since, I also taught a course on the material in that book, first at Harvard, and now at the University of Toronto. In 2013, observing the rise of YouTube, and because of the popularity of some work I had done with TVO, a Canadian public TV station, I decided to film my university and public lectures and place them online. They attracted an increasingly large audience, more than a million views by April 2016. The number of views has risen very dramatically since then, up to 18 million as I write this. 
but that is in part because I became embroiled in a political controversy that drew an inordinate amount of attention. That's another story, maybe even another book. I proposed in Maps of Meaning that the great myths and religious stories of the past, particularly those derived from an earlier oral tradition, were moral in their intent rather than descriptive. Thus, they did not concern themselves with what the world was as a scientist might have it, but with how a human being should act. I suggested that our ancestors portrayed the world as a stage, a drama, instead of a place of objects. I described how I had come to believe that the constituent elements of the world as a drama were order and chaos, not material things. Order is where the people around you act according to well-understood social norms and remain predictable and cooperative. It's the world of social structure, explored territory, and familiarity. The state of order is typically portrayed, symbolically, imaginatively, as masculine. It's the wise king and the tyrant, forever bound together as society is simultaneously structure and oppression. Chaos, by contrast, is where, or when, something unexpected happens. Chaos emerges in trivial form when you tell a joke at a party with people you think you know and a silent and embarrassing chill falls over the gathering. Chaos is what emerges more catastrophically when you suddenly find yourself without employment or are betrayed by a lover. As the antithesis of symbolically masculine order, it's presented imaginatively as feminine. It's the new and unpredictable, suddenly emerging in the midst of the commonplace familiar. It's creation and destruction, the source of new things and the destination of the dead, as nature, opposed to culture, is simultaneously birth and demise. Order and chaos are the yang and yin of the famous Taoist symbol, two serpents, head to tail. Starred note. The yin-yang symbol is the second part of the more comprehensive five-part Tajitu, a diagram representing both the original absolute unity and its division into the multiplicity of the observed world. This is discussed in more detail in Rule 2, below, as well as elsewhere in the book. Continuation. Order is the white, masculine serpent, chaos, its black, feminine counterpart. The black dot in the white and the white in the black indicate the possibility of transformation. Just when things seem secure, the unknown can loom, unexpectedly enlarge. Conversely, just when everything seems lost, new order can emerge from catastrophe and chaos. For the Taoists, meaning is to be found on the border between the ever-entwined pair. To walk that border is to stay on the path of life, the divine way. And that's much better than happiness. The literary agent I referred to listened to the CBC radio broadcast where I discussed such issues. It left her asking herself deeper questions. She emailed me, asking if I had considered writing a book for a general audience. I had previously attempted to produce a more accessible version of Maps of Meaning, which is a very dense book, but I found that the spirit was neither in me during that attempt nor in the resultant manuscript. I think this was because I was imitating my former self and my previous book instead of occupying the place between order and chaos, producing something new. I suggested that she watch four of the lectures I had done for a TVO program called Big Ideas on my YouTube channel. I thought if she did that we could have a more informed and thorough discussion about what kind of topics I might address in a more publicly accessible book. She contacted me a few weeks later after watching all four lectures and discussing them with a colleague. Her interest had been further heightened, as had her commitment to the project. That was promising and unexpected. I'm always surprised when people respond positively to what I am saying, given its seriousness and strange nature. I'm amazed I have been allowed, even encouraged, to teach what I taught first in Boston and now in Toronto. I've always thought that if people really noticed what I was teaching, there'd be hell to pay. You can decide for yourself what truth there might be in that concern after reading this book. Smiley face. She suggested that I write a guide of sorts to what a person needs to live well, whatever that might mean. I thought immediately about my Quora list. I had, in the meantime, written some further thoughts about the rules I had posted. People had responded positively toward those new ideas as well. It seemed to me, therefore, there might be a nice fit between the Quora list and my new agent's ideas. So I sent her the list. Liked it. At about the same time, a friend and former student of mine, the novelist and screenwriter Greg Hurwitz, was considering a new book, which would become the best-selling thriller Orphan X. He liked the rules too. He had Mia, the book's female lead, post a selection of them one by one on her fridge at points in the story where they seemed apropos. That was another piece of evidence supporting my supposition of their attractiveness. I suggested to my agent that I write a brief chapter on each of the rules. She agreed, so I wrote a book proposal suggesting as much. When I started writing the actual chapters, however, they weren't at all brief. I had much more to say about each rule than I had originally envisioned. This was partly because I had spent a very long time researching my first book, studying history, mythology, neuroscience, psychoanalysis, child psychology, poetry, and large sections of the Bible. I read, and perhaps even understood, much of Milton's Paradise Lost, Goethe's Faust, and Dante's Inferno. I integrated all of that, for better or worse, trying to address a perplexing problem, the reason or reasons for the nuclear standoff of the Cold War. I couldn't understand how, how belief systems could be so important to people that they were willing to risk the destruction of the world to protect them. I came to realize that shared belief systems made people intelligible to one another, and that the systems weren't just about belief. People who live by the same code are rendered mutually predictable to one another. 
They act in keeping with each other's expectations and desires. They can cooperate. They can even compete peacefully because everyone knows what to expect from everyone else. A shared belief system, partly psychological, partly acted out, simplifies everyone in their own eyes and in the eyes of others. Shared beliefs simplify the world as well because people who know what to expect from one another can act together to tame the world. There is perhaps nothing more important than the maintenance of this organization, this simplification. If it's threatened, the great ship of state rocks. It isn't precisely that people will fight for what they believe. They will fight instead to maintain the match between what they believe, what they expect, and what they desire. They will fight to maintain the match between what they expect and how everyone is acting. It is precisely the maintenance of that match that enables everyone to live together peacefully, predictably, and productively. It reduces uncertainty and the chaotic mix of intolerable emotions that uncertainty inevitably produces. Imagine, imagine someone betrayed by a trusted lover. The sacred social contract obtaining between the two has been violated. Actions speak louder than words, and an act of betrayal disrupts the fragile and carefully negotiated peace of an intimate relationship. In the aftermath of disloyalty, people are seized by terrible emotions, disgust, contempt for self and traitor, guilt, anxiety, rage, and dread. Conflict is inevitable, sometimes with deadly results. Shared belief systems, shared systems of agreed-upon conduct and expectation, regulate and control all of those powerful forces. It's no wonder that people will fight to protect something that saves them from being possessed by emotions of chaos and terror, and after that from degeneration into strife and combat. There's more to it, too. A shared cultural system stabilizes human interaction, but it is also a system of value, a hierarchy of value, where some things are given priority and importance, and others are not. In the absence of such a system of value, people simply cannot act. In fact, they can't even perceive, because both action and perception require a goal, and a valid goal is, by necessity, something valued. We experience much of our positive emotion in relation to goals. We are not happy, technically speaking, unless we see ourselves progressing, and the very idea of progression implies value. Worse yet is the fact that the meaning of life without positive value is not simply neutral. Because we are vulnerable and mortal, pain and anxiety are an integral part of human existence. But we must have something to set against the suffering that is intrinsic to being. Start note on being. I use the term being, with a capital B, in part because of my exposure to the ideas of the 20th century German philosopher Martin Heidegger. Heidegger tried to distinguish between reality, as conceived objectively, and the totality of human experience, which is his being. Being, with a capital B, is what each of us experiences, subjectively, personally, and individually, as well as what we each experience jointly with others. As such, it includes emotions, drives, dreams, visions, and revelations, as well as our private thoughts and perceptions. Being is also, finally, something that is brought into existence by action, so its nature is to an indeterminate degree a consequence of our decisions and choices, something shaped by our hypothetically free will. Construed in this manner, being is, one, not something easily and directly reducible to the material and objective, and two, something that most definitely requires its own terms, as Heidegger labored for decades to indicate. Continuation. We must have the meaning inherent in a profound system of value, or the horror of existence rapidly becomes paramount. Then, nihilism beckons with its hopelessness and despair. So, no value, no meaning. Between value systems, however, there is the possibility of conflict. We are thus eternally caught between the most diamantine rock and the hardest of places. Loss of group-centered belief renders life chaotic, miserable, intolerable. Presence of group-centered beliefs make conflict with other groups inevitable. In the West, we have been withdrawing from our tradition, religion, and even nation-centered cultures, partly to decrease the danger of group conflict. But we are increasingly falling prey to the desperation of meaninglessness, and that is no improvement at all. While writing Maps of Meaning, I was also driven by the realization that we can no longer afford conflict, certainly not on the scale of the world conflagrations of the 20th century. Our technologies of destruction have become too powerful. The potential consequences of war are literally apocalyptic, but we cannot simply abandon our systems of value, our beliefs, our cultures either. I agonized over this apparently intractable problem for months. Was there a third way, invisible to me? I dreamt one night during this period that I was suspended in mid-air, clinging to a chandelier many stories above the ground, directly under the dome of a massive cathedral. The people on the floor below were distant and tiny. There was a great expanse between me and any wall, and even the peak of the dome itself. I've learned to pay attention to dreams, not least because of my training as a clinical psychologist. Dreams shed light on the dim places where reason itself has yet to voyage. I have studied Christianity a fair bit, too, more than other religious traditions, although I am always trying to redress this lack. Like others, therefore, I must and do draw more from what I do know than from what I do not. 
I knew that cathedrals were constructed in the shape of a cross and that the point under the dome was the center of the cross. I knew that the cross was simultaneously the point of greatest suffering, the point of death and transformation, and the symbolic center of the world. That was not somewhere I wanted to be. I managed to get down out of the heights, out of the symbolic sky, back to safe, familiar, anonymous ground. I don't know how. Then, still in my dream, I returned to my bedroom and my bed and tried to return to sleep and the peace of unconsciousness. As I relaxed, however, I could feel my body transported. A great wind was dissolving me, preparing to propel me back to the cathedral, to place me once again at that central point. There was no escape. It was a true nightmare. I forced myself awake. The curtains behind me were blowing in over my pillows. Half asleep, I looked at the foot of the bed. I saw the great cathedral doors. I shook myself completely awake and they disappeared. My dream placed me at the center of being itself, and there was no escape. It took me months to understand what this meant. During this time, I came to a more complete, personal realization of what the great stories of the past continually insist upon us. The center is occupied by the individual. The center is marked by the cross as X marks the spot. Existence at that cross is suffering and transformation, and that fact, above all, needs to be voluntarily accepted. It is possible to transcend slavish adherence to the group and its doctrines and simultaneously to avoid the pitfalls of its opposite extreme, nihilism. It is possible instead to find sufficient meaning in individual consciousness and experience. How could the world be freed from the terrible dilemma of conflict on the one hand and psychological and social disillusion on the other? The answer was this. Through the elevation and development of the individual and through the willingness of everyone to shoulder the burden of being and to take the heroic path. We must each adopt as much responsibility as possible for individual life, society, and the world. We must each tell the truth and repair what is in disrepair and break down and recreate what is old and outdated. It is in this manner that we can and must reduce the suffering that poisons the world. It's asking a lot. It's asking for everything. But the alternative? The horror of authoritarian belief? The chaos of the collapsed state? the tragic catastrophe of the unbridled natural world, the existential angst and weakness of the purposeless individual, is clearly worse. I've been thinking and lecturing about such ideas for decades. I've built up a large corpus of stories and concepts pertaining to them. I'm not for a moment claiming, however, that I am entirely correct or complete in my thinking. Being is far more complicated than one person can know, and I don't have the whole story. I'm simply offering the best I can manage. In any case, the consequence of all that previous research and thinking was the new essays which eventually became this book. My initial idea was to write a short essay on all 40 of the answers I had provided to Cora. That proposal was accepted by Penguin Random House Canada. While writing, however, I cut the essay number to 25, and then to 16, and finally to the current 12. I've been editing that remainder with the help and care of my official editor, and with the vicious and horribly accurate criticism of Hurwitz mentioned previously, for the past three years. It took a long time to settle on a title. Twelve Rules for Life, Antidote to Chaos. Why did that one rise up above all others? First and foremost, because of its simplicity. It indicates clearly that people need ordering principles and that chaos otherwise beckons. We require rules, standards, values, alone and together. We're pack animals, beasts of burden. We must bear a load to justify our miserable existence. We require routine and tradition. That's order. Order can become excessive, and that's not good. But chaos can swamp us, so we drown. And that's also not good. We need to stay on the straight and narrow path. Each of the 12 rules of this book, and their accompanying essays, therefore provide a guide to being there. There is the dividing line between order and chaos. That's where we are simultaneously stable enough, exploring enough, transforming enough, repairing enough, and cooperating enough. It's there we find the meaning that justifies life and its inevitable suffering. Perhaps, if we lived properly, we would be able to tolerate the weight of our own self-consciousness. Perhaps, if we lived properly, we could withstand the knowledge of our own fragility and mortality without the sense of aggrieved victimhood that produces first resentment, then envy, and then the desire for vengeance and destruction. Perhaps, if we lived properly, we wouldn't have to turn to totalitarian certainty to shield ourselves from the knowledge of our own insufficiency and ignorance. Perhaps, we'd come to avoid those pathways to hell. And we have seen in the terrible 20th century just how real hell can be. I hope that these rules and their accompanying essays will help people understand what they already know, that the soul of the individual eternally hungers for the heroism of genuine being, and that the willingness to take on that responsibility is identical to the decision to live a meaningful life. If we each live properly, we will collectively flourish. Best wishes to you all as you proceed through these pages. Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, Clinical Psychologist and Professor of Psychology. 
12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Rule 1. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. Lobsters and territory. If you're like most people, you don't often think about lobsters, unless you're eating one. However, these interesting and delicious crustaceans are very much worth considering. Their nervous systems are comparatively simple, with large, easily observable neurons, the magic cells of the brain. Because of this, scientists have been able to map the neural circuitry of lobsters very accurately. This has helped us understand the structure and function of the brain and behavior of more complex animals, including human beings. Lobsters have more in common with you than you might think, particularly when you're feeling crabby. <laughs> lobsters live on the ocean floor. They need a home base down there, a range within which they hunt for prey and scavenge around for stray edible bits and pieces of whatever rains down from the continual chaos of carnage and death far above. They want somewhere secure, where the hunting and the gathering is good. They want a home. This can present a problem, since there are many lobsters. What if two of them occupy the same territory at the bottom of the ocean, at the same time, and both want to live there? What if there are hundreds of lobsters, all trying to make a living and raise a family in the same crowded patch of sand and refuse? Other creatures have this problem, too. When songbirds come north in the spring, for example, they engage in ferocious territorial disputes. The songs they sing, so peaceful and beautiful to human ears, are siren calls and cries of domination. A brilliantly musical bird is a small warrior proclaiming his sovereignty. Take the wren, for example a small, feisty, insect-eating songbird common in North America. A newly arrived wren wants a sheltered place to build a nest away from the wind and rain. He wants it close to food and attractive to potential mates. He also wants to convince competitors for that space to keep their distance. Birds and Territory My dad and I designed a house for a wren family when I was 10 years old. It looked like a Conestoga wagon and had a front entrance about the size of a quarter. This made it a good house for wrens who are tiny and not so good for other larger birds who couldn't get in. My elderly neighbor had a birdhouse, too, which we built for her at the same time, from an old rubber boot. It had an opening large enough for the bird the size of a robin. She was looking forward to the day it was occupied. A wren soon discovered our birdhouse and made himself at home there. We could hear his lengthy, trilling song repeated over and over during the early spring. Once he'd built his nest in the covered wagon, however, our new avian tenant started carrying small sticks to our neighbor's nearby boot. He packed it so full that no other bird, large or small, could possibly get in. Our neighbor was not pleased by this preemptive strike, but there was nothing to be done about it. If we take it down, said my dad, clean it up, and put it back in the tree, the wren will just pack it full of sticks again. Wrens are small, and they're cute, but they're merciless. I had broken my leg skiing the previous winter, first time down the hill, and had received some money from a school insurance policy designed to reward unfortunate, clumsy children. I purchased a cassette recorder, a high-tech novelty at the time, with the proceeds. My dad suggested that I sit on the back lawn, record the wren's song, play it back, and watch what happened. So I went out into the bright spring sunlight and taped a few minutes of the wren laying furious claim to his territory with song. Then I let him hear his own voice. That little bird, one-third the size of a sparrow, began to dive-bomb me and my cassette recorder, swooping back and forth inches from the speaker. We saw a lot of that sort of behavior, even in the absence of the tape recorder. If a larger bird ever dared to sit and rest in any of the trees near our birdhouse, there was a good chance he would get knocked off his perch by kamikaze wren. Now, wrens and lobsters are very different. Lobsters do not fly, sing, or perch in trees. Wrens have feathers, not hard shells. Wrens can't breathe underwater and are seldom served with butter. However, they are also similar in important ways. Both are obsessed with status and position, for example, like a great many creatures. The Norwegian zoologist and comparative psychologist Thorleif Sheldrup Eb... Gotta look that one up. Psychologist Thorleif Sheldrup Ebby observed, back in 1921, that even common barnyard chickens establish a pecking order. The determination of who's who in the chicken world has important implications for each individual bird's survival, particularly in times of scarcity. The birds that always have priority access to whatever food is sprinkled out in the yard in the morning are the celebrity chickens. After them come the second stringers, the hangers-on and wannabes, then the third-rate chickens have their turn, and so on, down to the bedraggled, partially feathered, and badly pecked wretches who occupy the lowest, untouchable stratum of the chicken hierarchy. Chickens, like suburbanites, live communally. Songbirds, such as wrens, do not but they still inhabit a dominance hierarchy. It's just spread out over more territory. The williest, strongest, healthiest, and most fortunate birds occupy prime territory and defend it. Because of this, they are more likely to attract high-quality mates and to hatch chicks who survive and thrive. Protection from wind, rain, and predators, as well as easy access to superior food, makes for a much less stressed existence. Territory matters, and there is little difference between territorial rights and social status. It is often a matter of life and death. If a contagious avian disease sweeps through a neighborhood of well-stratified songbirds, it is the least dominant and most stressed birds occupying the lowest rungs of the bird world who are most likely to sicken and die. This is equally true of human neighborhoods when bird flu viruses and other illnesses sweep across the planet. 
The poor and stressed always die first, and in greater numbers. They are also much more susceptible to non-infectious diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. When the aristocracy catches a cold, as it is said, the working class dies of pneumonia. Because territory matters, and because the best locales are always in short supply, territory seeking among animals produces conflict. Conflict, in turn, produces another problem. How to win or lose without the disagreeing parties incurring too great a cost. This latter point is particularly important. Imagine that two birds engage in a squabble about a desirable nesting area. The interaction can easily degenerate into outright physical combat. Under such circumstances, one bird, usually the largest, will eventually win. But even the victor may be hurt by the fight. That means a third bird, an undamaged, canny bystander, can move in opportunistically and defeat the now crippled victor. That is not at all a good deal for the first two birds. Conflict and Territory Over the millennia, animals who must cohabit with others in the same territories have, in consequence, learned many tricks to establish dominance, while risking the least amount of possible damage. A defeated wolf, for example, will roll over on its back, exposing its throat to the victor, who will not then deem to tear it out. The now dominant wolf may still require a future hunting partner after all, even one as pathetic as his now defeated foe. Bearded dragons, remarkable social lizards, wave their front legs peaceably at one another to indicate their wish for continued social harmony. Dolphins produce specialized sound pulses while hunting and during other times of high excitement to reduce potential conflict among dominant and subordinate group members. Such behavior is endemic in the community of living things. Lobsters scuttling around on the ocean floor are no exception. If you catch a few dozen and transport them to a new location, you can observe their status-forming rituals and techniques. Each lobster will first begin to explore the new territory, partly to map its details, and partly to find a good place for shelter. Lobsters learn a lot about where they live, and they remember what they learn. If you startle one near its nest, it will quickly zip back and hide there. If you startle it some distance away, however, it will immediately dart towards the nearest suitable shelter, previously identified and now remembered. A lobster needs a safe hiding place to rest, free from predators and the forces of nature. Furthermore, as lobsters grow, they molt, or shed their shells, which leaves them soft and vulnerable for extended periods of time. A burrow under a rock makes a good lobster home, particularly if it is located where shells and other detritus can be dragged into place to cover the entrance once the lobster is snugly ensconced inside. However, there may be only a small number of high-quality shelters or hiding places in each new territory. They are scarce and valuable. Other lobsters continually seek them out. This means that lobsters often encounter one another when out exploring. Researchers have demonstrated that even a lobster raised in isolation knows what to do when such a thing happens. It has complex defensive and aggressive behaviors built right into its nervous system. It begins to dance around like a boxer, opening and raising its claws, moving forward and backward and side to side, mirroring its opponent, waving its open claws back and forth. At the same time, it employs special jets under its eyes to direct streams of liquid at its opponent. The liquid spray contains a mix of chemicals that tell the other lobster about its size, sex, health, and mood. Sometimes, one lobster can tell immediately from the display of claw size that it is much smaller than its opponent, and will back down without a fight. The chemical information exchanged in the spray can have the same effect, convincing a less healthy or less aggressive lobster to retreat. That's dispute resolution level one. If the two lobsters are very close in size and apparent ability, however, or if the exchange of liquid has been insufficiently informative, they will proceed to dispute resolution level two. With antenna whipping madly and claws folded downward, one will advance and the other retreat. Then the defender will advance and the aggressor retreat. After a couple of rounds of this behavior, the more nervous of the lobsters may feel that continuing is not in his best interest. He will flick his tail reflexively, dart backwards and vanish to try his luck elsewhere. If neither blinks, however, the lobsters move to level 3, which involves genuine combat. This time, the now enraged lobsters come at each other viciously, with their claws extended to grapple. Each tries to flip the other on its back. A successfully flipped lobster will conclude that his opponent is capable of inflicting serious damage. It generally gives up and leaves, although it harbors intense resentment and gossips endlessly about the victor behind its back. If neither can overturn the other, or if one will not quit despite being flipped, the lobsters move to level 4. Doing so involves extreme risk, and is not something to be engaged in without forethought. One or both lobsters will emerge damaged from the ensuing fray, perhaps fatally. The animals advance on each other, with increasing speed. Their claws are open so they can grab a leg, antenna, or an eye stalk, or anything else exposed and vulnerable. Once a body part has been successfully grabbed, the grabber will tail flick backwards sharply, with claw clamped firmly shut and try to tear it off. Disputes that have escalated to this point typically create a clear winner and loser. The loser is unlikely to survive, particularly if he or she remains in the territory occupied by the winner, now a mortal enemy. 
In the aftermath of losing a battle, regardless of how aggressively a lobster has behaved, it becomes unwilling to fight further, even against another previously defeated opponent. A vanquished competitor loses confidence, sometimes for days. Sometimes the defeat can have even more severe consequences. If a dominant lobster is badly defeated, its brain basically dissolves. Then it grows a new, subordinate's brain, one more appropriate to its new, lowly position. Its original brain just isn't sophisticated to manage the transformation from king to bottom dog without virtually complete dissolution and regrowth. Anyone who has experienced a painful transformation after a serious defeat in romance or career may feel some kind of sense of kinship with the once successful crustacean. The Neurochemistry of Defeat and Victory A lobster loser's brain chemistry differs importantly from that of a lobster winner. This is reflected in their relative postures. Whether a lobster is confident or cringing depends on the ratio of two chemicals that modulate communication between lobster neurons, serotonin and octopamine. Winning increases the ratio of the former to the latter. A lobster with high levels of serotonin and low levels of octopamine is a cocky, strutting sort of shellfish, much less likely to back down when challenged. This is because serotonin helps regulate postural flexion. A flexed lobster extends its appendages so that it can look tall and dangerous, like Clint Eastwood in a spaghetti western. When a lobster that has just lost a battle is exposed to serotonin, it will stretch itself out, advance even on former victors, and fight longer and harder. The drugs prescribed to depressed human beings, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, have much the same chemical and behavioral effect. In one of the more staggering demonstrations of the evolutionary continuity of life on Earth, Prozac even cheers up lobsters. High serotonin slash low octopamine characterizes the victor. The opposite neurochemical configuration, a high ratio of octopamine to serotonin, produces a defeated-looking, scrunched-up, inhibited, drooping, skulking sort of lobster, very likely to hang around street corners and to vanish at the first hint of trouble. Serotonin and octopamine also regulate the tail flick reflex, which serves to propel a lobster rapidly backwards when it needs to escape. Less provocation is necessary to trigger that reflex in a defeated lobster. You can see an echo of that in the heightened startle reflex characteristic of the soldier, or battered child with post-traumatic stress disorder. The Principle of Unequal Distribution When a defeated lobster regains its courage and dares to fight again, it is more likely to lose again than you'd predict, statistically, from a tally of its previous fights. Its victorious opponent, on the other hand, is more likely to win. It's a winner-take-all in the lobster world, just as it is in human societies, where the top 1% have as much loot as the bottom 50%, and where the richest 85 people have as much as the bottom 3.5 billion. That same brutal principle of unequal distribution applies outside of the financial domain. Indeed, anywhere that creative production is required. The majority of scientific papers are published by a very small group of scientists. A tiny proportion of musicians produce almost all the recorded commercial music. Just a handful of authors sell all the books. A million and a half separately titled books sell each year in the U.S. However, only 500 of these sell more than 100,000 copies. Similarly, just four classical composers... Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and Tchaikovsky wrote almost all the music played by modern orchestras. Bach, for his part, composed so prolifically that it would take decades of work merely to hand-copy his scores, yet only a small fraction of his prodigious output is commonly performed. The same thing applies to the output of the other three members of this group of hyper-dominant composers. Only a small fraction of their work is still widely played. Thus, a small fraction of the music composed by a small fraction of all the classical composers who have ever composed makes up almost all the classical music that the world knows and loves. This principle is sometimes known as Price's Law, after Derek J. de Sola Price, the researcher who discovered its application in science in 1963. It can be modeled using an approximately L-shaped graph, with number of people on the vertical axis and productivity or resources on the horizontal. The basic principle had been discovered much earlier. Wilfredo Pareto, 1848-1923, an Italian polymath, noticed its applicability to wealth distribution in the early 20th century and it appears true for every society ever studied, regardless of governmental form. It also applies to the population of cities, a very small number have almost all the people, the mass of heavenly bodies, a very small number hoard all the matter, and the frequency of words in a language. 90% of communication occurs using just 500 words. Among many other things. Sometimes it is known as the Matthew Principle, from Matthew 25, 29, derived from what might be the harshest statement ever attributed to Christ. To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. You truly know you're the son of God when your dicta apply even to crustaceans. Back to the fractious shellfish. It doesn't take that long before lobsters, testing each other out, learn who can be messed with and who should be given the wide berth. And once they have learned, the resultant hierarchy is exceedingly stable. 
All the victor needs to do, once he has won, is to wiggle his antenna in a threatening manner, and a previous opponent will vanish in a puff of sand before him. A weaker lobster will quit trying, accept his lowly status, and keep his legs attached to his body. The top lobster, by contrast, occupying the best shelter, getting some good rest, finishing a good meal, parades his dominance around his territory, rousting subordinate lobsters from their shelters at night, just to remind them who's their daddy. All the girls. The female lobsters, who also fight hard for territory during the explicitly maternal stages of their existence, identify the top guy quickly and become irresistibly attracted to him. This is brilliant strategy in my estimation. It's also one used by females of many different species, including humans. Instead of undertaking the computationally difficult task of identifying the best man, the females outsource the problem to the machine-like calculations of the dominance hierarchy. They let the males fight it out and peel their paramours from the top. This is very much what happens with stock market pricing, where the value of any particular enterprise is determined through the competition of all. When the females are ready to shed their shells and soften up a bit, they become interested in mating. They start hanging around the dominant lobster's pad, spraying attractive scents and aphrodisiacs towards him, trying to seduce him. His aggression has made him successful, so he's likely to react in a dominant, irritable manner. Furthermore, he's large, healthy, and powerful. It's no easy task to switch his attention from fighting to mating. If properly charmed, however, he will change his behavior towards the female. This is the lobster equivalent of Fifty Shades of Grey, the fastest selling paperback of all time, and the eternal Beauty and the Beast plot of archetypal romance. This is the pattern of behavior continually represented in the sexually explicit literary fantasies that are as popular among women as provocative images of naked women are among men. It should be pointed out, however, that sheer physical power is an unstable basis on which to found lasting dominance. As the Dutch primatologist Franz de Waal, uh, didn't say that right, Franz de Waal, whatever, has taken pains to demonstrate. Among the chimp troops he studied, males who were successful in the longer term had to buttress their physical prowess with more sophisticated attributes. Even the most brutal chimp despot can be taken down, after all, by two opponents, each three-quarters as mean. In consequence, males who stay on top longer are those who form reciprocal coalitions with their lower-status compatriots, and who pay careful attention to the troops' females and their infants. The political ploy of baby-kissing is literally millions of years old. But lobsters are still comparatively primitive, so the bare plot elements of beast and beauty suffice for them. Once the beast has been successfully charmed, the successful female, lobster, will disrobe, shedding her shell, making herself dangerously soft, vulnerable, and ready to mate. At the right moment, the male, now converted into a careful lover, deposits a packet of sperm into the appropriate receptacle. Afterward, the female hangs around and hardens up for a couple of weeks, another phenomenon not entirely unknown among human beings. At her leisure, she returns to her own domicile, laden with fertilized eggs. At this point, another female will attempt to do the same thing, and so on. The dominant male, with his upright and confident posture, not only gets the prime real estate and easiest access to the best hunting grounds, he also gets all the girls. It is exponentially more worthwhile to be successful if you are a lobster and male. Why is all this relevant? For an amazing number of reasons, apart from those that are comically obvious. First, we know that lobsters have been around, in one form or another, for more than 350 million years. This is a very long time. 65 million years ago, there were still dinosaurs. That is the unimaginably distant past to us. To lobsters, however, dinosaurs were the nouveau riche who appeared and disappeared in the flow of near eternal time. This means that dominance hierarchies have been an essentially permanent feature of the environment to which all complex life has adapted. A third of a billion years ago, brains and nervous systems were comparatively simple. Nonetheless, they already had the structure and neural chemistry necessary to process information about status and society. The importance of this fact can hardly be overstated. The nature of nature. It is a truism of biology that evolution is conservative. When something evolves, it must build upon what nature has already produced. New features may be added, and old features may undergo some alteration, but most things remain the same. It is for this reason that the wings of bats, the hands of human beings, and the fins of whales look astonishingly alike in their skeletal form. They even have the same number of bones. Evolution laid down the cornerstones for basic physiology long ago. Now, evolution works, in large part, through variation and natural selection. Variation exists for many reasons, including gene shuffling, to put it simply, and random mutation. Individuals vary within a species for such reasons. Nature chooses from among them across time. That theory, as stated, appears to account for the continual alteration of life forms over the eons. But there's an additional question lurking under the surface. What exactly is the nature in natural selection, quote-unquote? What exactly is, quote, the environment to which animals adapt? We make many assumptions about nature, about the environment, and these have consequences. Mark Twain once said, 
Quote, it's not what we don't know that gets us in trouble. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. First, it is easy to assume that nature is something with a nature, something static, but it's not, at least not in any simple sense. It's static and dynamic at the same time. The environment, the nature that selects, itself transforms. The famous yin and yang symbols of the Taoists capture this beautifully. Being, for the Taoists, reality itself is composed of two opposing principles, often translated as feminine and masculine, or even more narrowly as female and male. However, yin and yang are more accurately understood as chaos and order. The Tao is simple as a circle enclosing twin serpents head to tail. The black serpent, chaos, has a white dot in its head. The white serpent, order, has a black dot in its head. This is because chaos and order are interchangeable as well as eternally juxtaposed. There is nothing so certain that it cannot vary. Even the sun itself has cycles of instability. Likewise, there is nothing so mutable that it cannot be fixed. Every revolution produces a new order. Every death is, simultaneously, a metamorphosis. Considering nature as purely static produces serious errors of apprehension. Nature selects. The idea of selects contains implicitly nested within it the idea of fitness. It is fitness that is selected. Fitness, roughly speaking, is the probability that a given organism will leave offspring, will propagate its genes through time. The fit in fitness is therefore the matching of organismal attribute to environmental demand. If that demand is conceptualized as static, if nature is conceptualized as eternal and unchanging, then evolution is a never-ending series of linear improvements, and fitness is something that can ever be more closely approximated across time. The still powerful Victorian idea of evolutionary progress with man at the pinnacle is a partial consequence of this model of nature. It produces the erroneous notion that there is a destination of natural selection, increasing fitness to the environment, and that it can be conceptualized as a fixed point. But nature, the selecting agent, is not a static selector, not in any simple sense. Nature dresses differently for each occasion. Nature varies like a musical score, and that, in part, explains why music produces its deep intimations of meaning. As the environment supporting a species transforms and changes, the features that make a given individual successful in surviving and reproducing also transform and change. Thus, the theory of natural selection does not posit creatures matching themselves ever more precisely to a template specified by the world. It is more that creatures are in a dance with nature, albeit one that is deadly. In my kingdom, as the Red Queen tells Alice in Wonderland, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. No one standing still can triumph, no matter how well constituted. Nature is not simply dynamic either. Some things change quickly, but they are nested within other things that change less quickly. Music frequently models this too. Leaves change more quickly than trees, and trees more quickly than forests. Weather changes faster than climate. If it wasn't this way, then the conservatism of evolution would not work as the basic morphology of arms and hands would have to change as fast as the length of arm bones and the function of fingers. It's chaos, within order, within chaos, within higher order. The order that is most real is the order that is most unchanging, and that is not necessarily the order that is most easily seen. The leaf, when perceived, might blind the observer to the tree. The tree can blind him to the forest, and some things that are most real, such as the ever-present dominance hierarchy, cannot be seen at all. It is also a mistake to conceptualize nature romantically. Rich, modern city dwellers surrounded by hot, baking concrete imagine the environment as something pristine and paradisal like a French Impressionist landscape. Eco-activists, even more idealistic in their viewpoint, envision nature as harmoniously balanced and perfect, absent the disruptions and depredations of mankind. Unfortunately, the environment is also elephantiasis and guinea worms, don't ask. Anopheles, mosquitoes, and malaria, starvation-level droughts, AIDS, and the Black Plague. We don't fantasize about the beauty of these aspects of nature, although they are just as real as their Edenic counterparts. It is because of the existence of such things, of course, that we attempt to modify our surroundings, protecting our children, building cities and transportation systems, and growing food and generating power. If Mother Nature wasn't so hell-bent on our destruction, it would be easier for us to exist in simple harmony with her dictates. And this brings us to a third erroneous concept, that nature is something strictly segregated from the cultural constructs that have emerged within it. The order within the chaos and order of being is all the more natural the longer it has lasted. This is because nature is what selects, and the longer a feature has existed, the more time it has had to be selected and to shape life. It does not matter whether that feature is physical and biological or social and cultural. All that matters, from a Darwinian perspective, is permanence. And the dominance hierarchy, however social or cultural it might appear, has been around for some half a billion years. It's permanent. It's real. The dominance hierarchy is not capitalism. It's not communism either, for that matter. It's not the military-industrial complex. It's not the patriarchy, that disposable, malleable, arbitrary cultural artifact. 
It's not even a human creation, not in the most profound sense. It is, instead, a near-eternal aspect of the environment, and much of what is blamed on these more ephemeral manifestations is a consequence of its unchanging existence. We, the sovereign we, the we that has been around since the beginning of life, have lived in a dominance hierarchy for a long, long time. We were struggling for position before we had skin or hands or lungs or bones. There is little more natural than culture. Dominance hierarchies are older than trees. The part of our brain that keeps track of our position in the dominance hierarchy is therefore exceptionally ancient and fundamental. It is a master control system modulating our perceptions, values, emotions, thoughts, and actions. It powerfully affects every aspect of our being, conscious and unconscious alike. This is why, when we are defeated, we act very much like lobsters who have lost a fight. Our posture droops. We face the ground. We feel threatened, hurt, anxious, and weak. If things do not improve, we become chronically depressed. Under such conditions, we can't easily put up the kind of fight that life demands, and we become easy targets for harder-shelled bullies. And it is not only the behavioral and experimental similarities that are striking. Much of the basic neurochemistry is the same. Consider serotonin, the chemical that governs posture and escape in the lobster. Low-ranking lobsters produce comparatively low levels of serotonin. This is also true of low-ranking human beings, and those low levels decrease more with each defeat. Low serotonin means decreased confidence. Low serotonin means more response to stress and costlier physical preparedness for emergency. As anything whatsoever may happen at any time, at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy, and rarely something good. Low serotonin means less happiness, more pain and anxiety, more illness and a shorter lifespan. Among humans, just as much among crustaceans. Higher spots in the dominance hierarchy, and the higher serotonin levels typical of those who inhabit them, are characterized by less illness, misery, death, even when factors such as absolute income or number of decaying food scraps are held constant. The importance of this can hardly be overstated. Top and Bottom there is an unspeakably primordial calculator deep within you at the very foundation of your brain, far below your thoughts and feelings. It monitors exactly where you are positioned in society, on a scale of 1 to 10 for the sake of argument. If you're a number 1, the highest level of status, you're an overwhelming success. If you're male, you have preferential access to the best places to live and the highest quality food. People compete to do you favors. You have limitless opportunity for romantic and sexual contact. You are a successful lobster and the most desirable females line up and vie for your attention. If you're female, you have access to many high-quality suitors, tall, strong, and symmetrical, creative, reliable, honest, and generous. And like your dominant male counterpart, you will compete ferociously, even pitilessly, to maintain or improve your position in the equally competitive female mating hierarchy. Although you are less likely to use physical aggression to do so, there are many effective verbal tricks and strategies at your disposal, including the disparaging of opponents, and you may well be the expert at their use. If you are a low-status 10, by contrast, male or female, you have nowhere to live, or nowhere good. Your food is terrible when you're not going hungry. You're in poor physical and mental condition. You're of minimal romantic interest to anyone unless they are as desperate as you. You are more likely to fall ill, age rapidly, and die young, with few, if anything, to mourn you. Even money itself may prove of little use. You won't know how to use it because it is difficult to use money properly, particularly if you are unfamiliar with it. Money will make you liable to the dangerous temptations of drugs and alcohol, which are much more rewarding if you have been deprived of pleasure for a long period. Money will also make you a target for predators and psychopaths who thrive on exploiting those who exist on the lower rungs of society. The bottom of the dominance hierarchy is a terrible, dangerous place to be. The ancient part of your brain specialized for assessing dominance watches how you are treated by other people. On that evidence, it renders a determination of your value and assigns you a status. If you are judged by your peers as of little worth, the counter restricts serotonin availability. That makes you much more physically and psychologically reactive to any circumstance or event that might produce emotion, particularly if it is negative. You need that reactivity. Emergencies are common at the bottom, and you must be ready to survive. Unfortunately, that physical hyper-response, that constant alertness, burns up a lot of precious energy and physical resources. This response is really what everyone calls stress, and it is by no means only, or even primarily, psychological. It's a reflection of the genuine constraints of unfortunate circumstances. When operating at the bottom, the ancient brain counter assumes that even the smallest unexpected impediment might produce an uncontrollable chain of negative events which will have to be handled alone, as useful friends are rare indeed on society's fringes. You will therefore continually sacrifice what you could otherwise physically store for the future, using it up on heightened readiness and the possibility of immediate panicked action in the present. When you don't know what to do, you must be prepared to do anything and everything in case it becomes necessary. You're sitting in your car with the gas and brake pedals both punched to the mat. Too much of that and everything falls apart. The ancient counter will even shut down your immune system, expanding the energy and resources required for future health now, during the crises of the present. It will render you impulsive, 
so that you will jump, for example, at any short-term mating opportunities or any possibilities of pleasure, no matter how subpar, disgraceful, or illegal. It will leave you far more likely to live or die carelessly for a rare opportunity at pleasure when it manifests itself. The physical demands of emergency preparedness will wear you down in every way. If you have a high status, on the other hand, the counter's cold, pre-reptilian mechanics assume that your niche is secure, productive, and safe, and that you are well buttressed with your social support. It thinks the chance that something will damage you is low and can be safely discounted. Change might be opportunity instead of disaster. The serotonin flows plentifully. This renders you confident and calm, standing tall and straight, and much less on constant alert. Because your position is secure, the future is likely to be good for you. It's worthwhile to think in the long term and plan for a better tomorrow. You don't need to grasp impulsively at whatever crumbs come to your way because you can realistically expect good things to remain available. You can delay gratification without foregoing it forever. You can afford to be a reliable and thoughtful citizen. Malfunction Sometimes, however, the counter mechanism can go wrong. Erratic habits of sleeping and eating can interfere with its function. Uncertainty can throw it for a loop. The body with its various parts needs to function like a well-rehearsed orchestra. Every system must play its role properly and at exactly the right time, or noise and chaos ensue. It is for this reason that routine is so necessary. The acts of life we repeat every day need to be automatized. They must be turned into stable and reliable habits, so they lose their complexity and gain predictability and simplicity. This can be perceived most clearly in the case of small children, who are delightful and comical and playful when their sleeping and eating schedules are stable, and horrible and whiny and nasty when they are not. It is for such reasons that I always ask my clinical clients first about sleep. Do they wake up in the morning at approximately the time the typical person wakes up and at the same time every day? If the answer is no, fixing that is the first thing I recommend. It doesn't matter so much if they go to bed at the same time each evening, but waking up at a consistent hour is a necessity. Anxiety and depression cannot be easily treated if the sufferer has unpredictable daily routines. The systems that mediate negative emotion are tightly tied to the properly cyclical circadian rhythms. The next thing I ask about is breakfast. I counsel my clients to eat a fat and protein-heavy breakfast as soon as possible after they awaken. No simple carbohydrates, no sugars, as they are digested too rapidly and produce a blood sugar spike and a rapid dip. This is because anxious and depressed people are already stressed, particularly if their lives have not been under control for a good while. Their bodies are therefore primed to hypersecrete insulin if they engage in any complex or demanding activity. If they do so after fasting all night and before eating, the excess insulin in their bloodstream will mop up all their blood sugar. Then they become hypoglycemic and psychophysiologically unstable all day. Their systems cannot be reset until after more sleep. I have had many clients whose anxiety was reduced to subclinical levels merely because they started to sleep on a predictable schedule and eat breakfast. Other bad habits can also interfere with the counter's accuracy. Sometimes this happens directly for poorly understood biological reasons, and sometimes it happens because those habits initiate a complex positive feedback loop. A positive feedback loop requires an input detector, an amplifier, and some form of output. Imagine a signal picked up by the input detector, amplified, and then emitted in amplified form. So far, so good. The trouble starts when the input detector detects that output and runs it through the system again, amplifying and emitting it again. A few rounds of intensification and things get dangerously out of control. Most people have been subject to the deafening howling of feedback at a concert when the sound system squeals painfully. The microphone sends a signal to the speakers. The speakers emit the signal. The signal can be picked up by the microphone and sent through the system again if it's too loud or too close to the speakers. The sound rapidly amplifies to unbearable levels sufficient to destroy the speakers if it continues. The same destructive loop happens within people's lives. Much of the time when it happens, we label it mental illness, even though it's not only or even at all occurring inside people's psyches. Addiction to alcohol or another mood-altering drug is a common positive feedback process. Imagine a person who enjoys alcohol, perhaps a bit too much. He has a quick three or four drinks. His blood alcohol level spikes sharply. This can be extremely exhilarating, particularly for someone who has a genetic predisposition to alcoholism. But it only occurs while blood alcohol levels are actively rising, and that only contributes if the drinker keeps drinking. When he stops, not only does his blood alcohol level plateau and then start to sink, but his body begins to produce a variety of toxins as it metabolizes the ethanol already consumed. He also starts to experience alcohol withdrawal, as the anxiety systems that were suppressed during intoxication start to hyper-respond. A hangover is alcohol withdrawal, which quite frequently kills withdrawing alcoholics. And it starts all too soon after drinking ceases. To continue the warm glow and stave off the unpleasant aftermath, the drinker may just continue to drink until all the liquor in his house is consumed, the bars are closed, and his money is spent. The next day, the drinker wakes up, badly hungover. So far, this is just unfortunate. The real trouble starts when he discovers that his hangover can be cured with a few more drinks the morning after. Such a cure is, of course, temporary. It merely pushes the withdrawal symptoms a bit further into the future. But that might be what is required in the short term if the misery is sufficiently acute. So now he has learned to drink to cure his hangover. 
When the medication causes the disease, a positive feedback loop has been established. Alcoholism can quickly emerge under such conditions. Something similar often happens to people who develop anxiety disorders, such as agoraphobia. People with agoraphobia can become so overwhelmed with fear that they will no longer leave their homes. Agoraphobia is the consequence of a positive feedback loop. The first event that precipitates the disorder is often a panic attack. The sufferer is typically a middle-aged woman who has been too dependent on other people. Perhaps she went immediately from over-reliance on her father to a relationship with an older and comparatively dominant boyfriend or husband, with little or no break for independent existence. In the weeks leading up to the emergence of her agoraphobia, such a woman typically experiences something unexpected and anomalous. It might be something physiological, such as heart palpitations, which are common in any case, and whose likelihood is increased during menopause, when the hormonal processes regulating a woman's psychological experience fluctuate unpredictably. Any perceptible alteration in heart rate can trigger thoughts both of heart attack and an all-too-public and embarrassing display of post-heart attack, distress, and suffering, death and social humiliation constituting the two most basic fears. The unexpected occurrence might instead be conflict in the sufferer's marriage or in the illness or death of a spouse. It might be a close friend's divorce or hospitalization. Some real event typically re precipitates the initial increase in fear of mortality and social judgment. After the shock, perhaps, the pre-agoraphobic woman leaves her house and makes her way to the shopping mall. It's busy and difficult to park. This makes her even more stressed. The thoughts of vulnerability occupying her mind since her recent unpleasant experience rise close to the surface. They trigger anxiety. Her heart rate rises. She begins to breathe shallowly and quickly. She feels her heart racing and begins to wonder if she is suffering a heart attack. This thought triggers more anxiety. She breathes even more shallowly, increasing the levels of carbon dioxide in her blood. Her heart rate increases again because of her additional fear. She detects that and her heart rate rises again. And poof, positive feedback loop. Soon the anxiety transforms into panic, regulated by a different brain system, designed for the severest of threats which can be triggered by too much fear. She is overwhelmed by her symptoms and heads for the emergency room where after an anxious wait her heart function is checked. There's nothing wrong, but she's not reassured. It takes an additional feedback loop to transform even that unpleasant experience into full-blown agoraphobia. The next time she needs to go to the mall, the pre-agoraphobic becomes anxious, remembering what happened last time. But she goes anyway. On the way, she can feel her heart pounding. That triggers another cycle of anxiety and concern. To forestall panic, she avoids the stress of the mall and returns home. But now the anxiety systems in her brain know that she ran away from the mall and conclude that the journey there was truly dangerous. Our anxiety systems are very practical. They assume that anything you run away from is dangerous. The proof of that is, of course, the fact that you ran away. So now the mall is tagged too dangerous to approach, or the budding agoraphobic has labeled herself too fragile to approach the mall. Perhaps that is not yet taking things far enough to cause her real trouble. There are other places to shop. But maybe the nearby supermarket is mall-like enough to trigger a similar response. When she visits it instead and then retreats, now the supermarket occupies the same category. Then it's the corner store. Then it's buses and taxis and subways. Soon it's everywhere. The agoraphobic will eventually become afraid of her house and would run away from that if she could, but she can't. Soon she's stuck in her home. Anxiety-induced retreat makes everything retreated from more anxiety-inducing. Anxiety-induced retreat makes the self smaller and the ever more dangerous world larger. There are many systems of interaction between brain, body, and social world that can get caught in positive feedback loops. Depressed people, for example, can start feeling useless and burdensome, as well as grief-stricken and pained. This makes them withdraw from contact with friends and family. Then the withdrawal makes them more lonesome and isolated and more likely to feel useless and burdensome. Then they withdraw more. In this manner, depression spirals and amplifies. If someone is badly hurt at some point in life, traumatized, the dominance counter can transform in a manner that makes additional hurt more rather than less likely. This often happens in the case of people, now adults, who were viciously bullied during childhood or adolescence. They become anxious and easily upset. They shield themselves with a defensive crouch and avoid the direct eye contact interpretable as a dominance challenge. This means that the damage caused by the bullying, the lowering of status and confidence, can continue, even after the bullying has ended. In the simplest of cases, the former lowly persons have matured and moved to new and more successful places in their lives. But they don't fully notice. Their now counterproductive physiological adaptations to earlier reality remain, and they are more stressed and uncertain than is necessary. In more complex cases, a habitual assumption of subordination renders the person more stressed and uncertain than necessary, and their habitually submissive posturing continues to attract genuine negative attention from one or more of the fewer and generally less successful bullies still extant in the adult world. In such situations, the psychological consequence of the previous bullying increases the likelihood of continued bullying in the present, even though, strictly speaking, it wouldn't have to, 
because of maturation or geographical relocation or continued education or improvement in objective status. Rising up. Sometimes people are bullied because they can't fight back. This can happen to people who are weaker physically than their opponents. This is one of the most common reasons for the bullying experienced by children. Even the toughest of six-year-olds is no match for someone who is nine. A lot of that power differential disappears in adulthood, however, with the rough stabilization and matching of physical size, with the exception of that pertaining to men and women, with the former typically larger and stronger, particularly in the upper body, as well as the increased penalties generally applied in adulthood to those who insist upon continuing with physical intimidation. But just as often, people are bullied because they won't fight back. This happens not infrequently to people who are by temperament compassionate and self-sacrificing, particularly if they are also high in negative emotion and make a lot of gratifying noises of suffering when someone sadistic confronts them. Children who cry more easily, for example, are more frequently bullied. It also happens to people who have decided for one reason or another that all forms of aggression, including even feelings of anger, are morally wrong. I have seen people with a particularly acute sensitivity to petty tyranny and over-aggressive competitiveness restrict within themselves all the emotions that might give rise to such things. Often they are people whose fathers were excessively angry and controlling. Psychological forces are never unidimensional in their value, however, and the truly appalling potential of anger and aggression to produce cruelty and mayhem are balanced by the ability of those primordial forces to push back against oppression, speak truth, and motivate resolute movement forward in times of strife, uncertainty, and danger. With their capacity for aggression straightjacketed within a too narrow morality, those who are only or merely compassionate and self-sacrificing, and naive and exploitable, cannot call forth the genuinely righteous and appropriately self-protective anger necessary to defend themselves. If you can bite, you generally don't have to. When skillfully integrated, the ability to respond with aggression and violence decreases rather than increases the probability that actual aggression will become necessary. If you say no, early in the cycle of oppression, and you mean what you say, which means you state your refusal in no uncertain terms and stand behind it, then the scope for oppression on the part of oppressor will remain properly bounded and limited. The forces of tyranny expand inexorably to fill the space made available for their existence. People who refuse to muster appropriately self-protective territorial responses are laid open to exploitation as much as those who genuinely can't stand up for their own rights because of a more essential inability or a true imbalance in power. Naive, harmless people usually guide their perceptions and actions with a few simple axioms. People are basically good. No one really wants to hurt anyone else. The threat, and certainly the use of force, physical or otherwise, is wrong. These axioms collapse, or worse, in the presence of individuals who are genuinely malevolent. Worse means that naive beliefs can become a positive invitation to abuse, because those who aim to harm have become specialized to prey on people who think precisely such things. Under such conditions, the axioms of harmlessness must be retooled. In my clinical practice, I often draw the attention of my clients, who think that good people never become angry, to the stark realities of their own resentments. No one likes to be pushed around, but people often put up with it for too long. So I get them to see their resentment, first as anger, and then as an indication that something needs to be said, if not done, not least because honesty demands it. Then I get them to see such action as part of the force that holds tyranny at bay, at the social level, as much as the individual. Many bureaucracies have petty authoritarians within them, generating unnecessary rules and procedures simply to express and cement power. Such people produce powerful undercurrents of resentment around them, which, if expressed, would limit their expression of pathological power. It is in this manner that the willingness of the individual to stand up for him or herself protects everyone from the corruption of society. When naive people discover the capacity for anger within themselves, they're shocked, sometimes severely. A profound example of this can be found in the susceptibility of new soldiers to post-traumatic stress disorder, which often occurs because of something they watch themselves doing, rather than because of something that has happened to them. They react like the monsters they can truly be in extreme battlefield conditions, and the revelation of that capacity undoes their world. And no wonder, perhaps they assumed that all of history's terrible perpetrators were people totally unlike themselves. Perhaps they were never able to see within themselves the capacity for oppression and bullying, and perhaps not their capacity for assertion and success as well. I have had clients who were terrified into literally years of daily hysterical convulsions by the sheer look of malevolence on their attackers' faces. Such individuals typically come from hyper-sheltered families where nothing terrible is allowed to exist and everything is fairyland wonderful. Or else. When the awakening occurs, when once naive people recognize in themselves the seeds of evil and monstrosity and see themselves as dangerous, at least potentially, their fear decreases. They develop more self-respect. Then, perhaps, they begin to resist oppression. They see that they have the ability to withstand because they are terrible too. 
They see that they can and must stand up because they begin to understand how genuinely monstrous they will become otherwise, feeding on their resentment, transforming it into the most destructive of wishes. To say it again, there's very little difference between the capacity for mayhem and destruction, integrated, and strength of character. This is one of the most difficult lessons of life. Maybe you are a loser, and maybe you're not, but if you are, you don't have to continue in that mode. Maybe you just have a bad habit. Maybe you're even just a collection of bad habits. Nonetheless, even if you came by your poor posture honestly, even if you were unpopular or bullied at home or in grade school, it's not necessarily appropriate now. Circumstances change. If you slump around with the same bearing that characterizes a defeated lobster, people will assign you a lower status, and the old counter that you share with crustaceans, sitting at the very base of your brain, will assign you a low dominance number. Then your brain will not produce as much serotonin. This will make you less happy and more anxious and sad and more likely to back down when you should stand up for yourself. It will also decrease the probability that you will get to live in a good neighborhood and have access to the highest quality resources and obtain a healthy, desirable mate. It will render you more likely to abuse cocaine and alcohol as you live for the present in a world full of uncertain futures. It will increase your susceptibility to heart disease, cancer, and dementia. All in all, it's just not good. Circumstances change, and so can you. Positive feedback loops adding effect to effect can spiral counterproductively in a negative direction, but can also work to get you ahead. That's the other, far more optimistic lesson of Price's Law and the Pareto distribution. Those who start to have will probably get more. Some of these upwardly moving loops can occur in your own private subjective space. Alterations in body language offer an important example. If you are asked by a researcher to move your facial muscles one at a time into a position that would look sad to an observer, you will report feeling sadder. If you are asked to move the muscles one by one into a position that looks happy, you will report feeling happier. Emotion is partly bodily expression and can be amplified or dampened by that expression. Some of the positive feedback loops instantiated by body language can occur beyond the private confines of subjective experience in the social space you share with other people. If your posture is poor, for example, if you slump, shoulders forward and rounded, chest tucked in, head down, looking small, defeated, and ineffectual, protected in theory against attack from behind, then you will feel small, defeated, and ineffectual. The reactions of others will amplify that. People, like lobsters, size each other up, partly in consequence of stance. If you present yourself as defeated, then people will react to you as if you are losing. If you start to straighten up, then people will look and treat you differently. You might object. The bottom is real. Being at the bottom is equally real. A mere transformation of posture is insufficient to change anything that fixed. If you're in number 10 position, then standing up straight and appearing dominant might only attract the attention of those who want, once again, to put you down. And fair enough. But standing up straight with your shoulders back is not something that's only physical because you're not only a body. You're a spirit, so to speak, a psyche as well. Standing up physically also implies and invokes and demands standing up metaphysically. Standing up means voluntarily accepting the burden of being. Your nervous system responds in an entirely different manner when you face the demands of life voluntarily. You respond to a challenge instead of bracing for a catastrophe. You see the gold the dragon hoards instead of shrinking in terror from the all-too-real fact of the dragon. You step forward to take your place in the dominance hierarchy and occupy your territory, manifesting your willingness to defend, expand, and transform it. That can all occur practically or symbolically, as a physical or as a conceptual restructuring. To stand up straight with your shoulders back is to accept the terrible responsibility of life with eyes wide open. It means deciding to voluntarily transform the chaos of potential into the realities of habitable order. It means adopting the burden of self-conscious vulnerability and accepting the end of the unconscious paradise of childhood, where finitude and mortality are only dimly comprehended. It means willingly undertaking the sacrifices necessary to generate a productive and meaningful reality. It means acting to please God in the ancient language. To stand up straight with your shoulders back means building the ark that protects the world from the flood, guiding your people through the desert after they have escaped tyranny making your way away from comfortable home and country, and speaking the prophetic word to those who ignore the widows and children. It means shouldering the cross that marks the X, the place where you and being intersect so terribly. It means casting dead, rigid, and too tyrannical order back into the chaos in which it was generated. It means withstanding the ensuing uncertainty and establishing in consequence a better, more meaningful, and more productive order. So attend carefully to your posture. Quit drooping and hunching around. Speak your mind. Put your desires forward, as if you had a right to them, at least the same right as others. Walk tall and gaze forthrightly ahead. Dare to be dangerous. Encourage the serotonin to flow plentifully through the neural pathways desperate for its calming influence. 
people, including yourself, will start to assume that you are competent and able, or at least they will not immediately conclude the reverse. Emboldened by the positive responses you are now receiving, you will begin to be less anxious. You will then find it easier to pay attention to the subtle social cues that people exchange when they are communicating. Your conversations will flow better, with fewer awkward pauses. This will make you more likely to meet people, interact with them, and impress them. Doing so will not only genuinely increase the probability that good things will happen to you, it will also make those good things feel better when they do happen. Thus strengthened and emboldened, you may choose to embrace being and work for its furtherance and improvement. Thus strengthened, you may be able to stand, even during the illness of a loved one, even during the death of a parent, and allow others to find strength alongside you when they could otherwise be overwhelmed with despair. Thus emboldened, you will embark on the voyage of your life. Let your light shine, so to speak, on the heavenly hill and pursue your rightful destiny. Then the meaning of your life may be sufficient to keep the corrupting influence of mortal despair at bay. Then you may be able to accept the terrible burden of the world and find joy. Look for your inspiration to the victorious lobster, with its 350 million years of practical wisdom. Stand up straight, with your shoulders back. 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Rule 2 Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Why won't you just take your damn pills? Imagine that a hundred people are prescribed a drug. Consider what happens next. One third of them won't fill the prescription. Half of the remaining 67 will fill it, but won't take the medication correctly. They'll miss doses. They'll quit taking it early. They might not even take it at all. Physicians and pharmacists tend to blame such patients for their noncompliance, inaction, and error. You can lead a horse to water, they reason. Psychologists tend to take a dim view of such judgments. We are trained to assume that the failure of patients to follow professional advice is the fault of the practitioner, not the patient. We believe the healthcare provider has a responsibility to prefer advice that will be followed, offer interventions that will be respected, plan with the patient or client until the desired result is achieved, and follow up to ensure that everything is going correctly. This is just one of the many things that make psychologists so wonderful. Of course, we have the luxury of time with our clients, unlike other more beleaguered professionals who wonder why sick people won't take their medication. What's wrong with them? Don't they want to get better? Here's something worse. Imagine that someone receives an organ transplant. Imagine it's a kidney. A transplant typically occurs only after a long period of anxious waiting on the part of the recipient. Only a minority of people donate organs when they die, and even fewer when they're still alive. Only a small number of donated organs are a good match for any hopeful recipient. This means that the typical kidney transplantee has been undergoing dialysis, the only alternative, for years. Dialysis involves passing all the patient's blood out of his or her body through a machine and back in. It is an unlikely and miraculous treatment, so that's all good, but it's not pleasant. It must happen five to seven times a week for eight hours at a time. It should happen every time the patient sleeps. That's too much. No one wants to stay on dialysis. Now, one of the complications of transplantation is rejection. Your body does not like it when parts of someone else's body are stitched into it. Your immune system will attack and destroy such foreign elements even when they're crucial to your own survival. To stop this from happening, you must take an anti-rejection drug, which weakens immunity, increasing your susceptibility to infectious disease. Most people are happy to accept the trade-off. Recipients of transplants still suffer the effects of organ rejection despite the existence and utility of these drugs. And it's not because the drugs fail, although they sometimes do. It's more often because those prescribed the drugs do not take them. This beggar's belief. It is seriously not good to have your kidneys fail. Dialysis is no picnic. Transplantation surgery occurs after long waiting at high risk and great expense. To lose all that because you don't take your medication? How could people do that to themselves? How could this possibly be? It's complicated, to be fair. Many people who receive a transplanted organ are isolated or beset by multiple physical health problems, to say nothing of problems associated with unemployment or family crisis. They may be cognitively impaired or depressed. They may not entirely trust their doctor or understand the necessity of the medication. Maybe they can barely afford the drugs and ration them desperately and unproductively. But, and this is the amazing thing, imagine that it isn't you who feels sick, it's your dog. So you take him to the vet. The vet gives you a prescription. What happens then? You have just as many reasons to distrust a vet as a doctor. Furthermore, if you cared so little for your pet that you weren't concerned with what improper, substandard, or error-ridden prescription he might be given, you wouldn't have taken him to the vet in the first place. Thus, you care. Your actions prove it. In fact, on average, you care more. People are better at filling and properly administering prescription medication to their pets than to themselves. That's not good. Even from your pet's perspective, it's not good. Your pet probably loves you and would be happier if you took your medication. 
and it's difficult to conclude anything from this set of facts except that people appear to love their dogs, cats, ferrets, and birds, and maybe even their lizards, more than themselves. How horrible is that? How much shame must exist for something like that to be true? What could it be about people that makes them prefer their pets to themselves? It was an ancient story in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Old Testament, that helped me find an answer to that perplexing question. The Oldest Story and the Nature of the World Two stories of creation from two different Middle Eastern sources appear to be woven together in the Genesis account. In the chronologically first but historically more recent account, known as the Priestly, God created the cosmos using his divine word, speaking light and water into existence, following that with the plants and the heavenly bodies. Then he created the birds and animals and fish, again employing speech, and ended with man, male and female, but somehow formed in his image. That all happens in Genesis 1. In the second, older, Jawist version, we find another origin account involving Adam and Eve, where the details of creation differ somewhat, as well as the stories of Cain and Abel, Noah, and the Tower of Babel. That is Genesis 2 to 11. To understand Genesis 1, the priestly story, with its insistence on speech as the fundamental creative force, it is first necessary to review a few fundamental ancient assumptions. These are markedly different in type and intent from the assumptions of science, which are, historically speaking, quite novel. Scientific truths were made explicit a mere 500 years ago with the work of Francis Bacon, René Descartes, and Isaac Newton. In whatever manner our forebears viewed the world prior to that, it was not through a scientific lens any more than they could view the moon and the stars through the glass lenses of the equally recent telescope. Because we are so scientific now, and so determinedly materialistic, it is very difficult for us to even understand that other ways of seeing can and do exist. But those who existed during the distant time in which the foundational epics of our culture emerged were much more concerned with the actions that dictated survival, and with interpreting the world in a manner commensurate with that goal, than with anything approximating what we now understand as objective truth. Before the dawn of the scientific worldview, reality was construed differently. Being was understood as a place of action, not a place of things. It was understood as something more akin to story or drama. That story or drama was lived, subjective experience as it manifested itself moment to moment in the consciousness of every living person. It was something similar to the stories we tell each other about our lives and their personal significance. Something similar to the happenings that novelists describe when they capture existence in the pages of their books. Subjective experience. That includes familiar objects such as trees and clouds, primarily objective in their existence, but also, and more importantly, such things as emotions and dreams, as well as hunger, thirst, and pain. It is such things experienced personally that are most fundamental elements of human life from the archaic, dramatic perspective, and they are not easily reducible to the detached and objective, even by the modern reductionist, materialist mind. Take pain, for example, subjective pain. That's something so real, no argument can stand against it. Everyone acts as if their pain is real, ultimately, finally, real. Pain matters. More than matter matters. It is for this reason, I believe, that so many of the world's traditions regard the suffering attendant upon existence as the irreducible truth of being. In any case, that which we subjectively experience can be likened much more to a novel or a movie than to a scientific description of physical reality. It is the drama of lived experience, the unique, tragic, personal death of your father, compared to the objective death listed in the hospital records, the pain of your first love, the despair of dashed hopes, the joy attendant upon a child's success. The domain, not of matter, but of what matters. The scientific world of matter can be reduced in some sense to its fundamental constituent elements, molecules, atoms, and even quarks. However, the world of experience has primal constituents as well. These are the necessary elements whose interactions define drama and fiction. One of these is chaos. Another is order. The third, as there are three, is the process that mediates between the two, which appears identical to what modern people call consciousness. It is our eternal subjugation to the first two that makes us doubt the validity of existence, that makes us throw up our hands in despair and fail to care for ourselves properly. It is proper understanding of the third that allows us the only real way out. Chaos is the domain of ignorance itself. It's unexplored territory. Chaos is what extends eternally and without limit beyond the boundaries of all states, all ideas, and all disciplines. It's the foreigner, the stranger, the member of another gang, the rustle in the bushes in the nighttime, the monster under the bed, the hidden anger of your mother, and the sickness of your child. Chaos is the despair and horror you feel when you have been profoundly betrayed. It's the place you end up when things fall apart, when your dreams die. 
your career collapses, or your marriage ends. It's the underworld of fairy tale and myth where the dragon and the gold it guards eternally coexist. Chaos is where we are when we don't know where we are, and what we are doing when we don't know what we are doing. It is, in short, all these things and situations we neither know nor understand. Chaos is also the formless potential from which the god of Genesis 1 called Fourth Order, using language at the beginning of time. It's the same potential from which we, made in that image, call forth the novel and ever-changing moments of our lives. And chaos is freedom. Dreadful freedom, too. Order, by contrast, is explored territory. That's the hundreds of millions of years old hierarchy of place, position, and authority. That's the structure of society. It's the structure provided by biology, too, particularly insofar as you are adapted as you are to the structure of society. Order is tribe, religion, hearth, home, country. It's the warm, secure living room where the fireplace glows and the children play. It's the flag of the nation. It's the value of the currency. Order is the floor beneath your feet and your plan for the day. It is the greatness of tradition, the rows of desks in a school classroom, the trains that leave on time, the calendar, and the clock. Order is the public facade we're called upon to wear, the politeness of a gathering of civilized strangers, and the thin ice on which we all skate. Order is the place where the behavior of the world matches our expectations and our desires, the place where all things turn out the way we want them to. But order is sometimes tyranny, and stultification as well, when the demand for certainty and uniformity and purity becomes too one-sided. Where everything is certain, we're in order. We're there when things are going according to plan and nothing is new and disturbing. In the domain of order, things behave as God intended. We like to be there. Familiar environments are congenial. In order, we're able to think about things in the long term. There, things work, and we're stable, calm, and competent. We seldom leave places we understand, geographical or conceptual, for that reason. And we certainly do not like it when we are compelled to or when it happens accidentally. You're in order when you have a loyal friend, a trustworthy ally. Ally. <laughs> when the same person betrays you, sells you out, you move from the daytime world of clarity and light to the dark underworld of chaos, confusion, and despair. That's the same move you make and the same place you visit when the company you work starts to fail and your job is placed in doubt. When your tax return has been filed, that's order. When you're audited, that's chaos. Most people would rather be mugged than audited. Before the Twin Towers fell, that was order. Chaos manifested itself afterward. Everyone felt it. The very air became uncertain. What exactly was it that fell? Wrong question. What exactly remained standing? That was the issue at hand. When the ice you're skating on is solid, that's order. When the bottom drops out and all things fall apart, you plunge through the ice, that's chaos. Order is the shire of Tolkien's hobbits, peaceful, productive, and safely inhabitable, even by the naive. Chaos is the underground kingdom of the dwarves, usurped by Smaug, the treasure-hoarding serpent. Chaos is the deep ocean bottom to which Pinocchio voyaged to rescue his father from Monstro, whale, and fire-breathing dragon. That journey into darkness and rescue is the most difficult thing a puppet must do if he wants to be real, if he wants to extract himself from the temptations of deceit and acting and victimization and impulsive pleasure and totalitarian subjugation if he wants to take his place as a genuine being in the world. Order is the stability of your marriage. It's buttressed by the traditions of the past and by your expectations, grounded often invisibly in those traditions. Chaos is that stability crumbling under your feet when you discover your partner's infidelity. Chaos is the experience of reeling unbound and unsupported through space when your guiding routines and traditions collapse. Order is the place and time where the often visible axioms you live by organize your experience and your actions so that what should happen, does happen. Chaos is the new place and time that emerges when tragedy strikes suddenly, or malevolence reveals its paralyzing visage, even in the confines of your own home. Something unexpected or undesired can always make its appearance when a plan is being laid out, regardless of how familiar the circumstances. When that happens, the territory has shifted. Make no mistake about it. The space, the apparent space, may be the same. But we live in time as well as space. In consequence, even the oldest and most familiar places retain an ineradicable capacity to surprise you. You may be cruising happily down the road in the automobile you have known and loved for years, but time is passing. The brakes could fail. You might be walking down the road in the body you have always relied on. If your heart malfunctions, even momentarily, everything changes. Friendly old dogs can still bite. Old and trusted friends can still deceive. New ideas can destroy old and comfortable certainties. Such things matter. They're real. 
Our brains respond instantly when chaos appears, with simple, hyper-fast circuits maintained from the ancient days, when our ancestors dwelled in trees and snakes struck in a flash. After that nigh-instantaneous, deeply reflexive bodily response comes the later evolving, more complex but slower responses of emotion. And after that comes thinking, of the higher order, which can extend over seconds, minutes, or years. All that response is instinctive in some sense. But the faster the response, the more instinctive. Chaos and Order, Personality, Female and Male Chaos and order are two of the most fundamental elements of lived experience, two of the most basic subdivisions of being itself. But they're not things or objects, and they're not experienced as such. Things or objects are part of the objective world. They're inanimate, spiritless, they're dead. This is not true of chaos and order. Those are perceived, experienced, and understood, to the degree that they are understood at all, as personalities. And that is just as true of the perceptions, experiences, and understanding of modern people as their ancient forebears. It's just that moderners don't notice. Order and chaos are not understood first, objectively, as things or objects, and then personified. That would only be the case if we perceived objective reality first, and then inferred intent and purpose. But that isn't how perception operates, despite our preconceptions. Perception of things as tools, for example, occurs before or in concert with perception of things as objects. We see what things mean just as fast or faster than we see what they are. Perception of things as entities with personality also occurs before perception of things as things. This is particularly true of the action of others, living others, but we also see the non-living, objective world as animated, with purpose and intent. This is because of the operation of what psychologists have called the hyperactive agency detector within us. We evolved over millennia within intensely social circumstances. This means that the most significant elements of our environment of origin were personalities, not things, objects, or situations. The personalities we have evolved to perceive have been around in predictable form and in typical hierarchical configurations forever, for all intents and purposes. They have been male or female, for example, for a billion years. That's a long time. The division of life into its twin sexes occurred before the evolution of multicellular animals. It was in a still respectable one-fifth of that time that mammals, who take extensive care of their young, emerged. Thus, the category of parent and or child has been around for 200 million years. It's longer than birds have existed. That's longer than flowers have grown. It's not a billion years, but it's still a very long time. It's plenty long enough for male and female and parent and child to serve as vital and fundamental parts of the environment to which we have adapted. This means that male and female and parent and child are categories for us, natural categories deeply embedded in our perceptual, emotional, and motivational structures. Our brains are deeply social. Other creatures, particularly other humans, were crucially important to us as we lived, mated, and evolved. Those creatures were literally our natural habitat, our environment. From a Darwinian perspective, nature, reality itself, the environment itself, is what selects. The environment cannot be defined in any more fundamental manner. It is not mere inert matter. Reality itself is what we contend with when we are striving to survive and reproduce. A lot of that is other beings, their opinions of us, and their communities. And that's that. Over the millennia, as our brain capacity increased and we developed curiosity to spare, we became increasingly aware of and curious about the nature of the world, what we eventually conceptualized as the objective world, outside of the personalities of family and troop. And outside, quote unquote, is not merely unexplored physical territory. Outside is outside of what we currently understand. And understanding is dealing with and coping with and not merely representing objectively. But our brains had long been concentrating on other people. Thus, it appears that we first began to perceive the unknown, chaotic, non-human world with the innate categories of our social brain. And even this is a misstatement. When we first began to perceive the unknown, chaotic, non-animal world, we used categories that had originally evolved to represent the pre-human animal social world. Our minds are far older than mere humanity. Our categories are far older than our species. Our most basic category, as old in some sense as the sexual act itself, appears to be that of sex, male and female. We appear to have taken that primordial knowledge of structured creative opposition and begun to interpret everything through its lens. Order, the known, appears symbolically associated with masculinity, as illustrated in the aforementioned yang of the Taoist yin-yang symbol. This is perhaps because the primary hierarchical structure of human society is masculine, as it is among most animals, including the chimpanzees who are our closest genetic and arguably behavioral match. 
It is because men are, and throughout history have been, the builders of towns and cities, the engineers, stonemasons, bricklayers, and lumberjacks, the operators of heavy machinery. Order is God the Father, the eternal judge, ledger keeper, and dispenser of rewards and punishments. Order is the peacetime army of policemen and soldiers. It's the political culture, the corporate environment, and the system. It's the they in you know what they say. It's credit cards, classrooms, supermarket checkout lineups, turn-taking, traffic lights, and the familiar routes of daily commuters. Order, when pushed too far, when imbalanced, can also manifest itself destructively and terribly. It does so as the forced migration, the concentration camp, and the soul-devouring uniformity of the goose step. Chaos, the unknown, is symbolically associated with the feminine. This is partly because all the things we have come to know were born originally of the unknown, just as all beings we encountered were born of mothers. Chaos is the mater, origin, source, mother, materia, the substance from which all things are made. It is also what matters, or what is the matter, the very subject of matter of thought and communication. In its positive guise, chaos is possibility itself, the source of ideas, the mysterious realm of gestation and birth. As a negative force, it's the impenetrable darkness of a cave, and the accident by the side of the road. It's the mother grizzly, all compassion to her cubs, who marks you as a potential predator and tears you to pieces. Chaos, the eternal feminine, is also the crushing force of sexual selection. Women are choosy maters, unlike female chimps, their closest animal counterparts. Most men do not meet female human standards. It is for this reason that women on dating sites rate 85% of men as below average in attractiveness. It is for this reason that we all have twice as many female ancestors as male. Imagine that all the women who have ever lived have averaged one child. Now imagine that half the men who have ever lived have fathered two children, if they had any, while the other half fathered none. It is woman as nature who looks at half of all men and says, no. For the men, that's a direct encounter with chaos, and it occurs with devastating force every time they are turned down for a date. Human female choosiness is also why we are very different from the common ancestor we shared with our chimpanzee cousins, while the latter are very much the same. Women's proclivity to say no more than any other force, has shaped our evolution into the creative, industrious, upright, large-brained, competitive, aggressive, domineering creatures that we are. It is nature as woman who says, Well, bucko, you're good enough for a friend, but my experience of you so far has not indicated the suitability of your genetic material for continued propagation. Quote, end quote. The most profound religious symbols rely for their power in large part on this underlying fundamentally bipartisan conceptual subdivision. The Star of David is, for example, the downward-pointing triangle of femininity and the upward-pointing triangle of the male. Footnote on the triangle. It is of great interest in this regard that the five-part Taiji Tu, referred to in chapter one and the source of the simpler yin-yang symbol, expresses the origin of the cosmos as, first, originating in the undifferentiated absolute, then dividing into yin and yang, chaos and order, feminine and masculine, and then into the five agents, wood, fire, earth, metal, water, and then, simply put, the 10,000 things, quote unquote. The Star of David, chaos slash order, feminine slash masculine, gives rise in the same way to the four basic elements, fire, air, water, and earth, out of which everything is built. A similar hexagram is used by the Hindus. The downward triangle symbolizes Shakti, the feminine, the upward triangle Shiva, the masculine. The two components are known as Om and Hrim in Sanskrit. Remarkable examples of conceptual parallelism. Resuming. It's the same for the yoni and lingam of Hinduism, which come covered with snakes, our ancient adversaries and provocateurs. The Shiva Linga is depicted with snake deities called the Nagas. The ancient Egyptians represented Osiris, god of the state, and Isis, goddess of the underworld, as twin cobras with their tails knotted together. The same symbol was used in China to portray Fuxi and Nua, the creators of humanity and of writing. The representations in Christianity are less abstract, more like personalities, but the familiar Western images of the Virgin Mary with the Christ child and the Pieta both express the female-slash-male dual unity, as does the traditional insistence on the androgyny of Christ. It should also be noted, finally, that the structure of the brain itself, at a gross morphological level, appears to reflect this duality. This, to me, indicates the fundamental, beyond-the-metaphorical reality of this symbolically feminine-slash-masculine divide 
since the brain is adapted, by definition, to reality itself. That is, reality conceptualized in this quasi-Darwinian manner. Elkanon Goldberg, student of the great Russian neuropsychologist Alexander Luria, has proposed quite lucidly and directly that the very hemispheric structure of the cortex reflects the fundamental division between novelty, the unknown or chaos, and routinization, the known, order. He doesn't make reference to the symbols representing the structure of the world in reference to this theory, but that's all the better. An idea is more credible when it emerges as a consequence of investigations in different realms. We already know all this, but we don't know we know it. But we immediately comprehend it when it's articulated in a manner such as this. Everyone understands order and chaos, world and underworld, when it's explained using these terms. We all have a palpable sense of the chaos lurking under everything familiar. That's why we understand the strange, surreal stories of Pinocchio and Sleeping Beauty and The Lion King and The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, with their eternal landscapes of known and unknown, world and underworld. We've all been in both places many times, sometimes by happenstance, sometimes by choice. Many things begin to fall into place when you begin to consciously understand the world in this manner. It's as if the knowledge of your body and soul falls into alignment with the knowledge of your intellect. And there's more. Such knowledge is prescriptive, as well as descriptive. This is the kind of knowing what that helps you know how. This is the kind of is from which you can derive an ought. The Taoist juxtaposition of yin and yang, for example, doesn't simply portray chaos and order as the fundamental elements of being. It also tells you how to act. The way the Taoist path of life, is represented by, or exists on, the border between the twin serpents. The way is the path of proper being. It's the same way as that referred to by Christ in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, and the truth, and the life. The same idea is expressed in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We eternally inhabit order, surrounded by chaos. We eternally occupy known territory, surrounded by the unknown. We experience meaningful engagement when we mediate appropriately between them. We are adapted, in the deepest Darwinian sense, not to world of objects, but to the meta-realities of order and chaos, yang and yin. Chaos and order make up the eternal, transcendent environment of the living. To straddle that fundamental duality is to be balanced. To have one foot firmly planted in order and security and the other in chaos, possibility, growth and adventure. When life suddenly reveals itself as intense, gripping and meaningful, when time passes and you're so engrossed in what you're doing and you don't notice, it is there and then that you are located precisely on the border between order and chaos. The subjective meaning that we encounter there is the reaction of our deepest being, our neurologically and evolutionarily grounded instinctive self, indicating that we are ensuring the stability but also the expansion of habitable, productive territory of space that is personal, social, and natural. It's the right place to be in every sense. You are there when and where it matters. That's what music is telling you, too, when you're listening. Even more, perhaps, when you're dancing. When its harmonious layered patterns of predictability and unpredictability make meaning itself well up from the most profound depths of your being. Chaos and order are fundamental elements because every lived situation, even every conceivable lived situation, is made up of both. No matter where we are, there are some things we can identify, make use of, and predict, and some things we neither know nor understand. No matter who we are, Kalahari desert dweller or Wall Street banker, some things are under our control, and some things are not. That's why both can understand the same stories and dwell within the confines of the same eternal truths. Finally, the fundamental reality of chaos and order is true for everything alive, not only for us. Living things are always to be found in places they can master, surrounded by things and situations that make them vulnerable. Order is not enough. You can't just be stable and secure and unchanging, because there are still vital and important new things to be learned. Nonetheless, chaos can be too much. You can't long tolerate being swamped and overwhelmed beyond your capacity to cope while you're still learning what you still need to know. Thus, you need to place one foot in what you have mastered and understood and the other in what you are currently exploring and mastering. Then you have positioned yourself where the terror of existence is under control and you are secure, but where you are also alert and engaged. That is where there is something new to master and some way that you can be improved. That is where meaning is to be found. The Garden of Eden. Remember, as discussed earlier, that the Genesis stories were amalgamated from several sources. After the newer priestly story, Genesis 1, recounting the emergence of order from chaos, comes the second, even more ancient, Yahwist part, beginning, essentially, with Genesis 2. The Yahwist account, which uses the name Yahweh, or Yahweh, to represent God, contains the story of Adam and Eve, along with a much fuller explication of the events of the sixth day alluded to in the previous priestly story. 
The continuity between the stories appears to be the result of careful editing by the person or persons known singly to biblical scholars as the redactor, who wove the stories together. This may have occurred when the peoples of two traditions united, for one reason or another, and the subsequent illogic of their melded stories, growing together over time in an ungainly fashion, bothered someone conscious, courageous, and obsessed with coherence. According to the Yahwist creation story, God first created a bounded space known as Eden, which, in Aramaic, Jesus' putative language, means well-watered place, or paradise, paedaesa in old Iranian or Avestan, which means walled or protected enclosure or garden. God placed Adam in there, along with all manner of fruit-bearing trees, two of which were marked out. One of these was the tree of life, the other the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God then told Adam to have his fill of fruit as he wished, but added that the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was forbidden. After that, he created Eve as a partner for Adam. Footnote on partner for Adam. Or, in another interpretation, he split the original androgynous individual into two parts, male and female. According to this line of thinking, Christ, the second Adam, is also the original man before the sexual subdivision. The symbolic meaning of this should be clear to those who have followed the argument thus far. Resuming. Adam and Eve don't seem very conscious at the beginning when they are first placed in paradise, and they were certainly not self-conscious. As the story insists, the original parents were naked, but not ashamed. Such phrasing implies first that it's perfectly natural and normal for people to be ashamed of their nakedness, otherwise nothing would have been said about its absence, and second, that there was something amiss, for better or worse, with our first parents. Although there are exceptions, the only people around now who would be unashamed if suddenly dropped naked into a public place, excepting the odd exhibitionist, are those younger than three years of age. In fact, a common nightmare involves the sudden appearance of the dreamer, naked on a stage in front of a packed house. In the third verse of Genesis, a serpent appears, first apparently in legged form. God only knows why he allowed or placed such a creature in the garden. I have long puzzled over the meaning of this. It seems to be a reflection in part of the order slash chaos dichotomy characterizing all of experience, with paradise serving as habitable order and the serpent playing the role of chaos. The serpent in Eden, therefore, means the same thing as the black dot in the yin side of the Taoist yin-yang symbol of totality. That is, the possibility of the unknown and revolutionary suddenly manifesting itself where everything appears calm. It just does not appear possible even for God himself to make a bounded space completely protected from the outside not in the real world with its necessary limitations, surrounded by the transcendent. The outside, chaos, always sneaks into the inside because nothing can be completely walled off from the rest of reality. So even the ultimate in safe spaces inevitably harbors a snake. There were, forever, genuine, quotidian reptilian snakes in the grass and in the trees of our original African paradise. Even had all of these been banished, however, in some inconceivable manner by some primordial Saint George, snakes still would have remained in the form of our primordial human rivals at least when they were acting like enemies from our limited in-group kin-bonded perspectives. There was, after all, no shortage of conflict and warfare among our ancestors, tribal and otherwise. And even if we had defeated all the snakes that beset us from without, reptilian and human alike, we would still not have been safe. Nor are we now. We have seen the enemy, after all, and he is us. The snake inhabits each of our souls. This is the reason, as far as I can tell, for the strange Christian insistence made most explicit by John Milton that the snake in the Garden of Eden was also Satan, the spirit of evil itself. The importance of this symbolic identification, its staggering brilliance, can hardly be overstated. It is through such millennia-long exercise of the imagination that the idea of abstracted moral concepts themselves, with all they entail, developed. Work beyond comprehension was invested into the idea of good and evil and its surrounding dreamlike metaphor. The worst of all possible snakes is the eternal human proclivity for evil. The worst of all possible snakes is psychological, spiritual, personal, internal. No walls, however tall, will keep that out. Even if the fortress were thick enough in principle to keep everything bad whatsoever outside, it would immediately appear again within. As the great Russian writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn insisted, the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. There is simply no way to wall off some isolated portion of the greater surrounding reality and make everything permanently predictable and safe within it. Some of what has been, no matter how carefully excluded, will always sneak back in. A serpent, metaphorically speaking, will inevitably appear. Even the most assiduous of parents cannot fully protect their children, even if they lock them in the basement safely away from drugs, alcohol, and internet porn. In that extreme case, the too cautious, too caring parent merely substitutes him or herself for the other terrible problems of life. This is the great Freudian Oedipal nightmare. It is far better to render beings in your care competent than to protect them. And even if it were possible to permanently banish everything threatening, 
everything dangerous and therefore everything challenging and interesting, that would mean only that another danger would emerge, that of permanent human infantilism and absolute uselessness. How could the nature of man ever reach its full potential without challenge and danger? How dull and contemptible would we become if there was no longer reason to pay attention? Maybe God thought his new creation would be able to handle the serpent and considered its presence the lesser of two evils. Question for parents. Do you want to make your children safe or strong? In any case, there's a serpent in the garden and he's a subtle beast, according to the ancient story. Difficult to see, vaporous, cunning, deceitful, and treacherous. It therefore comes as no surprise when he decides to play a trick on Eve. Why Eve instead of Adam? It could just be chance. It was 50-50 for Eve, statistically speaking, and those are pretty high odds. But I have learned that these old stories contain nothing superfluous. Anything accidental, anything that does not serve the plot, has long been forgotten in the telling. As the Russian playwright Anton Chekhov advised, if there is a rifle hanging on the wall in Act 1, it must be fired in the next act. Otherwise, it has no business being there. Perhaps Primordial Eve had more reason to attend to serpents than Adam. Maybe they were more likely, for example, to prey on her tree-dwelling infants. Perhaps it is for this reason that Eve's daughters are more protective, self-conscious, fearful, and nervous to this day, even and especially in the most egalitarian of modern human societies. In any case, the serpent tells Eve that if she eats the forbidden fruit, she won't die. Instead, her eyes will be opened. She will become like God, knowing good from evil. Of course, the serpent doesn't let her know that she will be like God in only that one way. But he is a serpent after all. Being human and wanting to know more, Eve decides to eat the fruit. Poof, she wakes up. She's conscious, or perhaps self-conscious, for the first time. Now, no clear-seeing, conscious woman is going to tolerate an unawakened man. So, Eve immediately shares the fruit with Adam. That makes him self-conscious. Little has changed. Women have been making men self-conscious since the beginning of time. They do this primarily by rejecting them, but they also do it by shaming them, if men do not take responsibility. Since women bear the primary burden of reproduction, it's no wonder. It is very hard to see how it could be otherwise. But the capacity of women to shame men and render them self-conscious is still a primal force of nature. Now you may ask, what in the world have snakes got to do with vision? Well first, it's clearly of some importance to see them, because they might prey on you. Particularly when you're little and live in trees like our arboreal ancestors. Dr. Lynn Isbell, professor of anthropology and animal behavior at the University of California, has suggested that the stunningly acute vision almost uniquely possessed by human beings was an adaptation forced on us tens of millions of years ago by the necessity of detecting and avoiding the terrible danger of snakes with whom our ancestors co-evolved. This is perhaps one of the reasons the snake features in the Garden of Paradise as the creature who gave us the vision of God, in addition to serving as the primordial and eternal enemy of mankind. This is perhaps one of the reasons why Mary, the eternal archetypal mother, Eve perfected, is so commonly shown in medieval and renaissance iconography, holding the Christ child in the air as far away as possible from a predatory reptile which she has firmly pinned under her foot. And there's more. It's fruit that the snake offers. And fruit is also associated with a transformation of vision, in that our ability to see color is an adaptation that allows us to rapidly detect the ripe and therefore edible bounty of trees. Our primordial parents hearkened to the snake. They ate the fruit. Their eyes opened. They both awoke. You might think, as Eve did initially, that this would be a good thing. Sometimes, however, half a gift is worse than none. Adam and Eve wake up, all right, but only enough to discover some terrible things. First, they notice that they're naked. The Naked Ape My son figured out that he was naked well before he was three. He wanted to dress himself. He kept the washroom door firmly shut. He didn't appear in public without his clothes. I couldn't, for the life of me, see how this had anything to do with his upbringing. It was his own discovery, his own realization, and his own choice of reactions. It looked built in to me. What does it mean to know yourself naked? Or, potentially worse, to know yourself and your partner naked? All manner of terrible things, expressed in the rather horrifying manner, for example, of the Renaissance painter Hans Baldung Grin, whose painting inspired the illustration that begins this chapter. Naked means vulnerable and easily damaged. Naked means subject to judgment for beauty and health. Naked means unprotected and unarmed in the jungle of nature and man. This is why Adam and Eve became ashamed immediately after their eyes were opened. They could see. And what they first saw was themselves. Their faults stood out. Their vulnerability was on display. Unlike other mammals whose delicate abdomens are protected by the armor-like expanse of their backs, they were upright creatures, with the most vulnerable parts of their body presented to the world. And worse was to come. Adam and Eve made themselves loincloths in the International Standard Version, aprons in the King James Version, right away, to cover up their fragile bodies and to protect their egos. 
Then they promptly skittered off and hid. In their vulnerability now fully realized, they felt unworthy to stand before God. If you can't identify with that sentiment, you're just not thinking. Beauty shames the ugly. Strength shames the weak. Death shames the living. And the ideal shames us all. Thus we fear it, resent it, even hate it. And of course, that's the theme next examined in Genesis in the story of Cain and Abel. What are we to do about that? Abandon all ideals of beauty, health, brilliance, and strength? That's not a good solution. That would merely ensure that we would feel ashamed all the time and that we would even more justly deserve it. I don't want women who can stun by their mere presence to disappear just so that others can feel unselfconscious. I don't want intellects such as John von Neumann's to vanish just because of my barely grade 12 grasp of mathematics. By the time he was 19, he had redefined numbers. Numbers. Thank God for John von Neumann. Thank God for Grace Kelly and Anita Ekberg and Monica Bellucci. I'm proud to feel unworthy in the presence of people like that. It's the price we all pay for aim, achievement, and ambition. But it's also no wonder that Adam and Eve covered themselves up. The next part of the story is downright farcical in my opinion, although it's also tragic and terrible. That evening when Eden cools down, God goes out for his evening stroll, but Adam is absent. This puzzles God, who is accustomed to walking with him. Adam, calls God, apparently forgetting that he can see through bushes. Where are you? Adam immediately reveals himself, but badly. First as a neurotic, then as a rat fink. The creator of all the universe calls and Adam replies, I heard you, God, but I was naked and hid. What does this mean? It means that people, unsettled by their vulnerability, eternally fear to tell the truth, to mediate between chaos and order, and to manifest their destiny. In other words, they are afraid to walk with God. That's not particularly admirable, perhaps, but it's certainly understandable. God's a judgmental father. His standards are high. He's hard to please. God says, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat something you weren't supposed to? And Adam, in his wretchedness, points right at Eve, his love, his partner, his soulmate, and snitches on her. And then he blames God. He says, The woman whom you gave to me, she gave it to me, and then I ate it. How pathetic, and how accurate. The first woman made the first man self-conscious and resentful. Then the first man blamed the woman, and then the first man blamed God. This is exactly how every spurned male feels to this day. First, he feels small in front of the potential object of his love after she denigrates his reproductive suitability. Then he curses God for making her so bitchy, himself so useless, if he has any sense, and being itself so deeply flawed. Then he turns to thoughts of revenge. How thoroughly contemptible and how utterly understandable. At least the woman had the serpent to blame, and it later turns out that snake is Satan himself, unlikely as that seems. Thus, we can understand and sympathize with Eve's error. She was deceived by the best. But Adam, no one forced his words from his mouth. Unfortunately, the worst isn't over, for man or beast. First, God curses the serpent, telling him that he will now have to slither around, legless, forever in peril of being stomped on by angry humans. Second, he tells the woman that she will now bring forth children in sorrow and desire an unworthy, sometimes resentful man, who will in consequence lord her biological fate over her permanently. What might this mean? It could just mean that God is a patriarchal tyrant, as politically motivated interpretations of the ancient story insist. I think it's merely descriptive. Merely. And here's why. As human beings evolved, the brains that eventually gave rise to self-consciousness expanded tremendously. This produced an evolutionary arms race between fetal head and female pelvis. The female graciously widened her hips, almost to the point where running would no longer be possible. The baby, for his part, allowed himself to be born more than a year early compared to other mammals of his size, and evolved a semi-collapsible head. This was, and is, a painful adjustment for both. The essentially fetal baby is almost completely dependent on his mother for everything during that first year. The programmability of his massive brain means that he must be trained until he is 18, or 30, before being pushed out of the nest. That is to say nothing of the woman's consequential pain in childbirth, and high risk of death for mother and infant alike. This all means that women pay a high price for pregnancy and child-rearing, particularly in the early stages, and that one of the inevitable consequences is increased dependence upon the sometimes unreliable and always problematic good graces of men. After God tells Eve what is going to happen, now she has awakened and turns to Adam, who, along with his male descendants, doesn't get off any easier. God says something akin to this. Man, because you attended to a woman, your eyes have been opened, your godlike vision granted to you by snake fruit and lover, allows you to see far even into the future. But those who see into the future can also eternally see trouble coming, and must then prepare for all contingencies and possibilities. To do that, you will have to eternally sacrifice the present for the future. You must put aside pleasure or security. 
In short, you will have to work, and it's going to be difficult. I hope you're fond of thorns and thistles, because you're going to grow a lot of them. And then God banishes the first man and the first woman from paradise, out of infancy, out of the unconscious animal world into the horrors of history itself. And then he puts cherubim and a flaming sword at the gate of Eden just to stop them from eating the fruit of the tree of life. That, in particular, appears rather mean-spirited. Why not just make the poor humans immortal right away? Particularly if that is your plan for the ultimate future anyway, as the story goes. But who would dare to question God? Perhaps heaven is something that you must build, and immortality is something you must earn. And so we return to our original query. Why would someone buy prescription medication for his dog and then so carefully administer it when he would not do the same for himself? Now you have the answer, derived from one of the foundational texts of mankind. Why should anyone take care of anything as naked, ugly, ashamed, frightened, worthless, cowardly, resentful, defensive, and accusatory as a descendant of Adam, even if that thing, that being, is himself? And I do not mean at all to exclude women with this phrasing. All the reasons we have discussed so far for taking a dim view of humanity are applicable to others, as much as to the self. Their generalizations about human nature, nothing more specific. But you know so much more about yourself, you're bad enough as other people know you. But only you know the full range of your secret transgressions, insufficiencies, and inadequacies. No one is more familiar than you with all the ways your mind and body are flawed. No one has more reason to hold you in contempt, to see you as pathetic. And by withholding something that might do you good, you can punish yourself for all your failings. A dog, a harmless, innocent, unselfconscious dog, is clearly more deserving. But if you're not convinced yet, let us consider another vital issue. Order, chaos, life, death, sin, vision, work, and suffering. That is not enough for the authors of Genesis, nor for humanity itself. The story continues in all its catastrophe and tragedy, and the people involved, that's us, must contend with yet another painful awakening. We are next fated to contemplate morality itself. Good and Evil when their eyes are opened, Adam and Eve realize more than just their nakedness and the necessity of toil. They also come to know good and evil. The serpent says, referring to the fruit, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What could that possibly mean? What could be left to explore and relate after the vast ground already covered? Well, simple context indicates that it must have something to do with gardens, snakes, disobedience, fruit, sexuality, and nakedness. It was the last item, nakedness, that finally clued me in. It took years. Dogs are predators. So are cats. They kill things and eat them. It's not pretty, but we'll take them as pets and care for them and give them their medication when they're sick regardless. Why? They're predators, but it's just their nature. They do not bear responsibility for it. They're hungry, not evil. They don't have the presence of mind, the creativity, and above all, the self-consciousness necessary for the inspired cruelty of man. And why not? It's simple. Unlike us, the predators have no comprehension of their fundamental weakness, their fundamental vulnerability, their own subjugation to pain and death. But we know exactly how and where we can be hurt and why. That is as good a definition as any of self-consciousness. We are aware of our own defenselessness, finitude, and mortality. We can feel pain and self-disgust, and shame and horror, and we know it. We know what makes us suffer. We know how dread and pain can be inflicted on us. And that means we know exactly how to inflict it on others. We know how we are naked, and how nakedness can be exploited, and that means we know how others are naked, and how they can be exploited. We can terrify other people consciously. We can hurt and humiliate them for faults we understand only too well. We can torture them, literally, slowly, artfully, and terribly. That's far more than predation. That's a qualitative shift in understanding. That's a cataclysm as large as the development of self-consciousness itself. That's the entry of the knowledge of good and evil into the world. That's a second as yet unhealed fracture in the structure of existence. That's the transformation of being itself into a moral endeavor, all attendant on the development of sophisticated self-consciousness. Only man could conceive of the rack, the iron maiden, and the thumbscrew. Only man will inflict suffering for the sake of suffering. That is the best definition of evil I have been able to formulate. Animals can't manage that, but humans, with their excruciating, semi-divine capacities, most certainly can. 
And with this realization, we have well nigh full legitimization of the idea, very unpopular in modern intellectual circles, of original sin. And who would dare to say that there was no element of voluntary choice in our evolutionary, individual, and theological transformation? Our ancestors chose their sexual partners, and they selected for consciousness, and self-consciousness, and moral knowledge? And who can deny the sense of existential guilt that pervades human experience? And who could avoid noting that without that guilt, that sense of inbuilt corruption and capacity for wrongdoing, a man is one step from psychopathy? Human beings have a great capacity for wrongdoing. It's an attribute that is unique in the world of life. We can and do make things worse voluntarily with full knowledge of what we are doing, as well as accidentally and carelessly in a manner that is willfully blind. Given that terrible capacity, that proclivity for malevolent actions, is it any wonder we have a hard time taking care of ourselves or others? Or even that we doubt the value of the entire human enterprise? And we've suspected ourselves for good reason for a very long time. Thousands of years ago, the ancient Mesopotamians believed, for example, that mankind itself was made from the blood of Kingu, the single most terrible monster that the great goddess of chaos could produce in her most vengeful and destructive moments. After drawing conclusions such as that, how could we not question the value of our being, and even of being itself? Who then could be faced with illness in himself or another without doubting the moral utility of prescribing a healing medicament? And no one understands the darkness of the individual better than the individual himself. Who then, when ill, is going to be fully committed to his own care? Perhaps man is something that should never have been. Perhaps the world should even be cleansed of all human presence so that being and consciousness could return to the innocent brutality of the animal. I believe that the person who claims never to have wished for such a thing has neither consulted his memory nor confronted his darkest fantasies. What, then, is to be done? The Spark of the Divine In Genesis 1, God creates the world with the divine, truthful word, generating habitable, paradisal order from the pre-cosmogonic chaos. Hmm. He then creates man and woman in his image, imbuing them with his capacity to do the same, to create order from chaos and continue his work. At each stage of creation, including that involving the formation of the first couple, God reflects upon what has come to be and pronounces it good. The juxtaposition of Genesis 1 with Genesis 2 and 3, the latter two chapters outlining the fall of man, describing why our lot is so tragedy-ridden and ethically torturous, produces a narrative sequence almost unbearable in its profundity. The moral of Genesis 1 is that being brought into existence through true speech is good. This is true even of man himself prior to his separation from God. This goodness is terribly disrupted by the events of the fall and of Cain and Abel and the flood and the Tower of Babel, but we retain an intimation of the prelapsarian state. We remember, so to speak. We remain eternally nostalgic for the innocence of childhood, the divine, unconscious being of the animal, and the untouched cathedral-like old-growth forest. We find respite in such things. We worship them, even if we are self-proclaimed atheistic environmentalists of the most anti-human sort. The original state of nature conceived in this manner is paradisal. But we are no longer one with God in nature, and there is no simple turning back. The original man and woman, existing in unbroken unity with their creator, did not appear conscious, and certainly not self-conscious. Their eyes were not open. But in their perfection, they were also less, not more, than their post-fall counterparts. Their goodness was something bestowed rather than deserved or earned. They exercised no choice. God knows, that's easier. But maybe it's not better than, for example, goodness genuinely earned. Maybe even in some cosmic sense, assuming that consciousness itself is a phenomena of cosmic significance, free choice matters. Who can speak with certainty about such things? I'm unwilling to take these questions off the table, however, merely because they are difficult. So here's a proposition. Perhaps it is not simply the emergence of self-consciousness and the rise of our moral knowledge of death and the fall that besets us and makes us doubt our own worth. Perhaps it is instead our unwillingness, reflected in Adam's shamed hiding, to walk with God despite our fragility and propensity for evil. The entire Bible is structured so that everything after the fall, the history of Israel, the prophets, the coming of Christ, is presented as a remedy for that fall, a way out of evil. The beginning of conscious history, the rise of the state and all its pathologies of pride and rigidity, the emergence of great moral figures who try to set things right, culminating in the Messiah himself, that's all part of humanity's attempt, God willing, to set itself right. And what would that mean? And this is an amazing thing. The answer is already implicit in Genesis 1, to embody the image of God, to speak out of chaos the being that is good, but to do so consciously, of our own free choice. Back is the way forward, as T.S. Eliot so rightly insisted, but back as awake beings, 
exercising the proper choice of awake beings instead of back to sleep. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover, is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree. Not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea, quick now, here, now, always. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flames are enfolded into the crown not of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. Little Gidding, Four Quartets, 1943 If we wish to take care of ourselves properly, we would have to respect ourselves, but we don't, because we are, not least in our own eyes, fallen creatures. If we lived in truth, if we spoke the truth, then we could walk with God once again and respect ourselves and others and the world. Then we might treat ourselves like people we cared for. We might strive to set the world straight. We might orient it toward heaven, where we would want people we cared for to dwell instead of hell, where our resentment and hatred would eternally sentence everyone. In the areas where Christianity emerged 2,000 years ago, people were much more barbaric than they are today. Conflict was everywhere. Human sacrifice, including that of children, was a common occurrence even in technologically sophisticated societies such as that of ancient Carthage. In Rome, arena sports were competitions to the death, and the spilling of blood was a commonplace. The probability that a modern person in a functional democratic country will now kill or be killed is infinitesimally low compared to what it was in previous societies, and still is in the unorganized and anarchic parts of the world. Then the primary moral issue confronting society was control of violent, impulsive selfishness and the mindless greed and brutality that accompanies it. People with those aggressive tendencies still exist. At least, now they know that such behavior is suboptimal and either try to control it or encounter major social obstacles if they don't. But now, also, another problem has arisen, which was perhaps less common in our harsher past. It is easy to believe that people are arrogant and egotistical and always looking out for themselves. The cynicism that makes that opinion a universal truism is widespread and fashionable. But such an orientation to the world is not at all characteristic of many people. They have the opposite problem. They shoulder intolerable burdens of self-disgust, self-contempt, shame, and self-consciousness. Thus, instead of narcissistically inflating their own importance, they don't value themselves at all, and they don't take care of themselves with attention and skill. It seems that people often don't really believe that they deserve the best care, personally speaking. They are excruciatingly aware of their own faults and inadequacies, real and exaggerated, and ashamed and doubtful of their own value. They believe that other people shouldn't suffer, and they will work diligently and altruistically to help them alleviate it. They extend the same courtesy even to the animals they are acquainted with, but not so easily to themselves. It is true that the idea of virtuous self-sacrifice is deeply embedded in Western culture, at least insofar as the West has been influenced by Christianity, which is based on the imitation of someone who performed the ultimate act of self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. Any claim that the golden rule does not mean sacrifice yourself to others might therefore appear dubious. But Christ's archetypal death exists as an example of how to accept finitude, betrayal, and tyranny heroically. How to walk with God, despite the tragedy of self-conscious knowledge, and not as a directive to victimize ourselves in the service of others. To sacrifice ourselves to God, to the highest good if you like, does not mean to suffer silently and willingly when some person or organization demands more from us consistently than is offered in return. That means we are supporting tyranny and allowing ourselves to be treated like slaves. It is not virtuous to be victimized by a bully, even if that bully is oneself. I learned two very important lessons from Carl Jung, the famous Swiss depth psychologist, about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, or loving your neighbor as yourself. The first lesson was that neither of those statements has anything to do with being nice. The second was that both are equations rather than injunctions. If I am someone's friend, family member, or lover, then I am morally obliged to bargain as hard on my own behalf as they are on theirs. If I fail to do so, I will end up a slave, and the other person a tyrant. And what good is that? It is much better for any relationship when both partners are strong. Furthermore, there is little difference between standing up and speaking for yourself when you are being bullied or otherwise tormented and enslaved, and standing up and speaking for someone else. As Jung points out, this means embracing and loving the sinner who is yourself, as much as forgiving and aiding someone else who is stumbling and imperfect. As God himself claims, so goes the story, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. According to this philosophy, you do not simply belong to yourself. You are not simply your own possession to torture and mistreat. This is partly because your being is inexorably tied up with that of others, and your mistreatment of yourself can have catastrophic consequences for others. This is most clearly evident, perhaps, in the aftermath of suicide, when those left behind are often bereft and traumatized. 
but metaphorically speaking, there is also this. You have a spark of the divine in you, which belongs not to you but to God. We are, after all, according to Genesis, made in his image. We have the semi-divine capacity for consciousness. Our consciousness participates in the speaking forth of being. We are low-resolution, canonic versions of God. We can make order from chaos and vice versa in our way, with our words. So we may not exactly be God, but we're not exactly nothing either. In my own periods of darkness, in the underworld of the soul, I find myself frequently overcome and amazed by the ability of people to befriend each other, to love their intimate partners and parents and children, and to do what they must do to keep the machinery of the world running. I knew a man, injured and disabled by a car accident, who was employed by a local utility. For years after the crash, he worked side by side with another man, who for his part suffered a degenerative neurological disease. They cooperated while repairing the lines, each making up for the other's inadequacy. And this sort of everyday heroism is the rule, I believe, rather than the exception. Most individuals are dealing with one or more serious health problems while going productively and uncomplainingly about their business. If anyone is fortunate enough to be in a rare period of grace and health, personally, then he or she typically has at least one close family member in crisis. Yet people prevail and continue to do difficult and effortful tasks to hold themselves and their families and society together. To me, this is miraculous. So much so that a dumbfounded gratitude is the only appropriate response. There are so many ways that things can fall apart or fail to work altogether, and it is always wounded people who are holding it together. They deserve some genuine and heartfelt admiration for that. It's an ongoing miracle of fortitude and perseverance. In my clinical practice, I encourage people to credit themselves and those around them for acting productively and with care, as well as the genuine concern and thoughtfulness they manifest towards others. People are so tortured by the limitations and constraint of being that I'm amazed they ever act properly or look beyond themselves at all. But enough do so that we have central heat and running water and infinite computational power and electricity and enough for everyone to eat and even the capacity to contemplate the fate of broader society and nature, terrible nature itself. All that complex machinery that protects us from freezing and starving and dying from lack of water tends unceasingly toward malfunction through entropy and is only the constant attention of careful people that keeps it working so unbelievably well. Some people degenerate into hell of resentment and the hatred of being, but most refuse to do so, despite their suffering and disappointments and losses and inadequacies and ugliness, and again, that is a miracle for those with the eyes to see it. Humanity in Toto and those who compose it as identifiable people deserve some sympathy for the appalling burden under which the human individual genuinely staggers, some sympathy for subjugation to mortal vulnerability tyranny of the state, and the depredations of nature. It is, an existential <laughs> it is an existential situation that no mere animal encounters or endures, and one of severity such that it would take a god to fully bear it. It is this sympathy that should be the proper medicament for self-conscious self-contempt, which has its justification, but is only half the full and proper story. Hatred for self and mankind must be balanced with gratefulness for tradition and the state and astonishment at what normal everyday people accomplish to say nothing of the staggering achievements of the truly remarkable. We deserve some respect. You deserve some respect. You are important to other people as much as to yourself. You have some vital role to play in the unfolding destiny of the world. You are, therefore, morally obliged to take care of yourself. You should take care of, help, and be good to yourself, the same way you would take care of, help, and be good to someone you loved and valued. You may, therefore, have to conduct yourself habitually in a manner that allows you some respect for your own being, and fair enough. But every person is deeply flawed. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. If that stark fact meant, however, that we had no responsibility to care for ourselves as much as others, everyone would be brutally punished all the time. Whew. That would not be good. That would make the shortcomings of the world, which can make everyone who thinks honestly question the very propriety of the world, worse in every way. That simply cannot be the proper path forward. To treat yourself as if you were someone you are responsible for helping is, instead, to consider what would be truly good for you. This is not what you want. It's also not what would make you happy, quote unquote. Every time you give a child something sweet, you make that child happy. That does not mean that you should do nothing for children except feed them candy. Happy, quote unquote, is by no means synonymous with good. You must get children to brush their teeth. They must put on their snowsuits when they go outside in the cold, even though they might object strenuously. You must help a child become a virtuous, responsible, awake being capable of full reciprocity, able to take care of himself and others, and to thrive while doing so. Why would you think it's acceptable to do anything less for yourself? You need to consider the future and think, what might my life look like if I were caring for myself properly? What career would challenge me and render me productive and helpful so that I could shoulder my share of the load and enjoy the consequences? What should I be doing when I have some freedom 
to improve my health, expand my knowledge, strengthen my body. You need to know where you are so you can start to chart your course. You need to know who you are so that you can understand your armament and bolster yourself in respect to your limitations. You need to know where you are going so that you can limit the extent of chaos in your life, restructure order, and bring the divine force of hope to bear on the world. You must determine where you are going so that you can bargain for yourself, so that you don't end up resentful, vengeful, and cruel. You have to articulate your own principles so that you can defend yourself against others taking inappropriate advantage of you, and so you are secure and safe while you work and play. You must discipline yourself carefully. You must keep the promises you make to yourself and reward yourself so that you can trust and motivate yourself. You need to determine how to act toward yourself so that you are most likely to become and to stay a good person. It would be good to make the world a better place. Heaven, after all, will not arrive of its own accord. We will have to work to bring it about and strengthen ourselves so that we can withstand the deadly angels and flaming sword of judgment that God used to bar its entrance. Don't underestimate the power of vision and direction. These are irresistible forces able to transform what might appear to be unconquerable obstacles into traversable pathways and expanding opportunities. Strengthen the individual. Start with yourself. Take care with yourself. Define who you are. Refine your personality. Choose your destination and articulate your being. As the great 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche so brilliantly noted, he whose life has a why can bear almost any how. You could help direct the world on its careening trajectory a bit more toward heaven and a bit more away from hell. Once having understood hell, researched it, so to speak, particularly your own individual hell, you could decide against going there or creating that. You could aim elsewhere. You could, in fact, devote your life to this. That would give you a meaning, with a capital M. That would justify your miserable existence. That would atone for your sinful nature and replace your shame and self-consciousness with the natural pride and forthright confidence of someone who has learned once again to walk with God in the garden. You could begin by treating yourself as if you were someone you were responsible for helping. 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Rule 3. Make friends with people who want the best for you. The Old Hometown The town I grew up in had been scraped only 50 years earlier out of the endless flat northern prairie. Fairview, Alberta was part of the frontier and had the cowboy bars to prove it. The Hudson's Bay Company department store on Main Street still bought beaver, wolf, and coyote furs directly from the local trappers. 3,000 people lived there, 400 miles away from the nearest city. Cable TV, video games, and internet did not exist. It was no easy matter to stay innocently amused in Fairview, particularly during the five months of winter when long stretches of 40 below days and even colder nights were the norm. The world is a different place when it's cold like that. The drunks in our town ended their sad lives early. They passed out in snowbanks at three in the morning and froze to death. You don't go outside casually when it's 40 below. On first breath, the arid desert air constricts your lungs. Ice forms on your eyelashes and they stick together. Long hair, wet from the shower, freezes solid and then stands on end, wraith-like of its own accord later in a warm house, when it thaws bone dry, charged with electricity. Children only put their tongues on steel playground equipment once. <laughs> Smoke from house chimneys doesn't rise. Defeated by the cold, it drifts downwards and collects like fog on snow-covered rooftops and yards. Cars must be plugged in at night, their engines warmed by block heaters, or oil will not flow through them in the morning and they won't start. Sometimes they won't anyway. Then you turn the engine over pointlessly until the starter clatters and falls silent. Then you remove the frozen battery from the car, loosening bolts with stiffening fingers in the intense cold, and bring it into the house. It sits there, sweating for hours, until it warms enough to hold a decent charge. You're not going to see out of the back window of your car, either. It frosts over in November and stays that way until May. Scraping it off just dampens the upholstery. Then it's frozen, too. Late one night, going to visit a friend, I sat for two hours on the edge of the passenger seat in a 1970 Dodge Challenger, jammed up against the stick shift, using a vodka-soaked rag to keep the inside of the front windshield clear in front of the driver because the car heater had quit. Stopping wasn't an option. There was nowhere to stop. And it was hell on housecats. Felines in Fairview had short ears and tails because they had lost the tips of both to frostbite. They came to resemble arctic foxes, which evolved those features to deal proactively with the intense cold. One day, our cat got outside, and no one noticed. We found him later. Fur frozen fast to the cold, hard back door cement steps where he sat. We carefully separated the cat from concrete with no lasting damage, except to his pride. Fairview cats were also at great risk in the winter from cars, but not for the reasons you think. It wasn't automobiles sliding on icy roads and running them over. Only loser cats died that way. It was cars parked immediately after being driven that were dangerous. A frigid cat might think highly of climbing up under such a vehicle and sitting on its still warm engine block. 
but what if the driver decided to use the car again before the engine cooled down and the cat departed? Let's just say the heat-seeking house pets and rapidly rotating radiator fans do not coexist happily. Because we were so far north, the bitterly cold winters were also very dark. By December, the sun didn't rise until 9.30 a.m. We trudged to school in the pitch black. It wasn't much lighter when we walked to home, just before the early sunset. There wasn't much for young people to do in Fairview, even in the summer. But the winters were worse. Then your friends mattered, more than anything. My friend Chris and his cousin. I had a friend at that time. We'll call him Chris. He was a smart guy. He read a lot. He liked science fiction of the kind I was attracted to. Bradbury, Heinlein, Clark. He was inventive. He was interested in electronic kits and gears and motors. He was a natural engineer. All this was overshadowed, however, by something that had gone wrong in his family. I don't know what it was. His sisters were smart and his father was soft-smoken and his mother was kind. The girls seemed okay. But Chris had been left unattended to in some important way. Despite his intelligence and curiosity, he was angry, resentful, and without hope. All this manifested itself in material form in the shape of his 1972 blue Ford pickup truck. That notorious vehicle had at least one dent in every quarter panel of its damaged external body. Worse, it had an equivalent number of dents inside. Those were produced by the impact of the body parts of friends against the internal surfaces during the continual accidents that resulted in the outer dents. Chris's truck was the exoskeleton of a nihilist. It had the perfect bumper sticker, Be alert! The world needs more alerts. The irony it produced in combination with the dents elevated it nicely to theater of the absurd. Very little of that was, so to speak, accidental. Every time Chris crashed his truck, his father would fix it and buy him something else. He had a motorbike and a van for selling ice cream. He did not care for his motorbike. He sold no ice cream. He often expressed dissatisfaction with his father and their relationship. But his dad was older and unwell, diagnosed with an illness only after many years. He didn't have the energy he should have. Maybe he couldn't pay enough attention to his son. Maybe that's all it took to fracture their relationship. Chris had a cousin, Ed, who was about two years younger. I liked him as much as you can like the younger cousin of a teenage friend. He was a tall, smart, charming, good-looking kid. He was witty, too. You would have predicted a good future for him had you met him when he was 12. But Ed drifted slowly downhill into a dropout, semi-drifting mode of existence. He didn't get as angry as Chris, but he was just as confused. If you knew Ed's friends, you might say that it was peer pressure that set him on his downward path. But his peers weren't obviously any more lost or delinquent than he was, although they were generally somewhat less bright. It was also the case that Ed's and Chris's situation did not appear particularly improved by their discovery of marijuana. Marijuana isn't bad for everyone any more than alcohol is bad for everyone. Sometimes it even appears to improve people. But it didn't improve Ed. It didn't improve Chris, either. To amuse ourselves in the long nights, Chris and I and Ed and the rest of the teenagers drove around and around in our 1970s cars and pickup trucks. We cruised down Main Street along Railroad Avenue, up past the high school, around the north end of town, over to the west. Or up Main Street, around the north end of town, over to the east, and so on, endlessly repeating the theme. If we weren't driving in town, we were driving in the countryside. A century earlier, surveyors had laid out a vast grid across the entire 300,000 square mile expanse of the Great Western Prairie. Every two miles north, a plowed gravel road stretched forever east to west. Every mile west, another traveled north and south. We never ran out of roads. Teenage Wasteland If we weren't circling around town and countryside, we were at a party. Some relatively young adult, or some relatively creepy, older adult, would open his house to friends. It would then become a temporary home to all manner of party crashers, many of whom started out seriously undesirable or quickly become that way when drinking. A party might also happen accidentally, when some of the teenager's unwitting parents had left town. In that case, the occupants of the cars or trucks always cruising around would notice house lights on, but household car absent. This was not good. Things could get seriously out of hand. I did not like teenage parties. I not remember them nostalgically. They were dismal affairs. The lights were kept low. That kept self-consciousness to a minimum. The over-loud music made conversation impossible. There was little to talk about in any case. There were always a couple of the town psychopaths attending. Everybody drank and smoked too much. A dreary and oppressive sense of aimlessness hung over such occasions, and nothing ever happened, unless you count the time my too-quiet classmate drunkenly began to brandish his fully loaded 12-gauge shotgun, or the time the girl I later married contemptuously insulted someone while he threatened her with a knife, or the time another friend climbed a large tree, swung out on a branch, and crashed flat onto his back, half dead right beside the campfire we had started at its base, followed precisely one minute later by his half-wit sidekick. <laughs> no one knew what the hell they were doing at those parties. Hoping for a cheerleader? Waiting for Godot? Although the former would have been immediately preferred, although cheerleading squads were 
scarce in our town, the latter was closer to the truth. It would be more romantic, I suppose, to suggest that we would have all jumped at the chance for something more productive, bored out of our skulls as we were. But it's not true. We were all too prematurely cynical and world-weary and leery of responsibility to stick to the debating clubs and air cadets and school sports that the adults around us tried to organize. Doing anything wasn't cool. I don't know what teenage life was like before the revolutionaries of the late 60s advised everyone young to tune in, turn on, and drop out. Was it okay for a teenager to belong wholeheartedly to a club in 1955? Because it certainly wasn't 20 years later. Plenty of us turned on and dropped out, but not so many tuned in. I wanted to be elsewhere. I wasn't the only one. Everyone who eventually left the Fairview I grew up in knew they were leaving by the age of 12. I knew. My wife, who grew up with me on the street our families shared, knew. The friends I had who did and didn't leave also knew, regardless of which track they were on. There was an unspoken expectation in the families of those who were college-bound that such a thing was a matter of course. For those from less educated families, a future that included university was simply not part of the conceptual realm. It wasn't for lack of money, either. Tuition for advanced education was very low at that time, and jobs in Alberta were plentiful and high-paying. I earned more money in 1980 working at a plywood mill than I would again doing anything else for 20 years. No one missed out on university because of financial need in oil-rich Alberta in the 1970s. Some different friends, and some more of the same. In high school, after my first group of cronies had all dropped out, I made friends with a couple of newcomers. They came to Fairview as boarders. There was no school after ninth grade in their even more remote and aptly named hometown, Bear Canyon. They were an ambitious duo, comparatively speaking, straightforward and reliable, but also cool and very amusing. When I left town to attend Grande Prairie Regional College, 90 miles away, one of them became my roommate. The other went off elsewhere to pursue further education. Both were aiming upward. Their decisions to do so bolstered mine. I was a happy clam when I arrived at college. I found another expanded group of like-minded companions whom my Bear Canyon comrade also joined. We were all captivated by literature and philosophy. We ran the student union. We made it profitable for the first time in its history, hosting college dances. How can you lose money selling beer to college kids? We started a newspaper. We got to know our professors of political science and biology and English literature in the tiny seminars that characterized even our first year. The instructors were thankful for our enthusiasm and taught us well. We were building a better life. This left off a lot of my past. In a small town, everyone knows who you are. You drag your years behind you like a running dog with tin cans tied to its tail. You can't escape who you have been. Everything wasn't online then, and thank God for that. But it was stored equally indelibly in everyone's spoken and unspoken expectations and memory. When you move, everything is up in the air, at least for a while. It's stressful, but in the chaos there are new possibilities. People, including you, can't hem you in with their old notions. You get shaken out of your ruts. You can make new, better ruts with people aiming at better things. I thought this was just a natural development. I thought that every person who moved would have, and want, the same Phoenix-like experience, but that wasn't always the case. One time when I was about 15, I went with Chris and another friend, Carl, to Edmonton, a city of 600,000. Carl had never been to a city. This was not uncommon. Fairview to Edmonton was an 800-mile round trip. I had done it many times, sometimes with my parents, sometimes without. I liked the anonymity that the city provided. I liked the new beginnings. I liked the escape from the dismal, cramped, adolescent culture of my hometown. So I convinced my two friends to make the journey, but they did not have the same experience. As soon as we arrived, Chris and Carl wanted to buy some pot. We headed for the parts of Edmonton that were exactly like the worst of Fairview. We found the same furtive street vending marijuana providers. We spent the weekend drinking in the hotel room. Although we had traveled a long distance, we had gone nowhere at all. I saw an even more egregious example of this a few years later. I had moved to Edmonton to finish my undergraduate degree. I took an apartment with my sister, who was studying to be a nurse. She was also an up and out of there person. Not too many years later, she would plant strawberries in Norway and run safaris through Africa and smuggle trucks across the Tuareg menaced Sahara Desert and babysit orphan gorillas in the Congo. We had a nice place in a new high rise overlooking the broad valley of the North Saskatchewan River. We had a view of the city skyline in the background. I bought a beautiful new Yamaha upright piano in a fit of enthusiasm. The place looked good. I heard through the grapevine that Ed, Chris's younger cousin, had moved to the city. I thought that was a good thing. One day he called. I invited him over. I wanted to see how he was faring. I hoped he had achieved some of the potential I once saw in him. That's not what happened. Ed showed up, older, balder, and stooped. He was a lot more not-doing-so-well young adult and a lot less youthful possibility. His eyes were the telltale red slits of the practice stoner. Ed had taken some job, lawn mowing and casual landscaping, which would have been fine for a part-time university student or for someone who could not do better, but which was wretchedly low-end as a career for an intelligent person. He was accompanied by a friend. 
It was his friend, I really remember. He was spaced. He was baked. He was stoned out of his gourd. His head in our nice, civilized apartment did not easily occupy the same universe. My sister was there. She knew Ed. She'd seen this sort of thing before. But I still wasn't happy that Ed had brought this character into our place. Ed sat down. His friend sat down too, although it wasn't clear he noticed. It was tragic comedy. Stoned as he was, Ed still had the sense to be embarrassed. We sipped our beer. Ed's friend looked upwards. My particles are scattered all over the ceiling, he managed. Truer words were never spoken. I took Ed aside and told him politely that he had to leave. I said that he shouldn't have brought his useless bastard of a companion. He nodded. He understood. That made it even worse. His older cousin, Chris, wrote me a letter much later about such things. I included it in my first book, Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief, published in 1999. I had friends, he said, before. Anyone with enough self-contempt that they could forgive me mine. What was it that made Chris and Carl and Ed unable, or worse, perhaps, unwilling, to move or to change their friendships and improve the circumstances of their lives? Was it inevitable? A consequence of their own limitations, nascent illnesses and traumas of the past? After all, people vary significantly in ways that seem both structural and deterministic. People differ in intelligence, which is in large part the ability to learn and transform. People have very different personalities as well. Some are active and some are passive. Others are anxious or calm. For every individual driven to achieve, there's another who is indolent. The degree to which these differences are immutably part and parcel of someone is greater than an optimist might presume or desire. And then there's illness, mental and physical, diagnosed or invisible, further limiting or shaping our lives. Chris had a psychotic break in his 30s after flirting with insanity for many years. Not long afterward, he committed suicide. Did his heavy marijuana use play a magnifying role, or was it understandable self-medication? Use of physician-prescribed drugs for pain has, after all, decreased in marijuana legal states such as Colorado. Maybe the pot made things better for Chris, not worse. Maybe it eased his suffering, instead of exacerbating his instability. Was it the nihilistic philosophy he nurtured that paved the way to his eventual breakdown? Was that nihilism in turn a consequence of genuine ill health, or just an intellectual rationalization of his unwillingness to dive responsibly into life? Why did he, like his cousin, like my other friends, continually choose people who and places that were not good for him? Sometimes when people have a low opinion of their own worth, or perhaps when they refuse responsibility for their lives, they choose a new acquaintance of precisely the type who proved troublesome in the past. Some people don't believe that they deserve any better, so they don't go looking for it. Or perhaps they don't want the trouble of better. Freud called this a repetition compulsion. He thought of it as an unconscious drive to repeat the horrors of the past, sometimes perhaps to formulate those horrors more precisely, sometimes to attempt more active mastery, and sometimes perhaps no alternatives beckon. People create their worlds with the tools they have directly at hand. Faulty tools produce faulty results. Repeated use of the same faulty tools produces the same faulty results. It is in this manner that those who fail to learn from the past doom themselves to repeat it. It's partly fate. It's partly inability. It's partly... Unwillingness to learn? Refusal to learn? Motivated refusal to learn? Rescuing the damned. People choose friends who aren't good for them for other reasons too. Sometimes it's because they want to rescue someone. This is more typical of young people, although the impetus still exists among older folks who are too agreeable or have remained naive or who are willfully blind. Someone might object. It is only right to see the best in people. The highest virtue is the desire to help. But not everyone who is failing is a victim. And not everyone at the bottom wishes to rise, although many do and many manage it. Nonetheless, people will often accept or even amplify their own suffering, as well as that of others, if they can brandish it as evidence of the world's injustice. There's no shortage of oppressors among the downtrodden, even if, given their lowly positions, many of them are only tyrannical wannabes. It's the easiest path to choose, moment to moment, although it's nothing but hell in the long run. Imagine someone is not doing well. He needs help. He might even want it. But it is not easy to distinguish between someone truly wanting and needing help and someone who is merely exploiting a willing helper. The distinction is difficult even for the person who is wanting and needing and possibly exploiting. The person who tries and fails and is forgiven, and then tries again and fails and is forgiven, is also too often the person who wants everyone to believe in the authenticity of all that trying. When it's not just naivety, the attempt to rescue someone is often fueled by vanity and narcissism. Something like this is detailed in the incomparable Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky's, Dostoevsky's bitter classic, Notes from the Underground, which begins with these famous lines. I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I am an unattractive man. I believe my liver is diseased. 
It is the confession of a miserable, arrogant sojourner in the underworld of chaos and despair. He analyzes himself mercilessly, but only pays in this manner for hundred sins, despite committing a thousand. Then, imagining himself redeemed, the underground man commits the worst transgression of the lot. He offers aid to a genuinely unfortunate person, Lisa, a woman on the desperate 19th century road to prostitution. He invites her for a visit, promising to set her life back on the proper course. While waiting for her to appear, his fantasies spin increasingly messianic. One day passed, however, another and another. She did not come and I began to grow calmer. I felt particularly bold and cheerful. After nine o'clock I even sometimes began dreaming, and rather sweetly. I, for instance, become the salvation of Lisa, simply through her coming to me and my talking to her. I develop her, educate her. Finally, I notice that she loves me, loves me passionately. I pretend not to understand. I don't know, however, why I pretend just for effect, perhaps. At last, all confusion, transfigured, trembling, and sobbing, she flings herself at my feet and says that I am her savior and that she loves me better than anything in the world. Nothing but the narcissism of the underground man is nourished by such fantasies. Lisa herself is demolished by them. The salvation he offers her demands far more in the way of commitment and maturity than the underground man is willing or able to offer. He simply does not have the characters to see it through. Something he quickly realizes, and equally quickly rationalizes. Lisa eventually arrives at his shabby apartment, hoping desperately for a way out, staking everything she has on the visit. She tells the underground man that she wants to have her current life. His response? Why have you come to me? Tell me that, please. I began, gasping for breath and regardless of logical connection in my words. I longed to have it all out at once, at one burst. I did not even trouble how to begin. Why have you come? Answer, answer, I cried, hardly knowing what I was doing. I'll tell you, my good girl, why you have come. You've come because I talked sentimental stuff to you then. So now you are soft as butter and longing for fine sentiments again. So you may as well know that I was laughing at you then. And I am laughing at you now. Why are you shuddering? Yes, I was laughing at you. I had been insulted just before, at dinner, by the fellows who came that evening before me. I came to you, meaning to trash one of them, an officer. But I didn't succeed. I didn't find him. I had to avenge the insult on someone to get back my own again. You turned up. I vented my spleen on you and laughed at you. I had been humiliated, so I wanted to humiliate. I had been treated like a rag, so I wanted to show my power. That's what it was, and you imagined I had come here on purpose to save you. Yes? You imagined that? You imagined that? I knew that she would perhaps be muddled and not take it all in exactly. But I knew, too, that she would grasp the gist of it very well indeed. And so indeed she did. She turned white as a handkerchief, tried to say something, and her lips worked painfully. But she sank on a chair, as though she had been felled by an axe. And all the time afterwards she listened to me with her lips parted, and her eyes wide open, shuddering with awful terror. The cynicism, the cynicism of my words, overwhelmed her. The inflated self-importance, carelessness, and sheer malevolence of the underground man dashes Lisa's last hopes. He understands this well. Worse, something in him was aiming at this all along. And he knows that too. But a villain who despairs of his villainy has not become a hero. A hero is something positive, not just the absence of evil. But Christ himself, you might object, befriended tax collectors and prostitutes. How dare I cast aspersions on the motives of those who are trying to help? But Christ was the archetypal perfect man. And you're you. How do you know that your attempts to pull someone up won't instead bring them, or you, further down? Imagine the case of someone supervising an exceptional team of workers, all of them striving towards a collectively held goal. Imagine them hard-working, brilliant, creative, and unified. But the person supervising is also responsible for someone troubled who is performing poorly elsewhere. In a fit of inspiration, the well-meaning manager moves that problematic person into the midst of his stellar team, hoping to improve him by example. What happens? And the psychological literature is clear on this point. Does the errant interloper immediately straighten up and fly right? No. Instead, the entire team degenerates. The newcomer remains cynical, arrogant, and neurotic. He complains. He shirks. He misses important meetings. His low-quality work causes delays and must be redone by others. He still gets paid, however, just like his teammates. The hard workers who surround him start to feel betrayed. Why am I breaking myself into pieces striving to finish this project, each thinks when my new team member never breaks a sweat. The same thing happens when well-meaning counselors place a delinquent teen among comparatively civilized peers. 
The delinquency spreads, not the stability. Down is a lot easier than up. Maybe you are saving someone because you're a strong, generous, well-put-together person who wants to do the right thing. But it's also possible, and perhaps more likely, that you just want to draw attention to your inexhaustible reserves of compassion and goodwill. Or maybe you're saving someone because you want to convince yourself that the strength of your character is more than just a side effect of your luck and birthplace. Or maybe it's because it's easier to lurk, to lurk, to look virtuous when standing alongside someone utterly irresponsible. Assume first that you're doing the easiest thing and not the most difficult. Your raging alcoholism makes my binge drinking appear trivial. My long serious talks with you about your badly failing marriage convince both of us that you are doing everything possible and that I am helping you to my utmost. It looks like effort. It looks like progress. But real improvement would require far more from both of you. Are you so sure the person crying out to be saved has not decided a thousand times to accept his lot of pointless and worsening suffering simply because it is easier than shouldering any true responsibility? Are you enabling a delusion? Is it possible that your contempt would be more salutary than your pity? Or maybe you have no plan, genuine or otherwise, to rescue anybody. You're associating with people who are bad for you, not because it's better for anyone, but because it's easier. You know it. Your friends know it. You're all bound by an implicit contract, one aimed at nihilism and failure and suffering of the stupidest sort. You've all decided to sacrifice the future to the present. You don't talk about it. You don't all get together and say, let's take the easier path, let's indulge in whatever the moment might bring, and let's agree further not to call each other on it. That way we can more easily forget what we are doing. No, you don't mention any of that. But you all know what's really going on. Before you help someone, you should find out why that person is in trouble. You shouldn't merely assume that he or she is a noble victim of unjust circumstances and exploitation. It's the most unlikely explanation, if not the most probable. In my experience, clinical and otherwise, it's just never been that simple. Besides, if you buy the story that everything terrible just happened on its own with no personal responsibility on the part of the victim, you deny that person all agency in the past, and by implication, in the present and future as well. In this manner, you strip him or her of all power. It is far more likely that a given individual has just decided to reject the path upward because of its difficulty. Perhaps that should even be your default assumption when faced with such a situation. That's too harsh, you think. You might be right. Maybe that's a step too far. But consider this. Failure is easy to understand. No explanation for its existence is required. In the same manner, fear, hatred, addiction, promiscuity, betrayal, and deception require no explanation. It's not the existence of vice or the indulgence in it that requires explanation. Vice is easy. Failure is easy, too. It's easier not to shoulder a burden. It's easier not to think and not to do and not to care. It's easier to put off until tomorrow what needs to be done today and drown the upcoming months and years in today's cheap pleasures. As the infamous father of the Simpson clan puts it, immediately prior to drowning a jar of mayonnaise and vodka, That's a problem for future, Homer. Man, I don't envy that guy. How do I know that your suffering is not the demand of a martyrdom for my resources, so that you can oh-so-momentarily stave off the inevitable? Maybe you have even moved beyond caring about the impending collapse, but you don't yet want to admit it. Maybe my help won't rectify anything, can't rectify anything but it does keep that too terrible, too personal realization temporarily at bay. Maybe your misery is a demand placed on me so that I fail too, so that the gap you so painfully feel between us can be reduced while you degenerate and sink. How do I know that you would refuse to play such a game? How do I know that I am not myself merely pretending to be responsible while pointlessly helping you so that I don't have to do something truly difficult and genuinely possible? Maybe your misery is the weapon you brandish in your hatred for those who rose upward while you waited and sank. Maybe your misery is your attempt to prove the world's injustice instead of the evidence of your own sin, your own missing of the mark, your conscious refusal to strive and to live. Maybe your willingness to suffer in failure is inexhaustible given what you use that suffering to prove. Maybe it's your revenge on being. How exactly should I befriend you when you're in such a place? How exactly could I? Success, that's the mystery. Virtue, that's what's inexplicable. To fail, you merely have to cultivate a few bad habits. You just have to bide your time. And once someone has spent enough time cultivating bad habits and biding their time, they're much diminished. Much of what they could have been has dissipated, and much of the less that they have become is now real. Things fall apart of their own accord, but the sins of men speed their degeneration. And then comes the flood. I'm not saying that there's no hope of redemption, but it is much harder to extract someone from a chasm than to lift him from a ditch and some chasms are very deep, and there's not much left of the body at the bottom. 
Maybe I should at least wait to help you until it's clear that you want to be helped. Carl Rogers, the famous humanistic psychologist, believed it was impossible to start a therapeutic relationship if the person seeking help did not want to improve. Rogers believed it was impossible to convince someone to change for the better. The desire to improve was, instead, the precondition for progress. I've had court-mandated psychotherapy clients. They did not want my help. They were forced to seek it. It did not work. It was a travesty. If I stay in an unhealthy relationship with you, perhaps it's because I'm too weak-willed and indecisive to leave. But I don't want to know it. Thus, I continue helping you and console myself with my pointless martyrdom. Maybe I can then conclude about myself, someone that self-sacrificing, that willing to help someone, that has to be a good person. Not so. It might just be a person trying to look good pretending to solve what appears to be a difficult problem instead of actually being good and addressing something real. Maybe instead of continuing our friendship, I should just go off somewhere, get my act together, and lead by example. And none of this is a justification for abandoning those in real need to pursue your narrow, blind ambition in case it has to be said. A reciprocal arrangement. Here's something to consider. If you have a friend whose friendship you wouldn't recommend to your sister or your father or your son, why would you have such a friend for yourself? You might say, out of loyalty? Well, loyalty is not identical to stupidity. Loyalty must be negotiated fairly and honestly. Friendship is a reciprocal arrangement. You are not morally obliged to support someone who is making the world a worse place. Quite the opposite. You should choose people who want things to be better, not worse. It's a good thing, not a selfish thing, to choose people who are good for you. It's appropriate and praiseworthy to associate with people whose lives would be improved if they saw your life improve. If you surround yourself with people who support your upward aim, they will not tolerate your cynicism and destructiveness. They will instead encourage you when you do good for yourself and others and punish you carefully when you do not. This will help you bolster your resolve to do what you should do in the most appropriate and careful manner. People who are not aiming up will do the opposite. They will offer a former smoker a cigarette and a former alcoholic a beer. They will become jealous when you succeed or do something pristine. They will withdraw their presence or support or actively punish you for it. They will override your accomplishment with a past action, real or imaginary, of their own. Maybe they are trying to test you, to see if your resolve is real, to see if you are genuine. But mostly, they are dragging you down because your new improvements cast their faults in an even dimmer light. It is for this reason that every good example is a fateful challenge and every hero a judge. Michelangelo's great perfect marble David cries out to its observer, You could be more than you are. When you dare aspire upward, you reveal the inadequacy of the present and the promise of the future. Then you disturb others in the depths of their souls where they understand that their cynicism and immobility are unjustifiable. You play able to their cane. You remind them that they ceased caring not because of life's horrors, which are undeniable, but because they do not want to lift the world up onto their shoulders where it belongs. Don't think that it is easier to surround yourself with good, healthy people than with bad, unhealthy people. It's not. A good, healthy person is an ideal. It requires strength and daring to stand up near such a person. Have some humility, have some courage. Use your judgment and protect yourself from too uncritical compassion and pity. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Twelve Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Rule four, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. The Internal Critic it was easier for people to be good at something when more of us lived in small rural communities. Someone could be homecoming queen. Someone else could be spelling bee champ, math whiz, or basketball star. There were only one or two mechanics and a couple of teachers. In each of their domains, these local heroes had the opportunity to enjoy some serotonin field confidence of the victor. It may be for that reason that people who were born in small towns are statistically overrepresented among the eminent. If you're one in a million now but originated in modern New York, there's 20 of you, and most of us now live in cities. What's more, we've become digitally connected to the entire 7 billion. Our hierarchies of accomplishment are now dizzyingly vertical. No matter how good you are at something, or how you rank your accomplishments, there is someone out there who makes you look incompetent. You're a decent guitar player, but you're not Jimmy Page or Jack White. You're almost certainly not even going to rock your local pub. You're a good cook, but there are many great chefs. Your mother's recipe for fish heads and rice, no matter how celebrated in her village of origin, doesn't cut it in these days of grapefruit foam and scotch tobacco, tobacco, scotch tobacco ice cream. <laughs> Some mafia don has a tackier yacht. Some obsessive CEO has a more complicated self-winding watch, kept in his more valuable mechanical hardwood and steel automatic self-winding watch case. 
Even the most stunning Hollywood actress eventually transforms into the evil queen on eternal paranoid watch for the new Snow White. And you? Your career is boring and pointless. Your housekeeping skills are second rate. Your taste is appalling. You're fatter than your friends, and everyone dreads your parties. Who cares if you're Prime Minister of Canada when someone else is the President of the United States? Inside us dwells a critical internal voice and spirit that knows all this. It's predisposed to make its noisy case. It condemns our mediocre efforts. It can be very difficult to quell. Worse, critics of its sort are necessary. There's no shortage of tasteless artists, of tuneless musicians, poisonous cooks, bureaucratically personality-disordered middle managers, hack novelists, and tedious ideology-ridden professors. Things and people differ importantly in their qualities. Awful music torments listeners everywhere. Poorly designed buildings crumble in earthquakes. Substandard automobiles kill their drivers when they crash. Failure is the price we pay for standards. And because mediocrity has consequences, both real and harsh, standards are necessary. We are not equal in ability or outcome, and never will be. A very small number of people produce very much of everything. The winners don't take all, but they take most, and the bottom is not a good place to be. People are unhappy at the bottom. They get sick there, and remain unknown and unloved. They waste their lives there. They die there. In consequence, the self-denigrating voice in the minds of people weaves a devastating tale. Life is a zero-sum game. Worthlessness is the default condition. What but willful blindness could possibly shelter people from such withering criticism? It is for such reasons that a whole generation of social psychologists recommended positive illusions as the only reliable route to mental health. Their credo? Let a lie be your umbrella. A more dismal, wretched, pessimistic philosophy can hardly be imagined. Things are so terrible that only delusion can save you. Here's an alternative approach, and one that requires no illusions. If the cards are always stacked against you, perhaps the game you are playing is somehow rigged. Perhaps by you, unbeknownst to yourself. If the internal voice makes you doubt the value of your endeavors, or your life, or life itself, perhaps you should stop listening. If the critical voice within says the same denigrating things about everyone, no matter how successful, how reliable can it be? Maybe its comments are chatter, not wisdom. There will always be people better than you. That's a cliche of nihilism. Like the phrase, in a million years, who's going to know the difference? The proper response to that statement is not, well then, everything is meaningless. It's, any idiot can choose a frame of time within which nothing matters. Talking yourself into irrelevance is not a profound critique of being. It's a cheap trick of the rational mind. Many good games. Standards of better or worse are not illusory or unnecessary. If you hadn't decided that what you are doing right now was better than the alternatives, you wouldn't be doing it. The idea of a value-free choice is a contradiction in terms. Value judgments are a precondition for action. Furthermore, every activity, once chosen, comes with its own internal standards of accomplishment. If something can be done at all, it can be done better or worse. To do anything at all is therefore to play a game with a defined and valued end which can always be reached more or less efficiently and elegantly. Every game comes with its chance of success or failure. Differentials in quality are omnipresent. Furthermore, if there was no better and worse, nothing would be worth doing. There would be no value and therefore no meaning. Why make an effort if it doesn't improve anything? Meaning itself requires the difference between better and worse. How then can the voice of critical self-consciousness be stilled? Where are the flaws in the apparently impeccable logic of its message? We might start by considering the all too black and white words themselves, success or failure. You are either a success, comprehensive, singular, overall good thing, or its opposite, a failure, a comprehensive, singular, irredeemably bad thing. The words imply no alternative and no middle ground. However, in a world as complex as ours, such generalizations, really such failure to differentiate, are a sign of naive, unsophisticated, or even malevolent analysis. There are vital degrees and gradations of value obliterated by this binary system, and the consequences are not good. To begin with, there is not just one game at which to succeed or fail. There are many games, and more specifically many good games, games that match your talents, involve your productivity with other people, and sustain and even improve themselves across time. Lawyer is a good game. So is plumber, physician, carpenter, or school teacher. The world allows for many ways of being. If you don't succeed at one, you can try another. You can pick something better matched to your unique mix of strengths, weaknesses, and situation. Furthermore, if changing games does not work, you can invent a new one. I recently watched a talent show featuring a mime who taped his mouth shut and did something ridiculous with oven mitts. That was unexpected. That was original. It seemed to be working for him. 
It's also unlikely that you're playing only one game. You have a career and friends and family members and personal projects and artistic endeavors and athletic pursuits. You might consider judging your success across all of the games you play. Imagine that you are very good at some, middling at others, and terrible at the remainder. Perhaps that's how it should be. You might object. I should be winning at everything. But winning at everything might only mean that you're not doing anything new or difficult. You might be winning, but you're not growing. And growing might be the most important form of winning. Should victory in the present always take precedence over trajectory across time? Finally, you might come to realize that the specifics of the many games you are playing are so unique to you, so individual, that comparison to others is simply inappropriate. Perhaps you are overvaluing what you don't have and undervaluing what you do. There's some real utility in gratitude. It's also good protection against the dangers of victimhood and resentment. Your colleague outperforms you at work. His wife, however, is having an affair, while your marriage is stable and happy. Who has it better? The celebrity you admire is a chronic drunk driver and bigot. Is his life truly preferable to yours? When the internal critic puts you down using such comparisons, here's how it operates. First, it selects a single arbitrary domain of comparison, fame, maybe, or power. Then it acts as if that domain is the only one that is relevant. Then it contrasts you unfavorably with someone truly stellar within that domain. It can take that final step even further, using the unbridgeable gap between you and its target of comparison as evidence for the fundamental injustice of life. That way, your motivation to do anything at all can be most effectively undermined. Those who accept such an approach to self-evaluation certainly can't be accused of making things too easy for themselves. But it's just as big a problem to make things too difficult. When we are very young, we are neither individual nor informed. We have not had the time nor gained the wisdom to develop our own standards. In consequence, we must compare ourselves to others because standards are necessary. Without them, there is nowhere to go <laughs> and nothing to do. As we mature, we become, by contrast, increasingly individual and unique. The conditions of our lives become more and more personal and less and less comparable with those of others. Symbolically speaking, this means we must leave the house ruled by our father and confront the chaos of our individual being. We must take note of our disarray, without completely abandoning that father in the process. We must then rediscover the values of our culture, veiled from us by our ignorance, hidden in the dusty treasure trove of the past, rescue them and integrate them into our own lives. This is what gives existence its full and necessary meaning. Who are you? You think you know, but maybe you don't. You are, for example, neither your own master nor your own slave. You cannot easily tell yourself what to do and compel your own obedience any more than you can easily tell your husband, wife, son, or daughter what to do and compel theirs. You are interested in some things and not in others. You can shape that interest, but there are limits. Some activities will engage you and others simply will not. You have a nature. You can play the tyrant to it, but you will certainly rebel. How hard can you force yourself to work and sustain your desire to work? How much can you sacrifice to your partner before generosity turns to resentment? What is it that you actually love? What is it that you genuinely want? Before you can articulate your own standards of value, you must see yourself as a stranger, and then you must get to know yourself. What do you find valuable or pleasurable? How much leisure, enjoyment, and reward do you require so that you feel like more than a beast of burden? How much do you treat yourself so you won't kick over the traces and smash up your coral? You could force yourself through your daily grind and kick your dog in frustration when you come home. You could watch the precious days tick by. Or you could learn how to entice yourself into sustainable, productive activity. Do you ask yourself what you want? Do you negotiate fairly with yourself? Or are you a tyrant with yourself as a slave? When do you dislike your parents, your spouse, or your children, and why? What might be done about that? What do you need and want from your friends and your business partners? This is not a mere matter of what you should want. I'm not talking about what other people require from you or your duties to them. I'm talking about determining the nature of your moral obligation to yourself. Should might enter into it, because you are nested within a network of social obligations. Should is your responsibility, and you should live up to it. But this does not mean you must take the role of lapdog, obedient and harmless. That's how a dictator wants his slaves. Dare instead to be dangerous. Dare to be truthful. Dare to articulate yourself and express or at least become aware of, what would really justify your life. If you allowed your dark and unspoken desires for your partner, for example, to manifest themselves, if you were even willing to consider them, you might discover that they were not so dark given the light of day. You might discover instead that you were just afraid, and so pretending to be moral. You might find that getting what you actually desire would stop you from being tempted and straying. 
Are you so sure that your partner would be unhappy if more of you rose to the surface? The femme fatale and the anti-hero are sexually attractive for a reason. How do you need to be spoken to? What do you need to take from people? What are you putting up with or pretending to like from duty or obligation? Consult your resentment. It's a revelatory emotion for all its pathology. It's part of an evil triad, arrogance, deceit, and resentment. Nothing causes more harm than this underworld trinity. But resentment always means one of two things. Either the resentful person is immature, in which case he or she should shut up, quit whining, and get on with it, or there is tyranny afoot, in which case the person subjugated has a moral obligation to speak up. Why? Because the consequence of remaining silent is worse. Of course, it's easier in the moment to stay silent and avoid conflict, but in the long term, that's deadly. When you have something to say, silence is a lie, and tyranny feeds on lies. When should you push back against oppression despite the danger? When you start nursing secret fantasies of revenge, when your life is being poisoned and your imagination fills with the wish to devour and destroy. I had a client decades ago who suffered from severe obsessive compulsive disorder. He had to line up his pajamas just right before he could go to sleep at night. Then he had to fluff his pillow. Then he had to adjust his bed sheets. Over and over and over and over. I said, maybe that part of you, that insanely persistent part, wants something, inarticulate though it may be. Let it have its way. What could it be? He said, control. I said, close your eyes and let it tell you what it wants. Don't let fear stop you. You don't have to act it out just because you're thinking it. He said, it wants me to take my stepfather by the collar, put him up against the door and shake him like a rat. Maybe it was time to shake someone like a rat, although I suggested something a bit less primal. But God only knows what battles must be fought forthrightly voluntarily on the road to peace. What do you do to avoid conflict, necessary though it may be? What are you inclined to lie about, assuming the truth might be intolerable? What do you fake? The infant is dependent on his parents for almost everything he needs. The child, the successful child, can leave his parents, at least temporarily, and make friends. He gives up a little of himself to do that, but gains much in return. The successful adolescent must take that process to its logical conclusion. He has to leave his parents and become like everyone else. He has to integrate with a group so he can transcend his childhood dependency. Once integrated, the successful adult then must learn how to be just the right amount of different from everyone else. Be cautious when you're comparing yourself to others. You're a singular being once you're an adult. You have your own particular, specific problems, financial and intimate, psychological and otherwise, those are embedded in the unique, broader context of your existence. Your career or job works for you in a personal matter, or it does not, and it does so in a unique interplay with the other specifics of your life. You must decide how much of your time to spend on this, and how much on that. You must decide what to let go and what to pursue. The point of our eyes, or take stock. Our eyes are always pointing at things we are interested in approaching, or investigating, or looking for, or having. We must see, but to see we must aim, for we are always aiming. Our minds are built on the hunting and gathering platforms of our bodies. To hunt is to specify a target, track it, and throw at it. To gather is to specify and to grasp. We fling stones and spears and boomerangs. We toss balls through hoops and hit pucks into nets and curl carved granite rocks down the ice onto horizontal bullseyes. We launch projectiles at targets with bows, guns, rifles, and rockets. We hurl insults, launch plans, and pitch ideas. We succeed when we score a goal or hit a target. We fail, or sin, when we do not, as the word sin means to miss the mark. We cannot navigate without something to aim at, and while we are in the world, we must always navigate. We are always and simultaneously at point A, which is less desirable than it could be, moving toward point B, which we deem better in accordance with our explicit and implicit values. We always encounter the world in a state of insufficiency and seek its correction. We can imagine new ways that things could be set right and improved, even if we have everything we thought we needed. Even when satisfied temporarily, we remain curious. We live within a framework that defines the present as eternally lacking and the future as eternally better. If we did not see things this way, we would not act at all. We wouldn't even be able to see, because to see, we must focus. And to focus, we must pick one thing above all else on which to focus. But we can see. We can even see the things that aren't there. We can envision new ways that things could be better. We can construct new hypothetical worlds where problems we weren't even aware of can now show themselves and be addressed. The advantages of this are obvious. We can change the world so that the intolerable state of the present can be rectified in the future. 
the disadvantage to all this foresight and creativity is chronic unease and discomfort. Because we always contrast what is with what could be, we have to aim at what could be. We can aim too high or too low or too chaotically. So we fail and live in disappointment, even when we appear to others to be living well. How can we benefit from our imaginativeness, our ability to improve the future, without continually denigrating our current insufficiently successful and worthless lives? The first step, perhaps, is to take stock. Who are you? When you buy a house and prepare to live in it, you hire an inspector to list all its faults, as it is, in reality, now, not as you wish it could be. You'll even pay him for the bad news. You need to know. You need to discover the home's hidden flaws. You need to know whether they are cosmetic imperfections or structural inadequacies. You need to know because you can't fix something if you don't know it's broken. And you're broken. You need an inspector, the internal critic. It could play that role if you could get it on track, if you and it could cooperate. It could help you take stock. But you must walk through your psychological house with it and listen judiciously to what it says. Maybe you're a handyman's dream, a real fixer-upper. How can you start your renovations without being demoralized, even crushed by your internal critic's lengthy and painful report of your inadequacies? Here's a hint. The future is like the past, but there's a crucial difference. The past is fixed, but the future, it could be better. It could be better some precise amount, the amount that can be achieved perhaps in a day with some minimal engagement. The present is eternally flawed. But where you start might not be as important as the direction you are heading. Perhaps happiness is always to be found in the journey uphill, and not in the fleeting sense of satisfaction awaiting at the next peak. Much of happiness is hope, no matter how deep the underworld in which that hope was conceived. Called upon properly, the internal critic will suggest something to set in order, which you could set in order, which you would set in order, voluntarily, without resentment, even with pleasure. Ask yourself, is there one thing that exists in disarray in your life or your situation that you could and would set straight? Could you and would you fix that one thing that announces itself humbly in need of repair? Could you do it now? Imagine that you are someone with whom you must negotiate. Imagine further that you are lazy, touchy, resentful, and hard to get along with. With that attitude, it's not going to be easy to get you moving. You might have to use a little charm and playfulness. Excuse me, you might say to yourself, without irony or sarcasm. I'm trying to reduce some of the unnecessary suffering around here. I could use some help. Keep the derision at bay. I'm wondering if there's anything that you would be willing to do. I'd be very grateful for your service. Ask honestly and with humility. That's no simple matter. You might have to negotiate further, depending on your state of mind. Maybe you don't trust yourself. You think that you'll ask yourself for one thing and, having delivered, immediately demand more. And you'll be punitive and hurtful about it. And you'll denigrate what was already offered. Who wants to work for a tyrant like that? Not you. That's why you don't do what you want yourself to do. You're a bad employee, but a worse boss. Maybe you need to say to yourself, Okay, I know we haven't gotten along very well in the past. I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to improve. I'll probably make some more mistakes along the way, but I'll try to listen if you object. I'll try to learn. I noticed just now, today, that you weren't really jumping at the opportunity to help when I asked. Is there something I could offer in return for your cooperation? Maybe if you did the dishes, we could go for coffee. You like espresso? How about an espresso? Maybe a double shot, huh? Or is there something else you want? Then you can listen. Maybe you'll hear a voice inside. Maybe it's even the voice of a long-lost child. Maybe it will reply, Really? You really want to do something nice for me? You'll really do it? It's not a trick? This is where you must be careful. That little voice? That's the voice of someone once burnt and twice shy. So you could say very carefully, Really? I might not do it very well, and I might not be great company, but I will do something nice for you. I promise. A little careful kindness goes a long way, and judicious reward is a powerful motivator. Then you could take that small bit of yourself by the hand and do the damn dishes. And then you better not go clean the bathroom and forget about the coffee or the movie or the beer, or it will be even harder to call those forgotten parts of yourself forth from the nooks and crannies of the underworld. You might ask yourself, what could I say to someone else, my friend, my brother, my boss, my assistant, that would set things a bit more right between us tomorrow? What bit of chaos might I eradicate at home, on my desk, in my kitchen, tonight, so that the stage could be set for a better play? What snakes might I banish from my closet and my mind? Five hundred small decisions, five hundred tiny actions compose your day, today and every day. Could you aim one or two of these at a better result? Better in your own private opinion, by your own individual standards. 
Could you compare your specific personal tomorrow with your specific personal yesterday? Could you use your own judgment and ask yourself what that better tomorrow might be? Aim small. You don't want to shoulder too much to begin with, given your limited talents, tendency to deceive, burden of resentment, and ability to shirk responsibility. Thus, you set forward the following goal. By the end of the day, I want things in my life to be a tiny bit better than they were this morning. Then you ask yourself, what could I do that I would do that would accomplish that? And what small thing would I like as a reward? Then you do what you've decided to do, even if you do it badly. Then you give yourself that damn coffee and triumph. Maybe you feel a bit stupid about it, but you do it anyway. And you do the same thing tomorrow, and the next day, and the next. And with each day, your baseline of comparison gets a little higher. And that's magic. That's compound interest. Do that for three years, and your life will be entirely different. Now you're aiming for something higher. Now you're wishing on a star. Now the beam is disappearing from your eye, and you're learning to see. And what you aim at determines what you see. That's worth repeating. What you aim at determines what you see. What you want and what you see. The dependency of sight on aim, and therefore on value, because you aim at what you value, was demonstrated unforgettably by the cognitive psychologist Daniel Simmons, maybe Simons, more than 15 years ago. Simons was investigating something called sustained inattentional blindness. He would sit his research subjects in front of a video monitor and show them, for example, a field of wheat. Then he would transform the photo slowly, secretly, while they watched. He would slowly fade in a road cutting through the wheat. He didn't insert some little easy-to-miss footpath, either. It was a major trail occupying a good third of the image. Remarkably, the observers would frequently fail to take notice. The demonstration that made Dr. Simons famous was of the same kind but more dramatic, even unbelievable. First, he produced a video of two teams of three people. One team was wearing white shirts, the other black. The two teams were not off in the distance either, or in any way difficult to see. The six of them filled much of the video screen and their facial features were close enough to see clearly. Each team had its own ball, which they bounced or threw to their other team members as they moved and fainted in the small space in front of the elevators where the game was filmed. Once Dan had his video, he showed it to his study participants. He asked each of them to count the number of times the white shirts threw the ball back and forth to one another. After a few minutes, his subjects were asked to report the number of passes. Most answered 15. That was the correct answer. Most felt pretty good about that. Ha! They passed the test. But then, Dr. Simons asked, Did you see the gorilla? Was this a joke? What gorilla? So he said, watch the video again, but this time, don't count. Sure enough, a minute or so in, a man dressed in a gorilla suit waltzes right into the middle of the game for a few long seconds, stops, and then beats his chest in the manner of stereotyped gorillas everywhere. Right in the middle of the screen, large as life, painfully and irrefutably evident. But one out of every two of his research subjects missed it the first time they saw the video. It gets worse. Dr. Simons did another study. This time, he showed his subjects a video of someone being served at a counter. The server dips behind the counter to retrieve something and pops back up. So what? Most of his participants don't detect anything amiss. But it was a different person who stood up in the original server's place. No way, you think. I'd notice. But it's yes way. There's a high probability you wouldn't even detect the change, even if the gender or race of the person is switched at the same time. You're blind too. This is partly because vision is expensive. Psychophysiologically expensive. Neurologically expensive. Very little of your retina is high-resolution fovea, the very central high-resolution part of the eye used to do such things as identify faces. Each of the scarce foveal cells needs 10,000 cells in the visual cortex merely to manage the first part of the multi-stage processing of seeing. Then each of those 10,000 requires 10,000 more just to get to stage 2. If all your retina was fovea, you would require the skull of a B-movie alien to house your brain. In consequence, we triage when we see. Most of our vision is peripheral and low resolution. We save the fovea for things of importance. We point our high resolution capacities at the few specific things we are aiming at. And we let everything else, which is almost everything, fade, unnoticed, into the background. If something you're not attending to pops its ugly head up in a manner that directly interferes with your narrowly focused current activity, you will see it. Otherwise, it's just not there. The ball on which Simon's research subjects were focused was never obscured by the gorilla or by any of the six players. Because of that, because the gorilla did not interfere with the ongoing, narrowly defined task, it was indistinguishable from everything else the participants didn't see when they were looking at that ball. The big ape could be safely ignored. That's how you deal with the overwhelming complexity of the world. You ignore it. 
while you concentrate minutely on your private concerns. You see things that facilitate your movement forward toward your desired goals. You detect obstacles when they pop in your path. You're blind to everything else. And there's a lot of everything else, so you're very blind. And it has to be that way because there is much more of the world than there is of you. You must shepherd your limited resources carefully. Seeing is very difficult, so you must choose what to see and let the rest go. There's a profound idea in the ancient Vedic texts, the oldest scriptures of Hinduism and part of the bedrock of Indian culture. The world, as perceived, is maya, appearance or illusion. This means, in part, that people are blinded by their desires, as well as merely incapable of seeing things as they truly are. This is true in a sense that transcends the metaphorical. Your eyes are tools. They are there to help you get what you want. The price you pay for that utility, that specific focused direction, is blindness to everything else. This doesn't matter so much when things are going well and we are getting what we want, although it can be a problem even then because getting what we want currently can make us blind to higher callings. But all that ignored world presents a truly terrible problem when we're in crisis and nothing whatsoever is turning out the way we want it to. Then, there can be far too much to deal with. Happily, however, that problem contains within it the seeds of its own solution. Since you've ignored so much, there's plenty of possibility left where you have not yet looked. Imagine that you're unhappy. You're not getting what you need. Perversely, this may be because of what you want. You're blind because of what you desire. Perhaps what you really need is right in front of your eyes, but you cannot see it because of what you are currently aiming for. And that brings us to something else. The price that must be paid before you or anyone can get what they want, or better yet, what they need. Think about it this way. You look at the world in your particular idiosyncratic manner. You use a set of tools to screen most things out and let some things in. You have spent a lot of time building those tools. They've become habitual. They're not mere abstract thoughts. They're built right into you. They orient you in the world. They're your deepest and often implicit and unconscious values. They've become part of your biological structure. They're alive. And they don't want to disappear or transform or die. But sometimes their time has come, and new things need to be born. For this reason, although not only for this reason, it is necessary to let things go during the journey uphill. If things are not going well for you, well, that might be because, as the most cynical of aphorisms has it, life sucks and then you die. Before your crisis impels you to that hideous conclusion, however, you might consider the following. Life doesn't have the problem. You do. At least that realization leaves you with some options. If your life is not going well, perhaps it is your current knowledge that is insufficient, not life itself. Perhaps your value structure needs some serious retooling. Perhaps what you want is blinding you to what else could be. Perhaps you are holding on to your desires in the present so tightly that you cannot see anything else, even what you truly need. Imagine that you are thinking enviously, I should have my boss's job. If your boss sticks to his post stubbornly and competently, thoughts like that will lead you into a state of irritation, unhappiness, and disgust. You might realize this. You think, I am unhappy. However, I could be cured of this unhappiness if I could just fulfill my ambition. But then you, th you might think further, wait, wait, you think, maybe I'm not unhappy because I don't have my boss's job. Maybe I'm unhappy because I can't stop wanting that job. That doesn't mean you can simply and magically tell yourself to stop wanting that job and then listen and transform. You won't. You can't, in fact, just change yourself that easily. You have to dig deeper. You must change what you are after more profoundly. So you might think, I don't know what to do about this stupid suffering. I can't just abandon my ambitions. That would leave me nowhere to go. But my longing for a job that I can't have isn't working. You might decide to take a different tack. You might ask instead for the revelation of a different plan. One that would fulfill your desires and gratify your ambitions in a real sense. But that would remove from your life the bitterness and resentment from which you are currently affected. You might think, I will make a different plan. I will try to want whatever it is that would make my life better. Whatever that might be. And I will start working on it now. If that turns out to mean something other than chasing my boss's job, I will accept that and I will move forward. Now you're on a whole different kind of trajectory. Before, what was right, desirable, and worthy of pursuit was something narrow and concrete. But you became stuck there, tightly jammed and unhappy. So you let go. You make the necessary sacrifice and allow a whole new world of possibility, hidden from you because of your previous ambition, to reveal itself. And there's a lot there. What would your life look like if it were better? What would life itself look like? What does better even mean? You don't know. And it doesn't matter that you don't know exactly right away because you will start to slowly see what is better once you have truly decided to want it. You will start to perceive what remained hidden from you by your presuppositions and preconceptions by the previous mechanisms of your vision. You will begin to learn. This will only work, however, if you genuinely want your life to improve. You can't fool your implicit perceptual structures. 
not even a bit. They aim where you point them. To retool, to take stock, to aim somewhere better, you might have to think it through, bottom to top. You have to scour your psyche. You have to clean the damn thing up. And you must be cautious because making your life better means adopting a lot of responsibility. And that takes more effort and care than living stupidly in pain and remaining arrogant, deceitful, and resentful. What if it was the case that the world revealed whatever goodness it contains in precise proportion to your desire for the best? What if the more your conception of the best has been elevated, expanded, and rendered sophisticated, the more possibility and benefit you could perceive? This doesn't mean that you can have what you want merely by wishing it, or that everything is interpretation, or that there is no reality. The world is still there, with its structures and limits. As you move along with it, it cooperates or objects. But you can dance with it if your aim is to dance, and maybe you can even lead if you have enough skill and enough grace. This is not theology. It's not mysticism. It's empirical knowledge. There is nothing magical here, or nothing more than the already present magic of consciousness. We only see what we aim at. The rest of the world, and that's most of it, is hidden. If we start aiming at something different, something like, I want my life to be better, our minds will start presenting us with new information, derived from the previously hidden world, to aid us in that pursuit. Then we can put that information to use, and move, and act, and observe, and improve. And after doing so, after improving, we might pursue something different or higher. Something like, I want whatever might be better than just my life being better. And then, we enter a more elevated and more complete reality. In that place, what might we focus on? What might we see? Think about it like this. Start from the observation that we indeed desire things, even that we need them. That's human nature. We share the experience of hunger, loneliness, thirst, sexual desire, aggression, fear, and pain. Such things are elements of being primordial, axiomatic elements of being. But we must sort and organize these primordial desires because the world is a complex and obstinately real place. We can't just get the one particular thing we especially just want now, along with everything else we usually want, because our desires can produce conflict with our other desires, as well as with other people and with the world. Thus, we must become conscious of our desires, and articulate them and prioritize them, and arrange them into hierarchies. That makes them sophisticated. That makes them work with each other, and with the desires of other people and with the world. It is in that manner that our desires elevate themselves. It is in that manner that they organize themselves into values and become moral. Our values, our morality, they are indicators of our sophistication. The philosophical study of morality, of right and wrong, is ethics. Such study can render us more sophisticated in our choices. Even older and deeper than ethics, however, is religion. Religion concerns itself not with mere right and wrong, but with good and evil themselves, with the archetypes of right and wrong. Religion concerns itself with domain of value, ultimate value. That is not the scientific domain. It is not the territory of empirical description. The people who wrote and edited the Bible, for example, weren't scientists. They couldn't have been scientists even if they had wanted to be. The viewpoints, methods, and practices of science hadn't been formulated when the Bible was written. Religion is instead about proper behavior. It's about what Plato called the good. A genuine religious acolyte isn't trying to formulate accurate ideas about the objective nature of the world, although he may be trying to do that too. He's striving, instead, to be a good person. It may be the case that to him, good means nothing but obedient, even blindly obedient. Hence the classical liberal Western Enlightenment objection to religious belief. Obedience is not enough. But it's at least a start, and we have forgotten this. You cannot aim yourself at anything if you are completely undisciplined and untutored. You will not know what to target and you won't fly straight even if you somehow get your aim right. And then you will conclude, there is nothing to aim for, and then you will be lost. It is therefore necessary and desirable for religions to have a dogmatic element. What good is a value system that does not provide a stable structure? What good is a value system that does not point the way to higher order? And what good can you possibly be if you cannot or do not internalize that structure or accept that order, not as a final destination necessarily, but at least as a starting point? Without that, you're nothing but an adult two-year-old, without the charm or the potential. That is not to say, to say it again, that obedience is sufficient, but a person capable of obedience, let's say instead a properly disciplined person, is at least a well-forged tool. At least that. And that's not nothing. Of course, there must be vision beyond discipline, beyond dogma. A tool still needs a purpose. It is for such reasons that Christ said in the Gospel of Thomas, The kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, but men do not see it. Does that mean that what we see is dependent on our religious beliefs? Yes, and what we don't see as well. You might object. But I'm an atheist. No, you're not. 
<laughs> and if you want to understand this, you could read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, perhaps the greatest novel ever written in which the main character Raskolnikov decides to take his atheism with true seriousness, commits what he has rationalized as a benevolent murder, and pays the price. You're simply not an atheist in your actions, and it is your actions that most accurately reflect your deepest beliefs. Those that are implicit, embedded in your being, underneath your conscious apprehensions and articulable attitudes and surface-level self-knowledge. You can only find out what you actually believe, rather than what you think you believe, by watching how you act. You simply don't know what you believe before that. You are too complex to understand yourself. It takes careful observation and education and reflection and communication with others just to scratch the surface of your beliefs. Everything you value is a product of unimaginably lengthy developmental process, personal, cultural, and biological. You don't understand how what you want, and therefore what you see, is conditioned by the immense, abysmal, profound past. You simply don't understand how every circuit, every neural circuit through which you peer at the world has been shaped, and painfully, by the ethical aims of millions of years of human ancestors, and all of the life that was lived for the billions of years before that. You don't understand anything. You didn't even know that you were blind. Some of our knowledge of our beliefs has been documented. We have been watching ourselves act, reflecting on that watching, and telling stories distilled through that reflection for tens and perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. That is all part of our attempts, individual and collective, to discover and articulate what it is that we believe. Part of the knowledge so generated is what is encapsulated in the fundamental teachings of our cultures in ancient writings such as the Tao Te Ching, or the aforementioned Vedic scriptures, or the biblical stories. The Bible is, for better or worse, the foundational document of Western civilization, of Western values, Western morality, and Western conceptions of good and evil. It's the product of processes that remain fundamentally beyond our comprehension. The Bible is a library composed of many books, each written and edited by many people. It's a truly emergent document, a selected, sequenced, and finally coherent story written by no one and everyone over many thousands of years. The Bible has been thrown up out of the deep by the collective human imagination, which is itself a product of unimaginable forces operating over unfathomable spans of time. Its careful, respectful study can reveal things to us about what we believe about how we do and should act that can be discovered in almost no other manner. Old Testament God and New Testament God The God of the Old Testament can appear harsh, judgmental, unpredictable, and dangerous, particularly on cursory reading. The degree to which this is true has arguably been exaggerated by Christian commentators, intent on magnifying the distinction between the older and newer divisions of the Bible. There has been a price paid, however, for such plotting. And I mean that in both sense of the word. The tendency for modern people to think, when confronted with Jehovah, I would never believe in a God like that. But Old Testament God doesn't much care what modern people think. He often didn't care what Old Testament people thought either, although he could be bargained with to a surprising degree as is particularly evident in the Abrahamic stories. Nonetheless, when his people strayed from the path, when they disobeyed his injunctions, violated his covenants, and broke his commandments, trouble was certain to follow. If you did not do what Old Testament God demanded, whatever that might have been and however you might have tried to hide from it, you and your children and your children's children were in terrible, serious trouble. It was realists who created or noticed Old Testament God. When the denizens of those ancient societies wandered carelessly down the wrong path, they ended up enslaved and miserable, sometimes for centuries, when they were not obliterated completely. Was that reasonable? Was that just? Was that fair? The authors of the Old Testament asked such questions with extreme caution and under very limited conditions. They assumed instead that the creator of being knew what he was doing, that all power was essentially with him, and that his dictates should be carefully followed. They were wise. He was a force of nature. Is a hungry lion reasonable, fair, or just? What kind of nonsensical question is that? The Old Testament Israelites and their forebears knew that God was not to be trifled with, and that whatever hell the angry deity might allow to be engendered if he was crossed was real. Having recently passed through a century defined by the bottomless horrors of Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, we might realize the same thing. The New Testament God is often presented as a different character although the book of Revelation, with its final judgment, warns against any excessively naive complacency. He is more the kindly Geppetto, master craftsman, and benevolent father. He wants nothing for us but the best. He is all-loving and all-forgiving. Sure, he'll send you to hell if you misbehave badly enough. Fundamentally, however, he's the god of love. That seems more optimistic, more naively welcoming, but in precise proportion to that, less believable. 
In a world such as this, this hot house of doom, who could buy such a story? The all-good God in a post-Auschwitz world? It was for such reasons that the philosopher Nietzsche, perhaps the most astute critic ever to confront Christianity, considered New Testament God the worst literary crime in Western history. In Beyond Good and Evil, he wrote, In the Jewish Old Testament, the Book of Divine Justice, there are men, things, and speeches on such a grand style that Greek and Indian literature has nothing to compare with it. One stands with fear and reverence before those stupendous remains of what man was formerly, and has sad thoughts about old Asia and its little outpushed peninsula, Europe. To have bound up in this New Testament a kind of rococo of taste in every respect, along with the Old Testament into one book as the Bible, as the book in itself, is perhaps the greatest audacity and sin against the spirit which literary Europe has on its conscience. Who but the most naive among us could posit that such an all-God, merciful being, ruled this so terrible world? But something that seems incomprehensible to someone unseeing might be perfectly evident to someone who has opened his eyes. Let's return to the situation where your aim is being determined by something petty, your aforementioned envy of your boss. Because of that envy, the world you inhabit reveals itself as a place of bitterness, disappointment, and spite. Imagine that you come to notice and contemplate and reconsider your unhappiness. Further, you determine to accept responsibility for it and dare to posit that it might be something at least partly under your control. You crack open one eye for a moment and look. You ask for something better. You sacrifice your pettiness, repent of your envy, and open your heart. Instead of cursing the darkness, you let in a little light. You decide to aim for a better life instead of a better office. But you don't stop there. You realize that it's a mistake to aim for a better life if it comes at the cost of worsening someone else's. So you get creative. You decide to play a more difficult game. You decide that you want a better life in a manner that will also make the life of your family better. Or the life of your family and your friends. Or the life of your family and your friends and the strangers who surround them. And what about your enemies? Do you want to include them too? You bloody well don't know how to manage that. But you've read some history. You know how enmity compounds. So, you start to wish even your enemies well, at least in principle, although you are by no means yet a master of such sentiments. And the direction of your sight changes. You see past the limitations that hemmed you in unknowingly. New possibilities for your life emerge and you work toward their realization. Your life indeed improves. And then you start to think further. Better, perhaps? That means better for me and my family and my friends, even for my enemies. But that's not all that it means. It means better today, in a matter that makes everything better tomorrow, and next week, and next year, and a decade from now, and a hundred years from now, and a thousand years from now, and forever. And then better means to aim at the improvement of being, with a capital I and a capital B. Thinking all of this, realizing all of this, you take a risk. You decide that you will start treating Old Testament God, with all his terrible and oft arbitrary seeming power, as if he could also be New Testament God even though you understand the many ways in which that is absurd. In other words, you decide to act as if existence might be justified by its goodness, if only you behaved properly. And it is that decision, that declaration of existential faith, that allows you to overcome nihilism and resentment and arrogance. It is that declaration of faith that keeps hatred of being with all its attendant evils at bay. And, as for such faith, it is not at all the will to believe things that you know perfectly well to be false. Faith is not the childish belief in magic. That is ignorance, or even willful blindness. It is instead the realization that the tragic irrationalities of life must be counterbalanced by an equally irrational commitment to the essential goodness of being. It is simultaneously the will to dare set your sights at the unachievable, and to sacrifice everything, including, and most importantly, your life. You realize that you have literally nothing better to do. But how can you do all this? assuming you're foolish enough to try. You might start by not thinking, or more accurately, but less trenchantly, by refusing to subjugate your faith to your current rationality and its narrowness of view. That doesn't mean make yourself stupid. It means the opposite. It means instead that you must quit maneuvering and calculating and conniving and scheming and enforcing and demanding and avoiding and ignoring and punishing. It means you must place your old strategies aside. It means instead that you must pay attention as you may never have paid attention before. Pay attention. Pay attention. Focus on your surroundings, physical and psychological. Notice something that bothers you, that concerns you, that will not let you be, which you could fix and you would fix. You can find such somethings by asking yourself, 
as if you genuinely want to know, three questions. What is it that is bothering me? Is that something I could fix? And would I actually be willing to fix it? If you find that the answer is no to any or all of these questions, then look elsewhere, aim lower. Search until you find something that bothers you, that you could fix, that you would fix, and then fix it. That might be enough for the day. Maybe there's a stack of paper on your desk and you've been avoiding it. You won't even really look at it when you walk into your room. There are terrible things lurking there. Tax forms and bills and letters from people wanting things you aren't sure you can deliver. Notice your fear and have some sympathy for it. Maybe there are snakes in that pile of paper. Maybe you'll get bitten. Maybe there are even hydras lurking there. You'll cut off one head and seven more will grow. How could you possibly cope with that? You could ask yourself, is there anything at all that I might be willing to do about that pile of paper? Would I look, maybe, at one part of it for 20 minutes? Maybe the answer will be no, but you might look for 10 or even for 5, and if not that, for 1. Start there. You will soon find that the entire pile shrinks in significance merely because you have looked at part of it. And you'll find that the whole thing is made of parts. What if you allowed yourself a glass of wine with dinner or curled up on the sofa and read or watched a stupid movie as a reward? What if you instructed your wife or your husband to say, good job, after you fixed whatever you fixed? Would that motivate you? The people from whom thanks you want might not be very proficient in offering it to begin with, but that shouldn't stop you. People can learn, even if they are very unskilled at the beginning. Ask yourself, what would you require to be motivated to undertake the job, honestly, and listen to the answer? Don't tell yourself, I shouldn't need to do that to motivate myself. What do you know about yourself? You are, on the one hand, the most complex thing in the entire universe, and on the other, someone who can't even set the clock on your microwave. Don't overestimate your self-knowledge. Let the tasks for the day announce themselves for your contemplation. Maybe you can do this in the morning as you sit on the edge of your bed. Maybe you can try the night before when you're preparing to sleep. Ask yourself for a voluntary contribution. If you ask nicely and listen carefully and don't try any treachery, you might be offered one. Do this every day for a while. Then do it for the rest of your life. Soon you'll find yourself in a different situation. Now you'll be able to ask yourself habitually, what could I do that I would do to make life a little better? You're not dictating to yourself what better must be. You're not being a totalitarian or a utopian even to yourself because you have learned from the Nazis and the Soviets and the Maoists and from your own experience that being a totalitarian is a bad thing. Aim high. Set your sights on the betterment of being. Align yourself in your soul with truth and the highest good. There is habitable order to establish and beauty to bring into existence. There is evil to overcome, suffering to ameliorate, and yourself to better. It is this, in my reading, that is the culminating ethic of the canon of the West. It is this, furthermore, that is communicated by those eternally confusing, glowing stanzas from Christ's Sermon on the Mount, the essence, in some sense, of the wisdom of the New Testament. This is the attempt of the spirit of mankind to transform the understanding of ethics from the initial, necessary, thou shalt not, of the child, and the Ten Commandments into the fully articulated positive vision of the true individual. This is the expression not merely of admirable self-control and self-mastery, but of the fundamental desire to set the world right. This is not the cessation of sin, but sin's opposite, good itself. The Sermon on the Mount outlines the true nature of man and the proper aim of mankind. Concentrate on the day so that you can live in the present and attend completely and properly to what is right in front of you. But do that only after you have decided to let what is within shine forth, so that it can justify being and illuminate the world. Do that only after you have determined to sacrifice whatever it is that must be sacrificed so that you can pursue the highest good. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil therefore. Luke chapter 12, verse 22 through 34. Realization is dawning. Instead of playing the tyrant, therefore, you are paying attention. You are telling the truth instead of manipulating the world. You are negotiating instead of playing the martyr or the tyrant. You no longer have to be envious because you no longer know that someone else truly has it better. 
you no longer have to be frustrated because you have learned how to aim low and to be patient. You're discovering who you are and what you want and what you are willing to do. You are finding that the solutions to your particular problems have to be tailored to you personally and precisely. You are less concerned with the actions of other people because you have plenty to do yourself. Attend to the day, but aim at the highest good. Now, your trajectory is heavenward. That makes you hopeful. Even a man on a sinking ship can be happy when he clambers aboard a lifeboat. And who knows where he might go in the future? To journey happily may well be better than to arrive successfully. Ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and the door will open. If you ask, as if you want, and knock, as if you want to enter, you may be offered the chance to improve your life, a little, a lot, completely. And with that improvement, some progress will be made in being itself. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Rule number 5. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Actually, it's not okay. Recently, I watched a three-year-old boy trail his mother and father slowly through a crowded airport. He was screaming violently at five-second intervals, and, more important, he was doing it voluntarily. He wasn't at the end of his tether. As a parent, I could tell from the tone, he was irritating his parents and hundreds of other people to gain attention. Maybe he needed something. But that was no way to get it, and his parents should have let him know. You might object that perhaps they were worn out and jet-lagged after a long trip, but 30 seconds of carefully directed problem-solving would have brought this shameful episode to a halt. More thoughtful parents would not have let someone they truly cared for become the object of a crowd's contempt. I have also watched a couple, unable or unwilling to say no to their two-year-old, obliged to follow closely behind him everywhere he went, every moment of what was supposed to be an enjoyable social visit, because he misbehaved so badly, when not micromanaged, that he could not be given a second of genuine freedom without risk. The desire of his parents to let their child act without correction on every impulse perversely produced the precisely opposite effect. They deprived him instead of every opportunity to engage in independent action. Because they did not dare to teach him what no means, he had no conception of the reasonable limits enabling maximal toddler autonomy. It was a classic example of too much chaos breeding too much order, and the inevitable reversal. I have, similarly, seen parents rendered unable to engage in adult conversation at a dinner party because their children, four and five, dominated the social scene, eating the centers out of all the sliced bread, subjecting everyone to their juvenile tyranny, while mom and dad watched, embarrassed, and bereft of the ability to intervene. When my now adult daughter was a child, Another child once hit her in the head with a metal toy truck. I watched that same child one year later viciously push his younger sister backwards over a fragile glass-surfaced coffee table. His mother picked him up immediately afterward, but not her frightened daughter, and told him in hushed tones not to do such things while she patted him comfortingly in a manner clearly indicative of approval. She was out to produce a little god-emperor of the universe. That's the unstated goal of many a mother, including many who consider themselves advocates for full gender equality. Such women will object vociferously to any command uttered by an adult male, but will trot off in seconds to make their progeny a peanut butter sandwich if he demands it, while immersed self-importantly in a video game. The future mates of such boys have every reason to hate their mother-in-law. Respect for women? That's for other boys, other men, not their dear sons. Something of the same sort may underlie in part the preference for male children seen most particularly in places such as India, Pakistan, and China, where sex-selective abortion is widely practiced. The Wikipedia entry for that practice attributes its existence to cultural norms, favoring male over female children. I cite Wikipedia because it's collectively written and edited, and therefore the perfect place to find accepted wisdom. But there's no evidence that such ideas are strictly cultural. There are plausible psychobiological reasons for the evolution of such an attitude, and they're not pretty from a modern egalitarian perspective. If circumstances force you to put all your eggs into one basket, so to speak, a son is a better bet by the strict standards of evolutionary logic where the proliferation of your genes is all that matters. Why? Well, a reproductively successful daughter might gain you eight or nine children. The Holocaust survivor Yudha Schwartz, a star in his regard, had three generations of direct descendants who matched such performance. She was the ancestor of almost 2,000 people by the time of her death in 2010. But the sky is truly the limit with a reproductively successful son. Sex with multiple female partners is his ticket to exponential reproduction, given our species' practical limitation to single births. Rumor has it that the actor Warren Beatty and the athlete Wilt Chamberlain each bedded multiple thousands of women, something not unknown as well among rock stars. They didn't produce children in those numbers. Modern birth control limits that. But similar celebrity types in the past have done so. The forefather of the Qing dynasty, Chiu Kang, uh, uh, <laughs> how do you say that? Chiu Kang, uh, 
circa 1550, for example, is the male line ancestor of a million and a half people in northeastern China. Jeez, I got to read that again. The male line ancestor of a million and a half people in northeastern China. The medieval Yunnail, <laughs> what's up with these names right now? Dynasty, Yunnail dynasty, produced up to three million male descendants, localized mainly in northwestern Ireland and the U.S. through Irish immigration. And the king of them all, Genghis Khan, conqueror of much of Asia, is a forefather of 8% of the men in Central Asia. 16 million male descendants, 34 generations later. So, from a deep biological perspective, there are reasons why parents might favor sons sufficiently to eliminate female fetuses. Although, I am not claiming direct causality, nor suggesting a lack of other, more culturally dependent reasons. Preferential treatment awarded a son during development might even help produce an attractive, well-rounded, confident man. This happened in the case of the father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, by his own account. A man who has been the indisputable favorite of his mother keeps for life the feeling of a conqueror, the confidence of success that often introduces real success. Fair enough, but feeling of a conqueror can all too easily become actual conqueror. Genghis Khan's outstanding reproductive success certainly came at the cost of any success whatsoever for others, including the dead millions of Chinese, Persians, Russians, and Hungarians. Spoiling a son might therefore work well from the standpoint of the selfish gene, allowing the favored child's genes to replicate themselves in innumerable offspring, to use the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins' famous expression. But it can make for a dark, painful spectacle in the here and now, and mutate into something indescribably dangerous. None of this means that all mothers favor all sons over their daughters, or that daughters are not sometimes favored over sons, or that fathers don't sometimes favor their sons. Other factors can clearly dominate. Sometimes, for example, unconscious hatred, sometimes not so unconscious either, overrides any concern a parent might have for any child, regardless of gender or personality or situation. I saw a four-year-old boy allowed to go hungry on a regular basis. His nanny had been injured, and he was being cycled through the neighbors for temporary care. When his mother dropped him off at our house, she indicated that he wouldn't eat at all, all day. That's okay, she said. It wasn't okay, in case that's not obvious. This was the same four-year-old boy who clung to my wife for hours in absolute desperation and total commitment when she tenaciously, persistently, and mercifully managed to feed him an entire lunchtime meal, rewarding him throughout for his cooperation and refusing to let him fail. He started out with a closed mouth, sitting with all of us at the dining room table, my wife and I, our two kids, and two neighborhood kids we looked after during the day. She put the spoon in front of him, waiting patiently, persistently, while he moved his head back and forth, refusing at entry, using defensive methods typical of a recalcitrant and none too well attended two-year-old. She didn't let him fail. She patted him on the head every time he managed a mouthful, telling him sincerely that he was a good boy when he did so. She did think he was a good boy. He was a cute, damaged kid. Ten, not too painful minutes later, he finished his meal. We were all watching intently. It was a drama of life and death. Look, she said, holding up his bowl. You finished all of it. This boy who was standing in the corner voluntarily and unhappily when I first saw him, who wouldn't interact with the other kids, who frowned chronically, who wouldn't respond to me when I tickled and prodded him, trying to get him to play, this boy broke immediately into a wide, radiant smile. It brought joy to everyone at the table. Twenty years later, writing it down today, it still brings me to tears. Afterward, he followed my wife around like a puppy for the rest of the day, refusing to let her out of his sight. When she sat down, he jumped in her lap, cuddling in, opening himself back up to the world, searching desperately for the love he had been continually denied. Later in the day, but far too soon, his mother reappeared. She came down from the stairs into the room we all occupied. Oh, super mom, she uttered, resentfully, seeing her son curled up in my wife's lap. Then she departed. Black, murderous, heart unchanged, doomed child in hand. She was a psychologist. The things you can see with even a single open eye. It's no wonder that people want to stay blind. Everybody hates arithmetic. My clinical clients frequently come to me to discuss their day-to-day -day familial problems. Such quotidian concerns are insidious. Their habitual and predictable occurrence makes them appear trivial. But that appearance of triviality is deceptive. It is the things that occur every single day that truly make up our lives, and time spent the same way over and over again adds up at an alarming rate. One father recently spoke with me about the trouble he was having putting his son to sleep at night, a ritual that typically involved about three quarters of an hour of fighting. We did the arithmetic. 45 minutes a day, 7 days a week? That's 300 minutes, or 5 hours a week. 5 hours for each of the 4 weeks of a month? That's 20 hours per month. 
20 hours a month for 12 months is 240 hours a year. That's a month and a half of standard 40-hour work weeks. Uh, asterisk at putting his son to sleep at night. I draw here and will many times again in the course of this book on my clinical experience, as I have already, on my personal history. I have tried to keep the moral of the stories intact while disguising the details for the sake of the privacy of those involved. I hope I got the balance right. Resuming. My client was spending a month and a half of work weeks per year fighting ineffectually and miserably with his son. Needless to say, both were suffering for it. No matter how good your intentions or how sweet and tolerant your temperament, you will not maintain good relations with someone you fight with for a month and a half of work weeks per year. Resentment will inevitably build. Even if it doesn't, all that wasted, unpleasant time could clearly be spent in more productive and useful and less stressful and more enjoyable activity. How are such situations to be understood? Where does the fault lie, in child or in parent, in nature or society, and what, if anything, is to be done? Some localize all such problems in the adult, whether in the parent or broader society. There are no bad children, quote-unquote, such people think, only bad parents. When the idealized image of an unsullied child is brought to mind, this notion appears fully justified. The beauty, openness, joy, trust, and capacity for love characterizing children makes it easy to attribute full culpability to the adults on the scene. But such an attitude is dangerously and naively romantic. It's too one-sided. In the case of the parents granted a particularly difficult son or daughter, it's also not for the best that all human corruption is uncritically laid at society's feet. That conclusion merely displaces the problem back in time. It explains nothing and solves no problems. If society is corrupt but not the individuals within it, then where did the corruption originate? How is it propagated? It's a one-sided, deeply ideological theory. Even more problematic is the insistence logically stemming from this presumption of social corruption that all individual problems, no matter how rare, must be solved by cultural restructuring, no matter how radical. Our society faces the increasing call to deconstruct its stabilizing traditions to include smaller and smaller numbers of people who do not or will not fit into the categories upon which even our perceptions are based. This is not a good thing. Each person's private trouble cannot be solved by a social revolution because revolutions are destabilizing and dangerous. We have learned to live together and organize our complex societies slowly and incrementally over vast stretches of time, and we do not understand with sufficient exactitude why what we are doing works. Thus, altering our ways of social being carelessly in the name of such ideological shibboleth, diversity springs to mind, is likely to produce far more trouble than good given the suffering that even small revolutions generally produce. Was it really a good thing, for example, to so dramatically liberalize the divorce laws in the 1960s? It's not clear to me that the children whose lives were destabilized by the hypothetical freedom this attempt at liberation introduced would say so. Horror and terror lurk behind the walls provided so wisely by our ancestors. We tear them down at our peril. We skate unconsciously on thin ice, with deep, cold waters below, where unimaginable monsters lurk. I see today's parents as terrified by their children, not least because they have been deemed the proximal agents of this hypothetical social tyranny, and simultaneously denied credit for their role as benevolent and necessary agents of discipline, order, and conventionality. They dwell uncomfortably and self-consciously in the all-too-powerful shadow of the adolescent ethos of the 1960s, a decade whose excesses led to a general denigration of adulthood, an unthinking belief in the existence of competent power, and the inability to distinguish between the chaos of immaturity and responsible freedom. This has increased parental sensitivity to the short-term emotional suffering of their children while heightening their fear of damaging the children to a painful and counterproductive degree. Better this than the reverse, you might argue, but there are catastrophes lurking at the extremes of every moral continuum. The Ignoble Savage it has been said that every individual is the conscious or unconscious follower of some influential philosopher. The belief that children have an intrinsically unsullied spirit, damaged only by culture and society, is derived in no small part from the 18th century Genevan French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was a fervent believer in the corrupting influence of human society and private ownership alike. He claimed that nothing was so gentle and wonderful as man in his pre-civilized state. At precisely the same time, noting his inability as a father, he abandoned five of his children to the tender and fatal mercies of the orphanages of the time. The noble savage Rousseau described, however, was an ideal, an abstraction, archetypal and religious, and not the flesh and blood reality he supposed. The mythologically perfect divine child permanently inhabits our imagination. He is the potential of youth, newborn hero, the wronged innocent, and the long lost son of the rightful king. He is the intimations of immortality that accompany our earliest experiences. He is Adam, the perfect man 
walking without sin with God in the garden before the fall. But human beings are evil as well as good, and the darkness that dwells forever in our souls is also there in no small part in our younger selves. In general, people improve with age rather than worsening, becoming kinder, more conscientious, and more emotionally stable as they mature. Bullying at the sheer and often terrible intensity of the schoolyard rarely manifests itself in grown-up society. William Golding's dark and anarchistic Lord of the Flies is a classic for a reason. Furthermore, there is plenty of direct evidence that the horrors of human behavior cannot be so easily attributed to history and society. This was discovered most painfully, perhaps, by the primatologist Jane Goodall, beginning in 1974 when she learned that her beloved chimpanzees were capable of and willing to murder each other, to use the terminology appropriate to humans. Because of its shocking nature and great anthropological significance, she kept her observations secret for years, fearing that her contact with the animals had led them to manifest unnatural behavior. Even after she published her account, many refused to believe it. It soon became obvious, however, that what she observed was by no means rare. Bluntly put, chimpanzees conduct inter-tribal warfare. Furthermore, they do it with almost unimaginable brutality. The typical full-grown chimp is more than twice as strong as a comparable human being, despite their smaller size. Goodall reported with some terror the proclivity of the chimps she studied to snap strong steel cables and levers. Chimps can literally tear each other to pieces, and they do. Human societies and their complex technologies cannot be blamed for that. Often when I woke in the night, she wrote, a horrific picture sprang unbidden to my mind. Satan, a long-observed chimp, cupping his hand below Sniff's chin to drink the blood that welled from a great wound in his face. Jomeo, tearing a strip of skin from Dee's thigh. Feigen, charging and hitting again and again the stricken, quivering body of Goliath, one of his childhood heroes. Small gangs of adolescent chimps, mostly male, roam the borders of their territory. If they encounter foreigners, even chimps they once knew who had broken away from the now-too-large group, and if they outnumber them, the gang will mob and destroy them without mercy. Chimps don't have much of a superego, and it is prudent to remember that the human capacity for self-control may also be overestimated. Careful perusal of a book as shocking and horrific as Iris Chang's The Rape of Nanking, which describes the brutal decimation of the Chinese city by the invading Japanese, will disenchant even a committed romantic. And the less said about Unit 731, a covert Japanese biological warfare research unit established at that time, the better. Read about it at your peril. You have been warned. Hunter-gatherers, too, are much more murderous than their urban industrialized counterparts, despite their communal lives and localized cultures. The yearly rate of homicide in the modern UK is about 1 per 100,000. It's 4 to 5 times higher in the US, and about 90 times higher in Honduras, which has the highest rate recorded of any modern nation. But the evidence strongly suggests that human beings have become more peaceful rather than less so, as time has progressed and societies became larger and more organized. The Kung Bushmen of Africa, romanticized in the 1950s by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas as the harmless people, had a yearly murder rate of 40 per 100,000, which declined by more than 30% once they became subject to state authority. This is a very instructive example of complex social structures serving to reduce, not exacerbate, the violent tendencies of human beings. Yearly rates of 300 per 100,000 have been reported for the Yao Mami of Brazil, famed for their aggression. But the stats don't max out there. The denizens of Papua New Guinea kill each other at yearly rates ranging from 140 to 1,000 per 100,000. However, the record appears to be held by the Cato, an indigenous people of California, 1,450 of whom per 100,000 met a violent death circa 1840. Because children, like other human beings, are not only good, they cannot simply be left to their own devices, untouched by society, and bloom into perfection. Even dogs must be socialized if they are to become acceptable members of the pack. And children are much, much more complex than dogs. This means that they are much more likely to go complexly astray if they are not trained, disciplined, and properly encouraged. This means that it is not just wrong to attribute all the violent tendencies of human beings to the pathologies of social structure. It's wrong enough to be virtually backward. The vital process of socialization prevents much harm and fosters good. Children must be shaped and informed or they cannot thrive. This fact is reflected starkly in their behavior. Kids are utterly desperate for attention from both peers and adults because such attention, which renders them effective and sophisticated communal players, is vitally necessary. Children can be damaged as much or more by a lack of incisive attention as they are by abuse, mental or physical. This is damaged by omission rather than commission, but it is no less severe and long-lasting. Children are damaged when their quote-unquote mercifully inattentive parents fail to make them sharp and observant and awake and leave them instead in an unconscious and undifferentiated state. Children are damaged when those charged with their care, afraid of any conflict or upset, no longer dare to correct them and leave them without guidance. 
I can recognize such children on the street. They are doughy and unfocused and vague. They are leaden and dull instead of golden and bright. They are uncarved blocks trapped in a perpetual state of waiting to be. Such children are chronically ignored by their peers. This is because they're not fun to play with. Adults tend to manifest the same attitude, although they will deny it desperately when pressed. When I worked in daycare centers early in my career, the comparatively neglected children would come to me desperately in their fumbling, half-formed manner with no sense of proper distance and no attentive playfulness. They would flop nearby or directly on my, my lap, no matter what I was doing, driven inexorably by the powerful desire for adult attention, the necessary catalyst for further development. It was very difficult not to react with annoyance, even disgust, to such children and their too prolonged infantilism. Difficult not to literally push them aside, even though I felt very badly for them and understood their predicament well. I believe that response, harsh and terrible though it may be, was an almost universally experienced internal warning signal indicating the comparative danger of establishing a relationship with a poorly socialized child, the likelihood of immediate and inappropriate dependence, which should have been the responsibility of the parent, and the tremendous demand of time and resources that accepting such dependence would necessitate. Confronted with such a situation, potentially friendly peers and interested adults are much more likely to turn their attention to interacting with other children whose cost-to-benefit ratio, to speak bluntly, would be much lower. Parent or friend The neglect and mistreatment that is part and parcel of poorly structured or even entirely absent disciplinary approaches can be deliberate, motivated by explicit, conscious, if misguided, parental motives. But more often than not, Modern parents are simply paralyzed by the fear that they will no longer be liked or even loved by their children if they chastise them for any reason. They want their children's friendship above all and are willing to sacrifice respect to get it. This is not good. A child will have many friends but only two parents, if that. And parents are more, not less than friends. Friends have very limited authority to correct. Every parent therefore needs to learn to tolerate the momentary anger or even hatred directed towards them by their children after necessary corrective action has been taken as the capacity of children to perceive or care about long-term consequences is very limited. Parents are the arbiters of society. They teach children how to behave so that other people will be able to interact meaningfully and productively with them. It is an act of responsibility to discipline a child. It is not anger at misbehavior. It is not revenge for a misdeed. It is instead a careful combination of mercy and long-term judgment. Proper discipline requires effort. Indeed, it is virtually synonymous with effort. It is difficult to pay careful attention to children. It is difficult to figure out what is wrong and what is right and why. It is difficult to formulate just and compassionate strategies of discipline and to negotiate their application with others deeply involved in the child's care. Because of this combination of responsibility and difficulty, any suggestion that all constraints placed on children are damaging can be perversely welcome. Such a notion, once accepted, allows adults who should know better to abandon their duty to serve as agents of enculturation and pretend that doing so is good for children. It's a deep, it's a deep and pernicious act of self-deception. It's lazy, cruel, and inexcusable. And our proclivity to rationalize does not end there. We assume that rules would irremediably inhibit what would otherwise be boundless and intrinsic creativity of our children, even though the scientific literature clearly indicates, first, that creativity beyond the trivial is shockingly rare, and second, that strict limitations facilitate rather than inhibit creative achievement. Belief in the purely destructive element of rules and structure is frequently conjoined with the idea that children will make good choices about when to sleep and what to eat if their perfect natures are merely allowed to manifest themselves. These are equally ungrounded assumptions. Children are perfectly capable of attempting to subsist on hot dogs, chicken fingers, and fruit loops if doing so will attract attention, provide power, or shield them from trying anything new. Instead of going to bed wisely and peacefully, children will fight nighttime unconsciousness until they are staggered by fatigue. They are also perfectly willing to provoke adults while exploring the complex contours of the social environment, just like juvenile chimps harassing the adults in their troops. Observing the consequences of teasing and taunting enables chimp and child alike to discover the limits of what might otherwise be a too unstructured and terrifying freedom. Such limits, when discovered, provide security, even if their detection causes momentary disappointment or frustration. I remember taking my daughter to the playground once when she was about two. She was playing on the monkey bars, hanging in midair. A particularly provocative little monster of about the same age was standing above her on the same bar she was gripping. I watched him move towards her. Our eyes locked. He slowly and deliberately stepped on her hands with increasing force over and over as he stared me down. He knew exactly what he was doing. Up yours, daddy-o. That was his philosophy. He had already concluded that adults were contemptible and that he could safely defy them. Too bad then that he was destined to become one. That was the hopeless future his parents had saddled him with. 
To his great and salutary shock, I picked him bodily off the playground structure and threw him 30 feet down the field. No, I didn't. I just took my daughter somewhere else. But it would have been better for him if I had. Imagine a toddler repeatedly striking his mother in the face. Why would he do such a thing? It's a stupid question. It's unacceptably naive. The answer is obvious. To dominate his mother. To see if he can get away with it. Violence, after all, is no mystery. It's peace that's the mystery. Violence is the default. It's easy. It's peace that is difficult, learned, inculcated, earned. People often get basic psychological questions backwards. Why do people take drugs? Not a mystery. It's why they don't take them all the time that's the mystery. Why do people suffer from anxiety? That's not a mystery. How is it that people can ever be calm? There's the mystery. We're breakable and mortal. A million things can go wrong in a million ways. We should be terrified out of our skulls at every second. But we're not. The same can be said for depression, laziness, and criminality. If I can hurt and overpower you, then I can do exactly what I want, when I want, even when you're around. I can torment you to appease my curiosity. I can take the attention away from you and dominate you. I can steal your toy. Children hit first because aggression is innate, although more dominant in some individuals and less in others, and second because aggression facilitates desire. It's foolish to assume that such behavior must be learned. A snake does not have to be taught to strike. It's in the nature of the beast. Two-year-olds, statistically speaking, are the most violent of people. They kick, hit, and bite, and they steal the property of others. They do so to explore, to express outrage and frustration, and to gratify their impulsive desires. More importantly, for our purposes, they do so to discover the true limits of permissible behavior. How else are they ever going to puzzle out what is acceptable? Infants are like blind people, searching for a wall. They have to push forward and test to see where the actual boundaries lie. And those are too seldom where they are said to be. Consistent correction of such action indicates the limits of acceptable aggression to the child. Its absence merely heightens curiosity. So the child will hit and bite and kick if he is aggressive and dominant until something indicates a limit. How hard can I hit mommy? Until she objects. Given that, correction is better sooner than later if the desired end result of the parent is not to be hit. Correction also helps the child to learn that hitting others is a suboptimal social strategy. Without that correction, no child is going to undergo the effortful process of organizing and regulating their impulses so that those impulses can coexist without conflict within the psyche of the child and in the broader social world. It is no simple matter to organize a mind. My son was particularly ornery when he was a toddler. When my daughter was little, I could paralyze her into immobility with an evil glance. Such an intervention had no effect at all on my son. He had my wife, who is no pushover, stimmied at the dinner table by the time he was nine months of age. He fought her for control over the spoon. Good, we thought. We didn't want to feed him one more minute than necessary anyway. But the little blighter would only eat three or four mouthfuls. Then he would play. He would stir his food around in his bowl. He would drop bits of it over the high chair tabletop and watch as it fell on the floor below. No problem. He was exploring. But then he wasn't eating enough. Then, because he wasn't eating enough, he wasn't sleeping enough. Then his midnight crying was waking his parents. Then they were getting grumpy and out of sorts. He was frustrating his mother, and she was taking it out on me. The trajectory wasn't good. After a few days of this degeneration, I decided to take the spoon back. I prepared for war. I set aside sufficient time. A patient adult can defeat a two-year-old, hard as that is to believe. And the saying goes, old age and treachery can always overcome youth and skill. This is partly because time lasts forever when you're two. Half an hour for me was a week for my son. I assured myself of victory. He was stubborn and horrible, but I could be worse. We sat down face to face, bowl in front of him. It was high noon. He knew it and I knew it. He picked up the spoon. I took it from him and spooned up a delicious mouthful of mush. I moved it deliberately toward his mouth. He eyed me in precisely the same manner as the playground foot monster. He curled his lips downward in a tight frown, rejecting all entry. I chased his mouth around with the spoon as he twisted his head around in tight circles. But I had more tricks up my sleeve. I poked him in the chest with my free hand in a manner calculated to annoy. He didn't budge. I did it again and again and again. Not hard, but not in a manner to be ignored either. Ten or so pokes later, he opened his mouth, planning to emit a sound of outrage. Ha! His mistake. I deftly inserted the spoon. He tried gamely to force out the offending food with his tongue, but I know how to deal with that too. I just placed my forefinger horizontally across his lips. Some came out, but some was swallowed too. Score one for dad. I gave him a pat on the head and told him that he was a good boy. And I meant it. When someone does something you are trying to get them to do, reward them. No grudge after victory. An hour later, it was all over. There was outrage. There was some wailing. My wife had to leave the room. 
The stress was too much, but food was eaten by child. My son collapsed, exhausted on my chest. We had a nap together, and he liked me a lot better when he woke up than he had before he was disciplined. This was something I commonly observed when we went head to head, and not only with him. A little later, we entered into a babysitting swap with another couple. All the kids would get together at one house, then one pair of parents would go out to dinner or a movie and leave the other pair to watch the children, who were all under three. One evening, another set of parents joined us. I was unfamiliar with their son, a large, strong boy of two. He won't sleep, said his father. After you put him to bed, he will crawl out of his bed and come downstairs. We usually put on an Elmo video and let him watch it. There's no damn way I'm rewarding a recalcitrant child for unacceptable behavior, I thought. And I'm certainly not showing anyone any Elmo video. I always hated that creepy whiny puppet. He was a disgrace to Jim Henson's legacy. So reward by Elmo was not on the table. I didn't say anything, of course. There's just no talking to parents about their children until they're ready to listen. Two hours later, we put the kids to bed. Four of the five went promptly to sleep, but not the Muppet aficionado. I had placed him in a crib, however, so he couldn't escape. But he could still howl, and that's exactly what he did. That was tricky. It was a good strategy on his part. It was annoying, and it threatened to wake up all the other kids, who would then also start to howl. Score one for the kid. So I journeyed into the bedroom. Lie down, I said. That produced no effect. Lie down, I said. Or I will lay you down. <laughs> Reasoning with kids isn't often of too much use, particularly under such circumstances, but I believe in fair warning. Of course, he didn't lie down. He howled again for effect. Kids do this frequently. Scared parents think that a crying child is always sad or hurt. This is simply not true. Anger is one of the most common reasons for crying. Careful analysis of the musculature patterns of crying children has confirmed this. Anger crying and fear or sadness crying do not look the same. They also don't sound the same and can be distinguished with careful attention. Anger crying is often an act of dominance and should be dealt with as such. I lifted him up and laid him down. Gently, patiently, but firmly. He got up. I laid him down. He got up. I laid him down. He got up. This time, I laid him down and kept my hand on his back. He struggled mightily, but ineffectually. He was, after all, only one-tenth of my size. I could take him with one hand. So I kept him down and spoke calmly to him and told him he was a good boy and that he should relax. I gave him a soother and pounded gently on his back. He started to relax. His eyes began to close. I removed my hand. He promptly got to his feet. I was impressed. The kid had spirit. I lifted him up and laid him down again. Lie down, monster, I said. I pounded his back gently some more. Some kids find that soothing. He was getting tired. He was ready to capitulate. He closed his eyes. I got to my feet and headed quietly and quickly to the door. I glanced back to check his position one last time. He was back on his feet. I pointed my finger at him. Down, monster, I said, and I meant it. He went down like a shot. I closed the door. We liked each other. Neither my wife nor I heard a peep out of him for the rest of the night. How was the kid? His father asked me when he got home much later that night. Good, I said. No problem at all. He's asleep right now. Did he get up? said his father. No, I said. He slept the whole time. Dad looked at me. He wanted to know, but he didn't ask, and I didn't tell. Don't cast pearls before swine, as the old saying goes. And you might think that's harsh, but training your child not to sleep and rewarding him with the antics of a creepy puppet? That's harsh, too. You pick your poison, and I'll pick mine. <clears throat> Discipline and punish. Modern parents are terrified of two frequently juxtaposed words, discipline and punish. They evoke images of prisons, soldiers, and jackboots. The distance between disciplinarian and tyrant, or punishment and torture, is indeed easily traversed. Discipline and punish must be handled with care. The fear is unsurprising, but both are necessary. They can be applied unconsciously or unconsciously, badly or well, but there's no escaping their use. It's not that it's impossible to discipline with a reward. In fact, rewarding good behavior can be very effective. The most famous of all behavioral psychologists, B. F. Skinner, was a great advocate of this approach. He was expert at it. He taught pigeons to play ping pong, although they only rolled the ball back and forth by pecking it with their beaks. But they were pigeons. So even though they played badly, it was still pretty good. Skinner even taught his birds to pilot missiles during the Second World War in Project Pigeon, later Orcon. He got a long way before the invention of electronic guidance systems rendered his efforts obsolete. Skinner observed the animals he was training to perform such acts with exceptional care. Any actions that approximated what he was aiming at were immediately followed by reward of just the right size, not small enough to be inconsequential and not so large that it devalued future rewards. Such an approach can be used with children, and works very well. 
Imagine that you would like your toddler to help set the table. It's a useful skill. You'd like him better if you could do it. It would be good for his <laughs> shudder, <laughs> self-esteem. So you break the target behavior down into its component parts. One element of setting the table is carrying a plate from the cupboard to the table. Even that might be too complex. Perhaps your child has only been walking a few months. He's still wobbly and unreliable. So you start his training by handing him a plate and having hand it back. A pat on the head could follow. You might turn it into a game. Pass with your left. Switch to your right. Circle around your back. Then you might give him a plate and take a few steps backward so that he has to traverse a few steps before giving it back. Train him to become a plate-handling virtuoso. Don't leave him trapped in his klutz dom. You can teach virtually anyone anything with such an approach. First, figure out what you want. Then, watch the people around you like a hawk. Finally, whenever you see anything a bit more like what you want, swoop in, hawk, remember, and deliver a reward. Your daughter has been very reserved since she was a teenager. You wish she could talk more. That's the target. More communicative daughter. One morning over breakfast, she shares an anecdote about school. That's an excellent time to pay attention. That's the reward. Stop texting and listen. Unless you don't want her to tell you anything ever again. Parental interventions that make children happy clearly can and should be used to shape behavior. The same goes for husbands, wives, co-workers, and parents. Skinner, however, was a realist. He noted that use of reward was very difficult. The observer had to attend patiently until the target spontaneously manifested the desired behavior and then reinforce. This required a lot of time and a lot of waiting, and that's a problem. He also had to starve his animals down to three quarters of their normal body weight before they would become interested enough in food reward to truly pay attention. But these are not the only shortcomings of the purely positive approach. Negative emotions, like their positive counterparts, help us learn. We need to learn because we're stupid and easily damaged. We can die. That's not good, and we don't feel good about it. If we did, we would seek death, and then we would die. We don't even feel good about dying if it only might happen, and that's all the time. In that manner, negative emotions, for all their unpleasantness, protect us. We feel hurt and scared and ashamed and disgusted so we can avoid damage. And we're susceptible to feeling such things a lot. In fact, we feel more negative about a loss of a given size than we feel good about the same sized gain. Pain is more potent than pleasure and anxiety more than hope. Emotions, positive and negative, come in two usually differentiated variants. Satisfaction, technically satiation, tells us that what we did was good, while hope, technically incentive reward, indicates that something pleasurable is on the way. Pain hurts us, so we won't repeat actions that produced personal damage or social isolation, as loneliness is also technically a form of pain. Anxiety makes us stay away from hurtful people and bad places, so we don't have to feel pain. All these emotions must be balanced against each other and carefully judged in context, but they're all required to keep us alive and thriving. We therefore do our children a disservice by failing to use whatever is available to help them learn, including negative emotions, even though such use should occur in the most merciful possible manner. Skinner knew that threats and punishments could stop unwanted behaviors, just as reward reinforces what is desirable. In a world paralyzed at the thought of interfering with the hypothetically pristine path of natural child development, it can be difficult even to discuss the former techniques. However, children would not have such a lengthy period of natural development prior to maturity if their behavior did not have to be shaped. They would just leap out of the womb, ready to trade stocks. Children also cannot be fully sheltered from fear and pain. They're small and vulnerable. They don't know much about the world. Even when they are doing something as natural as learning to walk, they're constantly being walloped by the world. And this is to say nothing of the frustration and rejection they inevitably experience when dealing with siblings and peers and uncooperative, stubborn adults. Given this, the fundamental moral question is not how to shelter children completely from misadventure and failure so they never experience any fear or pain, but how to maximize their learning so that useful knowledge may be gained with minimal cost. In the Disney movie Sleeping Beauty, the king and queen have a daughter, the princess Aurora, after a long wait. They plan a great christening to introduce her to the world. They welcome everyone who loves and honors their new daughter, but they fail to invite Maleficent, malicious, malevolent, who is essentially queen of the underworld, or nature in her negative guise. This means, symbolically, that the two monarchs are overprotecting their beloved daughter by setting up a world around her that has nothing negative in it. But this does not protect her. It makes her weak. Maleficent curses the princess, sentencing her to death at the age of 16, caused by the prick of a spinning wheel's needle. The spinning wheel is the wheel of fate. The prick which produces blood, symbolizes the loss of virginity, a sign of the emergence of the woman from the child. Fortunately, a good fairy, the positive element of nature, reduces the punishment to unconsciousness, redeemable with love's first kiss. The panicked king and queen get rid of all the spinning wheels in the land and turn their daughter over to the much too nice good fairies of whom there are three. 
They continue with their strategy of removing all dangerous things, but in doing so, they leave their daughter naive, immature, and weak. One day, just before Aurora's 16th birthday, she meets a prince in the forest and falls in love the same day. By any reasonable standard, that's a bit much. Then she loudly bemoans the fact that she is to be wed to Prince Philip, to whom she was betrothed as a child, and collapses emotionally when she is brought back to her parents' castle for her birthday. It is at that moment that Maleficent's curse manifests itself. A portal opens up in the castle, a spinning wheel appears, and Aurora pricks her finger and falls unconscious. She becomes Sleeping Beauty. In doing so, again symbolically speaking, she chooses unconsciousness over the terror of adult life. Something existentially similar to this occurs very frequently with overprotected children who can be brought low and then desire the bliss of unconsciousness. By their first real contact with failure, or worse, genuine malevolence, which they do not or will not understand, and against which they have no defense. Take the case of the three-year-old who has not learned to share. She displays her selfish behavior in the presence of her parents, but they're too nice to intervene. More truthfully, they refuse to pay attention, admit to what is happening, and teach her how to act properly. They're annoyed, of course, when she won't share with her sister, but they pretend everything is okay. It's not okay. They'll snap at her later for something totally unrelated. She will be hurt by that, and confused, but learn nothing. Worse, when she tries to make friends, it won't go well because of her lack of social sophistication. Children her own age will be put off by her inability to cooperate. They'll fight with her, or wander off and find someone else to play with. The parent of those children will observe her awkwardness and misbehavior, and won't invite her back to play with their kids. She will be lonely and rejected. That will produce anxiety, depression, resentment. That will produce the turning from life that is equivalent to the wish for unconsciousness. Parents who refuse to adopt the responsibility for disciplining their children think they can just opt out of the conflict necessary for proper child rearing. They avoid being the bad guy in the short term, but they do not at all rescue or protect their children from fear and pain. Quite the contrary, the judgmental and uncaring broader social world will met out of conflict and punishment far greater than that which would have been delivered by an awake parent. You can discipline your children, or you can turn that responsibility over to the harsh, uncaring, judgmental world, and the motivation for the latter decision should never be confused with love. You might object, as modern parents sometimes do. Why should a child even be subject to the arbitrary dictates of a parent? In fact, there's a new variant of politically correct thinking that presumes that such an idea is adultism, a form of prejudice and oppression analogous to, say, sexism or racism. The question of adult authority must be answered with care. That requires a thorough examination of the question itself. Accepting an objection as formulated is halfway to accepting its validity, and that can be dangerous if the question is ill-posed. Let's break it down. First, why should a child be subject? Well, that's easy. Every child must listen to and obey adults because he or she is dependent on the care that one or more imperfect grown-ups is willing to bestow. Given this, it's better for the child to act in a manner that invites genuine affection and goodwill. Something even better might be imagined. The child could act in a manner that simultaneously ensures optimal adult attention in a manner that benefits his or her present state of being and future development. That's a very high standard, but it's in the best interest of the child, so there is every reason to aspire to it. Every child should also be taught to comply gracefully with the expectations of civil society. This does not mean crushed into mindless ideological conformity. It means instead that parents must reward those attitudes and actions which will bring their child's success in the world outside the family and use threat and punishment when necessary to eliminate behaviors that will lead to misery and failure. There's a tight window of opportunity for this as well, so getting it right quickly matters. If a child has not been taught to behave properly by the age of four, it will forever be difficult for him or her to make friends. The research literature is quite clear on this. This matters, because peers are the primary source of socialization after the age of four. Rejected children cease to develop because they are alienated from their peers. They fall further and further behind as other children continue to progress. Thus. The friendless child too often becomes the lonely, antisocial, or depressed teenager and adult. This is not good. Much more of our sanity than we commonly realize is a consequence of our fortunate immersion in a social community. We must be continually reminded to think and act properly. When we drift, people that care for us and love us nudge us in small ways and large back on track. So we better have some of those people around. It's also not the case, back to the question, that adult dictates are all arbitrary. That's only true in dysfunctional totalitarian state. But in civilized open societies, the majority abide by a functional social contract aimed at mutual betterment, or at least at existence in close proximity without too much violence. Even a system of rules that allows for only that minimum contract is by no means arbitrary, given the alternatives. If a society does not adequately reward productive pro-social behavior, 
insists upon distributing resources in a markedly arbitrary and unfair manner, and allows for theft and exploitation, it will not remain conflict-free for long. If its hierarchies are based only or even primarily on power, instead of the competence necessary to get important and difficult things done, it will be prone to collapse as well. This is even true in simpler form of the hierarchies of chimpanzees, which is an indication of its fundamental biological and non-arbitrary emergent truth. Poorly socialized children have terrible lives. Thus, it is better to socialize them optimally. Some of this can be done with reward, but not all of it. The issue is therefore not whether to use punishment and threat. The issue is whether to do it consciously and thoughtfully. How, then, should children be disciplined? This is a very difficult question because children and parents differ vastly in their temperaments. Some children are agreeable. They deeply want to please, but pay for that with a tendency to be conflict-averse and dependent. Others are tougher-minded and more independent. Those kids want to do what they want, when they want, all the time. They can be challenging, non-compliant, and stubborn. Some children are desperate for rules and structures and are content even in rigid environments. Others, with little regard for predictability and routine, are immune to demands for even minimal necessary order. Some are wildly imaginative and creative, and others more concrete and conservative. These are all deep, important differences, heavily influenced by biological factors and difficult to modify socially. It is fortunate indeed that in the face of such variability, we are the beneficiaries of much thoughtful meditation on the proper use of social control. Minimum Necessary Force Here's a straightforward initial idea. Rules should not be multiplied beyond necessity. Alternatively stated, bad laws drive out respect for good laws. This is the ethical, even legal equivalent of Occam's razor, the scientist's conceptual guillotine, which states that the simplest possible hypothesis is preferable. So, don't encumber children, or their disciplinarians, with too many rules. That path leads to frustration. Limit the rules. Then, figure out what to do when one of them gets broken. A general context-independent rule for punishment severity is hard to establish. However, a helpful norm has already been enshrined in English common law, one of the great products of Western civilization. Its analysis can help us establish a second useful principle. English common law allows you to defend your rights, but only in a reasonable manner. Someone breaks into your house. You have a loaded pistol. You have a right to defend yourself, but it's better to do it in stages. What if it's a drunk and confused neighbor? Shoot him, you think, but it's not that simple. So you say instead, stop, I have a gun. If that produces neither explanation nor retreat, you might consider a warning shot. Then, if the perpetrator still advances, you might take aim at his leg. Don't mistake any of this for legal advice. It's an example. A single brilliantly practical principle can be used to generate all these incrementally more severe reactions, that of minimum necessary force. So now we have two general principles of discipline. The first, limit the rules. The second, use the least force necessary to enforce those rules. About the first principle, you might ask, limit the rules to what exactly? Here are some suggestions. Do not bite, kick, or hit, except in self-defense. Do not torture and bully other children so you don't end up in jail. Eat in a civilized and thankful manner so that people are happy to have you at their house and pleased to feed you. Learn to share so other kids will play with you. Pay attention when spoken to by adults so they don't hate you and might therefore deem to teach you something. Go to sleep properly and peaceably so that your parents can have a private life and not resent your existence. Take care of your belongings because you need to learn how and because you're lucky to have them. Be good company when something fun is happening so that you're invited for the fun. Act so that other people are happy you're around, so that people will want you around. A child who knows these rules will be welcome everywhere. About the second, equally important principle, your question might be, what is minimum necessary force? This must be established experimentally, starting with the smallest possible intervention. Some children will be turned to stone by a glare. A verbal command will stop another. A thumb-cocked flick of the index finger on a small hand might be necessary for some. Such a strategy is particularly useful in public places such as restaurants. It can be administered suddenly, quietly, and effectively, without risking escalation. What's the alternative? A child who is crying angrily demanding attention is not making himself popular. A child who is running from table to table and disrupting everyone's peace is bringing disgrace, an old word but a good one, on himself and his parents. Such outcomes are far from optimal, and children will be definitely misbehaving more in public because they are experimenting, trying to establish if the same old rules also apply in the new place. They don't sort that out verbally, not when they are under three. When our children were little and we took them to restaurants, they attracted smiles. They sat nicely and ate politely. They couldn't keep it up for long, but we didn't keep them there for too long. When they started to get antsy after sitting for 45 minutes, we knew it was time to go. That was part of the deal. Nearby diners would tell us how nice it was to see a happy family. We weren't always happy, and our children weren't always properly behaved. 
but they were most of the time, and it was wonderful to see people responding so positively to their presence. It was truly good for the kids. They could see that people liked them. This also reinforced their good behavior. That was the reward. People will really like your kids if you give them the chance. This is something I learned as soon as we had our first baby, our daughter, Michaela. When we took her down the street in her little fold-up stroller in our French Montreal working-class neighborhood, rough-looking, heavy-drinking lumberjack types would stop in their tracks and smile at her. They would coo and giggle and make stupid faces. Watching people respond to children restores your faith in human nature. All that's multiplied when your kids behave in public. To ensure that such things happen, you have to discipline your children carefully and effectively. And to do that, you have to know something about reward and about punishment instead of shying away from the knowledge. Part of establishing a relationship with your son or daughter is learning how that small person responds to disciplinary intervention, and then intervening effectively. It's very easy to mouth cliches instead such as, there's no excuse for physical punishment, or hitting children merely teaches them to hit. Let's start with the former claim, there is no excuse for physical punishment. First, we should note the widespread consensus around the idea that some forms of misbehavior, particularly those associated with theft and assault, are both wrong and should be subject to sanction. Second, we should note that almost all those sanctions involve punishment in its many psychological and more directly physical forms. Deprivation of liberty causes pain in a manner essentially similar to that of physical trauma. The same can be said of the use of social isolation, including timeout. We know this neurobiologically. The same brain areas mediate response to all three, and all are ameliorated by the same class of drugs, opiates. Jail is clearly physical punishment, particularly solitary confinement, even when nothing violent happens. Third, we should note that some misbegotten actions must be brought to a halt both effectively and immediately, not least so that something worse doesn't happen. What's the proper punishment for someone who will not stop poking a fork into an electrical socket, or who runs away laughing in a crowded supermarket parking lot? The answer is simple. Whatever will stop it fastest, within reason. Because the alternative could be fatal. That's pretty obvious in the case of parking lot or outlet. But the same thing applies in the social realm, and that brings us to the fourth point regarding excuses for physical punishment. The penalties for misbehavior, of the sort that could have been effectively halted in childhood, become increasingly severe as children get older, and it is disproportionately those who remain unsocialized effectively by age four who end up punished explicitly by society in their later youth and early adulthood. Those unconstrained four-year-olds, in turn, are often those who were unduly aggressive by nature at age two. They were statistically more likely than their peers to kick, hit, bite, and take away toys, later known as stealing. They comprise about 5% of boys and a much smaller percentage of girls. To unthinkingly parrot the magic line, there is no excuse for physical punishment, is also to foster the delusion that teenage devils magically emerge from once innocent little child angels. You're not doing your child any favors by overlooking any misbehavior, particularly if he or she is temperamentally more aggressive. To hold the no excuse for physical punishment theory is also, fifth, to assume that the word no can be effectively uttered to another person in the absence of the threat of punishment. A woman can say no to a powerful, narcissistic man only because she has social norms, the law and the state backing her up. A parent can only say no to a child who wants a third piece of cake because he or she is larger, stronger, and more capable than the child, and is additionally backed up in his authority by law and state. What no means, in the final analysis, is always, if you continue to do that, something you do not like will happen to you. Otherwise, it means nothing. Or worse, it means another nonsensical nothing muttered by ignorable adults. Or worse still, it means all adults are ineffectual and weak. This is a particularly bad lesson when every child's destiny is to become an adult, and when most things that are learned without undue personal pain are modeled or explicitly taught by adults. What does a child who ignores adults and holds them in contempt have to look forward to? Why grow up at all? And that's the story of Peter Pan, who thinks all adults are variants of Captain Hook, tyrannical and terrified of his own mortality. Think hungry crocodile and clock in his stomach. The only time no ever means no in the absence of violence is when it is uttered by one civilized person to another. And what about the idea that hitting a child merely teaches them to hit? First, no. Wrong. Too simple. For starters, hitting is a very unsophisticated word to describe the disciplinary act of an effective parent. If hitting, quote-unquote, accurately described the entire range of physical force, then there would be no difference between rain droplets and atom bombs. Magnitude matters, and so does context if we're not being willfully blind and naive about the issue. Every child knows the difference between being bitten by a mean, unprovoked dog and being nipped by his own pet when he tries playfully but too carelessly to take its bone. How hard someone is hit, and why they are hit, cannot merely be ignored when speaking of hitting. Timing, part of context, is also of crucial importance. If you flick your two-year-old with your finger just after he smacks the baby on the head with a wooden block, 
he will get the connection and be at least somewhat less willing to smack her again in the future. That seems like a good outcome. He certainly won't conclude that he should hit her more using the flick of his mother's finger as an example. He's not stupid. He's just jealous, impulsive, and not very sophisticated. How else are you going to protect his younger sibling? If you discipline ineffectively, then the baby will suffer, maybe for years. The bullying will continue because you won't do a damn thing to stop it. You'll avoid the conflict that's necessary to establish peace. You'll turn a blind eye. And then later, when the younger child confronts you, maybe even in adulthood, you'll say, I never knew it was like that. You just didn't want to know. So you didn't. You just rejected the responsibility of discipline and justified it with a continual show of your niceness. Every gingerbread house has a witch inside it that devours children. So where does all that leave us? With the decision to discipline effectively or to discipline ineffectively, but never the decision to forego discipline altogether because nature and society will punish in a draconian manner whatever errors of childhood behavior remain uncorrected. So here are a few practical hints. Time out can be an extremely effective form of punishment, particularly if the misbehaving child is welcome as soon as he controls his temper. An angry child should sit by himself until he calms down. Then he should be allowed to return to his normal life. That means the child wins, instead of his anger. The rule is, come be with us as soon as you can behave properly. This is a very good deal for a child, parent, and society. You'll be able to tell if your child has really regained control. You'll like him again, despite his earlier misbehavior. If you're still mad, maybe he hasn't completely repented. Or maybe you should do something about your tendency to hold a grudge. If your child is the kind of determined varmint who simply runs away laughing when placed on the steps or in his room, physical restraint might have to be added to the timeout routine. A child can be held carefully but firmly by the upper arms until he or she stops squirming and pays attention. If that fails, being turned over a parent's knee might be required. For the child who is pushing the limits in a spectacularly inspired way, a swat across the backside can indicate requisite seriousness on the part of a responsible adult. There are some situations in which even that will not suffice, partly because there are some children who are very determined, exploratory, and tough, or because the offending behavior is truly severe. And if you're not thinking such things through, then you're not acting responsibly as a parent. You're leaving the dirty work to someone else, who will be much dirtier doing it. A summary of principles. Disciplinary principle 1. Limit the rules. Principle 2. Use minimum necessary force. Here's a third. Parents should come in pairs. Raising young children is demanding and exhausting. Because of this, it's easy for a parent to make a mistake. Insomnia, hunger, the aftermath of an argument, a hangover, a bad day at work, any of these things singly can make a person unreasonable, while in combination, they can produce someone dangerous. Under such circumstances, it is necessary to have someone else around to observe and step in and discuss. This will make it less likely that a whiny, provocative child and her fed-up, cranky parent will excite each other to the point of no return. Parents should come in pairs so the father of a newborn can watch the new mother so she won't get worn out and do something desperate after hearing her colicky baby wail from 11 in the evening until 5 in the morning for 30 nights in a row. I'm not saying we should be mean to single mothers, many of whom struggle impossibly and courageously, and a proportion of whom have had to escape singly from a brutal relationship. But that doesn't mean we should pretend that all family forms are equally viable. They're not. Period. Here's a fourth principle, one that is more particularly psychological. Parents should understand their own capacity to be harsh, vengeful, arrogant, resentful, angry, deceitful. Very few people set out consciously to do a terrible job as a father or mother, but bad parenting happens all the time. This is because people have a great capacity for evil, as well as good, and because they remain willfully blind to that fact. People are aggressive and selfish, as well as kind and thoughtful. For this reason, no adult human being... No hierarchical predatory ape can truly tolerate being dominated by an upstart child. Revenge will come. Ten minutes after a pair of all-too-nice and patient parents have failed to prevent a public tantrum at the local supermarket, they will pay their toddler back with the cold shoulder when he runs up, excited, to show mom and dad his newest accomplishment. Enough embarrassment, disobedience, and dominance challenge, and even the most hypothetically selfless parent will become resentful. And then the real punishment will begin. Resentment breeds the desire for vengeance. Fewer spontaneous offers of love will be offered, with more rationalizations for their absence. Fewer opportunities for the personal development of the child will be sought out. A subtle turning away will begin, and this is only the beginning of the road to total familial warfare conducted mostly in the underworld, underneath the false facade of normality and love. This frequently traveled path is much better avoided. A parent who is seriously aware of his or her limited tolerance and capacity for misbehavior when provoked can therefore seriously plan a proper disciplinary strategy particularly if monitored by an equally awake partner, 
and never let things degenerate to the point where genuine hatred emerges. But beware. There are toxic families everywhere. They make no rules and limit no misbehavior. The parents lash out randomly and unpredictably. The children live in that chaos and are crushed if they're timid or rebel counterproductively if they're tough. It's not good. It can get murderous. Here's a fifth and final and most general principle. Parents have a duty to act as proxies for the real world. Merciful proxies, caring proxies, but proxies nonetheless. This obligation supersedes any responsibility to ensure happiness, foster creativity, or boost self-esteem. It is the primary duty of parents to make their children socially desirable. That will provide the child with opportunity, self-regard, and security. It's more important even than fostering individual identity. That holy grail can only be pursued in any case after a high degree of social sophistication has been established. The Good Child and the Responsible Parent A properly socialized three-year-old is polite and engaging. She's also no pushover. She evokes interest from other children and appreciation from adults. She exists in a world where other kids welcome her and compete for her attention and where adults are happy to see her instead of hiding behind false smiles. She will be introduced to the world by people who are pleased to do so. This will do more for her eventual individuality than any cowardly parental attempt to avoid day-to-day -day conflict and discipline. Discuss your likes and dislikes with regards to your children with your partner, or failing that, a friend. But do not be afraid to have likes and dislikes. You can judge suitable from unsuitable and wheat from chaff. You realize the difference between good and evil. Having clarified your stance, having assessed yourself for pettiness, arrogance, and resentment, you take the next step, and you make your children behave. You take responsibility for their discipline. You take responsibility for the mistakes you will inevitably make when disciplining. You can apologize when you're wrong and learn to do better. You love your kids, after all. If their actions make you dislike them, think what an effect they will have on other people who care much less about them than you. Those other people will punish them severely by omission or commission. Don't allow that to happen. Better to let your little monsters know what is desirable and what is not so they become sophisticated denizens of the world outside the family. A child who pays attention instead of drifting and can play and does not whine and is comical but not annoying and is trustworthy, that child will have friends wherever he goes. His teachers will like him and so will his parents. If he attends politely to adults, he will be attended to, smiled at, and happily instructed. He will thrive in what can so easily be a cold, unforgiving, and hostile world. World. <laughs> Clear rules make for secure children and calm, rational parents. Clear principles of discipline and punishment balance mercy and justice so that social development and psychological maturity can be optimally promoted. Clear rules and proper discipline help the child and the family and society establish, maintain, and expand the order that is all that protects us from chaos and the terrors of the underworld where everything is uncertain, anxiety-provoking, hopeless, and depressing. There are no greater gifts that a committed and courageous parent can bestow. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. 12 Rules for Life by Jordan B. Peterson Rule number 6. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. A Religious Problem It does not seem reasonable to describe the young man who shot 20 children and 6 staff members at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012 as a religious person. This is equally true for the Colorado theater gunmen and the Columbine High School killers. But these murderous individuals had a problem with reality that existed at a religious depth. As one of the members of the Columbine duo wrote, the human race isn't worth fighting for, only worth killing. Give the earth back to the animals, they deserve it infinitely more than we do. Nothing means anything anymore. People who think such things view being itself as inequitable and harsh to the point of corruption, and human being in particular as contemptible. They appoint themselves supreme educators of reality and find it wanting. They are the ultimate critics. The deeply cynical writer continues. If you recall your history, the Nazis came up with the final solution to the Jewish problem. Kill them all. Well, in case you haven't figured it out, I say kill mankind. No one should survive. For such individuals, the world of experience is insufficient and evil, so to hell with everything. What is happening when someone comes to think in this manner? A great German play, Faust, a tragedy, written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, addresses that issue. The play's main character, a scholar named Heinrich Faust, trades his immortal soul to the devil, Mephistopheles. In return, he receives whatever he desires while still alive on earth. In Goethe's play, Mephistopheles is the eternal adversary of being. He has a central defining credo. I am the spirit who negates, and rightly so, for all that comes to be deserves to perish wretchedly. It were better nothing would begin, thus everything your terms sin, destruction, evil represent. That is my proper element. Goethe considered this hateful sentiment so important, 
so key to the central element of vengeful human destructiveness, that he had Mephistopheles say it a second time, phrased somewhat differently in part two of the play, written many years later. People think often in the Mephistophelian manner, although they seldom act upon their thoughts as brutally as the mass murderers of school, college, and theater. Whenever we experience injustice, real or imagined, whenever we encounter tragedy or fall prey to the machinations of others, whenever we experience the horror and pain of our own apparently arbitrary limitations, the temptation to question being, and then to curse it, rises foully from the darkness. Why must innocent people suffer so terribly? What kind of bloody, horrible planet is this, anyway? Life is in truth very hard. Everyone is destined for pain and slated for destruction. Sometimes, suffering is clearly the result of a personal fault such as willful blindness, poor decision-making, or malevolence. In such cases, when it appears to be self-inflicted, it may even seem just. People get what they deserve, you might contend. That's cold comfort, however, even when true. Sometimes, if those who are suffering change their behavior, then their lives would unfold less tragically. But human control is limited. Susceptibility to despair, disease, aging, and death is universal. In the final analysis, we do not appear to be the architects of our own fragility. Whose fault is it, then? People who are very ill, or worse, who have a sick child, will inevitably find themselves asking this question whether they are religious believers or not. The same is true of someone who finds his shirt sleeve caught in the gears of a giant bureaucracy, who is suffering through a tax audit or fighting an interminable lawsuit or divorce. And it's not only the obviously suffering who are tormented by the need to blame someone or something for the intolerable state of their being. At the height of his fame, influence, and creative power, for example, the towering Leo Tolstoy himself began to question the value of human existence. He reasoned in this way. My position was terrible. I knew that I could find nothing in the way of rational knowledge except the denial of life, and in faith I could find nothing except the denial of reason, and this was even more impossible than a denial of life. According to rational knowledge, it followed that life is evil and people know it. They do not have to live, yet they have lived and they do live, just as I myself have lived. Even though I had known for a long time that life is meaningless and evil. Try as he might, Tolstoy could identify only four means of escaping from such thoughts. One was retreating into childlike ignorance of the problem. Another was pursuing mindless pleasure. The third was continuing to drag out a life that is evil and meaningless, knowing beforehand that nothing can come of it. He identified that particular form of escape with weakness. The people in this category know that death is better than life, but they do not have the strength to act rationally and quickly, put an end to the delusion by killing themselves. Quote, unquote. Only the fourth and final mode of escape involved strength and energy. It consists of destroying life once one has realized that life is evil and meaningless. Tolstoy relentlessly followed his thoughts. Only unusually strong and logically consistent people act in this manner. Having realized all the stupidity of the joke that is being played on us, and seeing that the blessings of the dead are greater than those of the living, and it is better not to exist, they act and put an end to this stupid joke. And they use any means of doing it, a rope around the neck, water, a knife in the heart, a train. Tolstoy wasn't pessimistic enough. The stupidity of the joke being played on us does not merely motivate suicide. It motivates murder, mass murder, often followed by suicide. That is a far more effective existential protest. By June of 2016, unbelievable as it may seem, there had been 1,000 mass killings, defined as four or more people shot in a single incident, excluding the shooter. In the U.S., in 1,260 days. That's one such event on five of every six days for more than three years. Everyone says, we don't understand. How can we still pretend that? Tolstoy understood more than a century ago. The ancient authors of the biblical story of Cain and Abel understood as well more than 20 centuries ago. They described murder as the first act of post edenix history. And not just murder, but fratricidal murder. Murder not only of someone innocent, but of someone ideal and good. And murder done consciously, to spite the creator of the universe. Today's killers tell us the same thing in their own words. But who would dare say that this is not the worm at the core of the apple? But we will not listen, because the truth cuts too close to the bone. Even for a mind as profound as that of one celebrated Russian author, there was no way out. How can the rest of us manage when a man of Tolstoy's stature admits defeat? For years he hid his guns from himself and would not walk with a rope in hand in case he hanged himself. How can a person who is awake avoid outrage at the world? Vengeance or Transformation A religious man might shake his fist in desperation at the apparent injustice and blindness of God. Even Christ himself felt abandoned before the cross, or so the story goes. A more agnostic or atheistic individual might blame fate, 
or meditate bitterly on the brutality of chance. Another might tear himself apart searching for the character flaws underlying his suffering and deterioration. These are all variations on a theme. The name of the target changes, but the underlying psychology remains constant. Why? Why is there so much suffering and cruelty? Well, perhaps it really is God's doing, or the fault of blind, pointless fate, if you are inclined to think that way. And there appears to be every reason to think that way. But what happens if you do? Mass murderers believe that the suffering attendant upon existence justifies judgment and revenge, as the Columbine boys so clearly indicated. I will sooner die than betray my own thoughts. Before I leave this worthless place, I will kill whoever I deem unfit for anything, especially life. If you pissed me off in the past, you will die if I see you. You might be able to piss off others and have it eventually all blow over, but not me. I don't forget people who wronged me. One of the most vengeful murderers of the 20th century, the terrible Karl Panzeram, was raped, brutalized, and betrayed in the Minnesota institution responsible for his quote-unquote rehabilitation when he was a delinquent juvenile. He emerged, enraged beyond measure, as a burglar, arsonist, rapist, and serial killer. He aimed consciously and consistently at destruction, even keeping track of the dollar value of the property he burned. He started by hating the individuals who had hurt him. His resentment grew until his hatred encompassed all of mankind, and he didn't stop there. His destructiveness was aimed in some fundamental manner at God himself. There's no other way of phrasing it. Panzeram raped, murdered, and burned to express his outrage at being. He acted as if someone was responsible. The same thing happens in the story of Cain and Abel. Cain's sacrifices are rejected. He exists in suffering. He calls out God and challenges the being he created. God refuses his plea. He tells Cain that his trouble is self-induced. Cain, in his rage, kills Abel, God's favorite, and truth be known, Cain's idol. Cain is jealous, of course, of his successful brother, but he destroys Abel primarily to spite God. This is the truest version of what happens when people take their vengeance to the ultimate extreme. Panzeram's response was, and this is what is so terrible, perfectly understandable. The details of his autobiography reveal that he was one of Tolstoy's strong and logically consistent people. He was a powerful, consistent, fearless actor. He had the courage of his convictions. How could someone like him be expected to forgive and forget, given what had happened to him? Truly terrible things happen to people. It's no wonder they're out for revenge. Under such conditions, vengeance seems a moral necessity. How can it be distinguished from the demand for justice? After the experience of terrible atrocity, isn't forgiveness just cowardice or lack of willpower? Such questions torment me. But people emerge from terrible pasts to do good, not evil, although such an accomplishment can seem superhuman. I have met people who managed to do it. I know a man, a great artist, who emerged from just such a school as the one described by Panzram. Only this man was thrown into it as an innocent five-year-old, fresh from a long stretch in a hospital where he had suffered measles, mumps, and chickenpox simultaneously. Incapable of speaking the language of the school, deliberately isolated from his family, abused, starved, and otherwise tormented, he emerged an angry, broken young man. He hurt himself badly in the aftermath with drugs and alcohol and other forms of self-destructive behavior. He detested everyone, God, himself, and blind fate included. But he put an end to all that. He stopped drinking. He stopped hating, although it emerges in flashes. He revitalized the artistic culture of his native tradition and trained young men to continue in his footsteps. He produced a 50-foot totem pole memorializing the events of his life and a canoe 40 feet long from a single log of a kind rarely if ever produced now. He brought his family together and held a great potlatch with 16 hours of dancing and hundreds of people in attendance to express his grief and make peace with the past. He decided to be a good person and then he did the impossible things required to live that way. I had a client who did not have good parents. Her mother died when she was very young. Her grandmother, who raised her, was a harridan, bitter and over-concerned with appearances. She mistreated her granddaughter, punishing her for her virtues, creativity, sensitivity, intelligence, unable to resist acting out her resentment for an admittedly hard life on her granddaughter. She had a better relationship with her father, but he was an addict who died badly while she cared for him. My client had a son. She perpetuated none of this with him. He grew up truthful and independent and hardworking and smart. Instead of widening the tear in the cultural fabric she inherited and transmitting it, she sewed it up. She rejected the sins of her forefathers. Such things can be done. <clears throat> Distress, whether psychic, physical, or intellectual, need not at all produce nihilism. That is, the radical rejection of value, meaning, and desirability. Such distress always permits a variety of interpretations. Nietzsche wrote those words. What he meant was this. People who experience evil may certainly desire to perpetuate it, to pay it forward. But it is also possible to learn good by experiencing evil. 
A bullied boy can mimic his tormentors, but he can also learn from his own abuse that it is wrong to push people around and make their lives miserable. Someone tormented by her mother can learn from her terrible experiences how important it is to be a good parent. Many, perhaps even most, of adults who abuse children were abused themselves as children. However, the majority of people who are abused as children do not abuse their own children. This is a well-established fact, which can be demonstrated simply arithmetically in this way. If one parent abused three children, and each of those children had three children, and so on, there would be three abusers of the first generation, nine the second, 27 the third, 81 the fourth, and so on exponentially. After 20 generations, more than 10 billion would have suffered childhood abuse, more people than currently inhabit the planet. But instead, abuse disappears across generations. People constrain its spread. That's a testament to the genuine dominance of good over evil in the human heart. The desire for vengeance, however justified, also bars the way to other productive thoughts. The American English poet T.S. Eliot explained why in his play The Cocktail Party. One of his characters is not having a good time of it. She speaks of her profound unhappiness to a psychiatrist. She says she hopes that all her suffering is her own fault. The psychiatrist is taken aback. He asks why. She has thought long and hard about this, she says, and has come to the following conclusion. If it's her fault, she might be able to do something about it. If it's God's fault, however, if reality itself is flawed, hell-bent on ensuing, <laughs> ensuring her mis- Oh gosh. <laughs> if reality itself is flawed, hell-bent on ensuring her misery, then she is doomed. She couldn't change the structure of reality itself. But maybe she could change her own life. Alexander Solzhenitsyn had every reason to question the structure of existence when he was imprisoned in a Soviet labor camp in the middle of the terrible 20th century. He had served as a soldier on the ill-prepared Russian front lines in the face of a Nazi invasion. He had been arrested, beaten, and thrown into prison by his own people. Then he was struck by cancer. He could have become resentful and bitter. His life had been rendered miserable by both Stalin and Hitler, two of the worst tyrants in history. He lived in brutal conditions. Vast stretches of his precious time were stolen from him and squandered. He witnessed the pointless and degrading suffering and death of his friends and acquaintances. Then he contracted an extremely serious disease. Solzhenitsyn had a cause to curse God. Job himself barely had it as hard. But the great writer, the profound spirited defender of truth, did not allow his mind to turn towards vengeance and destruction. He opened his eyes instead. During his many trials, Solzhenitsyn encountered people who comported themselves nobly under horrific circumstances. He contemplated their behavior deeply. Then he asked himself the most difficult of questions. Had he personally contributed to the catastrophe of his life? If so, how? He remembered his unquestioning support of the Communist Party in his early years. He reconsidered his whole life. He had plenty of time in the camps. How had he missed the mark in the past? How many times had he acted against his own conscience, engaging in actions that he knew to be wrong? How many times had he betrayed himself and lied? Was there any way that the sins of his past could be rectified, atoned for in the muddy hell of a Soviet gulag? Solzhenitsyn poured over the details of his life with a fine-toothed comb. He asked himself a second question, and a third. Can I stop making such mistakes now? Can I repair the damage done by my past failures now? He learned to watch and to listen. He found people he admired, who were honest despite everything. He took himself apart piece by piece, let what was unnecessary and harmful die, and resurrected himself. Then he wrote the Gulag Archipelago, a history of the Soviet prison camp system. It's a forceful, terrible book, written with the overwhelming moral force of unvarnished truth. Its sheer outrage screamed unbearably across hundreds of pages. Banned, and for good reason, in the USSR, it was smuggled to the West in the 1970s and burst upon the world. Solzhenitsyn's writing utterly and finally demolished the intellectual credibility of communism as ideology or society. He took an axe to the trunk of the tree whose bitter fruits had nourished him so poorly, and whose planting he had witnessed and supported. One man's decision to change his life instead of cursing fate shook the whole pathological system of communist tyranny to its core. It crumbled entirely not so many years later, and Solzhenitsyn's courage was not the least of the reasons why. He was not the only such person to perform such a miracle. Vlachav Havel, the persecuted writer of later, impossibly became the president of Czechoslovakia. Then the new Czech Republic comes to mind, as does Mahatma Gandhi. Things fall apart. Whole peoples have adamantly refused to judge reality, to criticize being, to blame God. It's interesting to consider the Old Testament Hebrews in this regard. Their travails followed a consistent pattern. The stories of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah and the Tower of Babel are truly ancient. Their origins vanish into the mysteries of time. It's not until after the flood story in Genesis that something like history, as we understand it, truly starts. It starts with Abraham. Abraham's descendants become the Hebrew people of the Old Testament, also known as the Hebrew Bible. 
they enter a covenant with Yahweh, with God, and begin their recognizably historical adventures. Under the leadership of a great man, the Hebrews organize themselves into a society and then an empire. As their fortunes rise, success breeds pride and arrogance. Corruption raises its ugly head. The increasingly hubristic state becomes obsessed with power, begins to forget its duty to the widows and orphans, and deviates from its age-old agreement with God. A prophet arises. He brazenly and publicly reviles the authoritarian king and faithless country for their failures before God in act of blind courage, telling them of the terrible judgment they come. When his wise words are not completely ignored, they are heeded too late. God smites his wayward people, dooming them to abject defeat in battle and generations of subjugation. The Hebrews repent at length, blaming their misfortune on their own failure to adhere to God's word. They insist to themselves that they could have done better. They rebuild their state, and the cycle begins again. This is life. We build structures to live in. We build families and states and countries. We abstract the principles upon which those structures are founded and formulate systems of belief. At first, we inhabit those structures and beliefs like Adam and Eve in paradise. But success makes us complacent. We forget to pay attention. We take what we have for granted. We turn a blind eye. We fail to notice that things are changing or that corruption is taking root and everything falls apart. Is that the fault of reality? Of God? Or do things fall apart because we have not paid sufficient attention? When the hurricane hit New Orleans and the town sank under the waves, was that a natural disaster? The Dutch prepared their dikes for the worst storm in 10,000 years. Had New Orleans followed that example, no tragedy would have occurred. It's not that no one knew. The Flood Control Act of 1965 mandated improvements in the levee system that held back Lake Pontchartrain. <laughs> Pontchartrain. Pontchartrain. Okay. The system was to be completed by 1978. Forty years later, only 60% of the work had been done. Willful blindness and corruption took the city down. A hurricane is an act of God, but failure to prepare when the necessity for preparation is well known, that's a sin. That's failure to hit the mark. And the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The ancient Jews always blamed themselves when things fell apart. They acted as if God's goodness, the goodness of reality, was axiomatic and took responsibility for their own failure. That's insanely responsible. But the alternative is to judge reality as insufficient, to criticize being itself and to sink into resentment and the desire for revenge. If you are suffering, well, that's the norm. People are limited and life is tragic. If your suffering is unbearable, however, and you are starting to become corrupted, here's something to think about. Clean up your life. Consider your circumstances. Start small. Have you taken full advantage of the opportunities offered to you? Are you working hard on your career or even your job? Or are you letting bitterness and resentment hold you back and drag you down? Have you made peace with your brother? Are you treating your spouse and your children with dignity and respect? Do you have habits that are destroying your health and well-being? Are you truly shouldering your responsibilities? Have you said what you need to say to your friends and family members? Are there things that you could do, that you know you could do, that would make things around you better? Have you cleaned up your life? If the answer is no, here's something to try. Start to stop doing what you know to be wrong. Start stopping today. Don't waste time questioning how you know that what you're doing is wrong, if you are certain that it is. An opportune questioning can confuse without enlightening, as well as deflecting you from action. You can know that something is wrong or right without knowing why. Your entire being can tell you something that you can neither explain nor articulate. Every person is too complex to know themselves completely, and we all contain wisdom that we cannot comprehend. So simply stop when you apprehend, however dimly, that you should stop. Stop acting in that particular, despicable manner. Stop saying those things that make you weak and ashamed. Say only those things that make you strong. Do only those things that you could speak of with honor. You can use your own standards of judgment. You can rely on yourself for guidance. You don't have to adhere to some external arbitrary code of behavior, although you should not overlook the guidelines of your culture. Life is short, and you don't have time to figure everything out on your own. The wisdom of the past was hard-earned, and your dead ancestors may have something useful to tell you. Don't blame capitalism, the radical left, or the iniquity of your enemies. Don't recognize the state until you have ordered your own experience. Have some humility. If you cannot bring peace to your household, how dare you try to rule a city? Let your own soul guide you. Watch what happens over the days and weeks. When you are at work, you'll begin to say what you really think. You will start to tell your wife or your husband or your children or your parents what you really want and need. When you know that you have left something undone, you will act to correct the omission. Your head will start to clear up as you stop filling it with lies. Your experience will improve 
as you stop distorting it with inauthentic actions. You will then begin to discover new, more subtle things that you are doing wrong. Stop doing those too. After some months and years of diligent effort, your life will become simpler and less complicated. Your judgment will improve. You will untangle your past. You will become stronger and less bitter. You will move more confidently into the future. You will stop making your life unnecessarily difficult. You will then be left with the inevitable, bare tragedies of life, but they will no longer be compounded with bitterness and deceit. Perhaps you will discover that your now less corrupted soul, much stronger than it might otherwise have been, is now able to bear those remaining necessary, minimal, inescapable tragedies. Perhaps you will even learn to encounter them so that they stay tragic, merely tragic, instead of degenerating into outright hellishness. Maybe your anxiety and hopelessness and resentment and anger, however murderous initially, will recede. Perhaps your uncorrupted soul will then see its existence as a genuine good, as something to celebrate even in the face of your own vulnerability. Perhaps you will become an ever more powerful force for peace and whatever is good. Perhaps you will then see that if all people did this in their own lives, the world might stop being an evil place. After that, with continued effort, perhaps it could even stop being a tragic place. Who knows what existence might be like if we all decided to strive for the best? Who knows what eternal heavens might be established by our spirits, purified by truth, aiming skyward, right here on the fallen earth? Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson Rule number seven, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Get while the getting's good. Life is suffering, that's clear. There's no more basic, irrefutable truth. It's basically what God tells Adam and Eve immediately before he kicks them out of paradise. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Genesis chapter 3, 16 through 19, King James Version. What in the world should be done about that? The simplest, most obvious, and most direct answer. Pursue pleasure. Follow your impulses. Live for the moment. Do what's expedient. Lie, cheat, steal, deceive, manipulate, but don't get caught. In an ultimately meaningless universe, what possible difference could it make? And this is by no means a new idea. The fact of life's tragedy and the suffering that is part of it has been used to justify the pursuit of immediate selfish gratification for a very long time. Short and sorrowful is our life, and there is no remedy when a man comes to his end, and no one has been known to return from Hades, because we were born by mere chance, and hereafter we shall be as though we had never been, because the breath in our nostrils is smoke, and reason is spark kindled by the beating of our hearts. When it is extinguished, the body will turn to ashes, and the spirit will dissolve like empty air. Our name will be forgotten in time, and no one will remember our works. Our life will pass away like the traces of a cloud and be scattered like mist that is chased by the rays of the sun and overcome by its heat. For our allotted time is the passing of a shadow, and there is no return from our death, because it is sealed up and no one turns back. Come, therefore, let us enjoy the good things that exist and make use of the creation to the full as in youth. Let us take our fill of costly wine and perfumes and let no flower of spring pass by us. Let us crown ourselves with rosebuds before they wither. Let none of us fail to share in our revelry everywhere. Let us leave signs of enjoyment, because this is our portion and this is our lot. Let us oppress the righteous poor man. Let us not spare the widow nor regard the gray hairs of the aged. But let our might be our law of right, for what is weak proves itself to be worthless. Wisdom 2, 1 and 2, RSV The pleasure of expediency may be fleeting, but it's pleasure nonetheless, and that's something to stack up against the terror and pain of existence. Every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost, as the old proverb has it. Why not simply take everything you can get whenever the opportunity arises? Why not determine to live in that manner? Or is there an alternative, more powerful, more compelling? 
Our ancestors worked out very sophisticated answers to such questions, but we still don't understand them very well. This is because they are in large part still implicit, manifest primarily in ritual and myth, and as of yet, incompletely articulated. We act them out and represent them in stories, but we're not yet wise enough to formulate them explicitly. We're still chimps in a troop or wolves in a pack. We know how to behave. We know who's who and why. We've learned that through experience. Our knowledge has been shaped by our interaction with others. We've established predictable routines and patterns of behavior, but we don't really understand them or know where they originated. They've evolved over great expanses of time. No one was formulating them explicitly, at least not in the dimmest reaches of the past, even though we've been telling each other how to act forever. One day, however, not long ago, we woke up. We were already doing, but we started noticing what we were doing. We started using our bodies as devices to represent their own actions. We started imitating and dramatizing. We invented ritual. We started acting out our own experiences. Then we started to tell stories. We coded our observations of our own drama in these stories. In this manner, the information that was first only embedded in our behavior became represented in our stories. But we didn't and still don't understand what it all means. The biblical narrative of paradise and the fall is one such story fabricated by our collective imagination working over the centuries. It provides a profound account of the nature of being and points the way to a mode of conceptualization and action well matched to that nature. In the Garden of Eden, prior to the dawn of self-consciousness, so goes the story, human beings were sinless. Our primordial parents, Adam and Eve, walked with God. Then, tempted by the snake, the first couple ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, discovered death and vulnerability, and turned away from God. Mankind was exiled from paradise and began its effortful mortal existence. The idea of sacrifice enters soon afterward, beginning with the account of Cain and Abel and developing through the Abrahamic adventures and the Exodus. After much contemplation, struggling humanity learns that God's favor could be gained and his wrath averted through proper sacrifice, and also that bloody murder might be motivated among those unwilling or unable to succeed in this manner. The Delay of Gratification When engaging in sacrifice, our forefathers began to act out what would be considered a proposition if it were stated in words, that something better might be attained in the future by giving up something of value in the present. Recall, if you will, that the necessity for work is one of the curses placed by God upon Adam and his descendants in consequence of original sin. Adam's waking to the fundamental constraints of his being, his vulnerability, his eventual death, is equivalent to his discovery of the future. The future. That's where you go to die, hopefully not too soon. Your demise might be staved off through work, through the sacrifice of the now to gain benefit later. It is for this reason, among others, no doubt, that the concept of sacrifice is introduced in the biblical chapter immediately following the drama of the fall. There is little difference between sacrifice and work. They are also both uniquely human. Sometimes animals act as if they are working, but they are really only following the dictates of their nature. Beavers build dams. They do so because they are beavers, and beavers build dams. They don't think, yeah, but I'd rather be on a beach in Mexico with my girlfriend while they're doing it. Prosaically, such sacrifice, work, is delay of gratification. But that's a very mundane phrase to describe something of such profound significance. The discovery that gratification could be delayed was simultaneously the discovery of time, and with it causality, at least the causal force of voluntary human action. Long ago, in the dim mists of time, we began to realize that reality was structured as if it could be bargained with. We learned that behaving properly now, in the present, regulating our impulses, considering the plight of others, could bring rewards in the future, in a time and place that did not yet exist. We began to inhibit, control, and organize our immediate impulses so that we could stop interfering with other people and our future selves. Doing so was indistinguishable from organizing society. The discovery of the causal relationship between our efforts today and the quality of tomorrow motivated the social contract. The organization that enables today's work to be stored reliably mostly in the form of promises from others. Understanding is often acted out before it can be articulated, just as a child acts out what it means to be a mother or father before being able to give a spoken account of what those roles mean. The act of making a ritual sacrifice to God was an early and sophisticated enactment of the idea of the usefulness of delay. There is a long conceptual journey between merely feasting hungrily and learning to set aside some extra meat smoked by the fire for the end of the day or for someone who isn't present, it takes a long time to learn to keep anything later for yourself or to share it with someone else. And those are very much the same thing as in the former case you are sharing with your future self. It is much easier and far more likely to selfishly and immediately wolf down everything in sight. There are similar long journeys between every leap in sophistication with regard to delay and its conceptualization. 
short-term sharing, storing away for the future, representation of that storage in the form of records, and later in the form of currency, and ultimately, the saving of money in a bank or other social institution. Some conceptualizations had to serve as intermediaries, or the full range of our practices and ideas surrounding sacrifice and work and their representation could have never emerged. Our ancestors acted out a drama, a fiction. They personified the force that governs fate as a spirit that can be bargained with, traded with, as if it were another human being. And the amazing thing is that it worked. This was in part because the future is largely composed of other human beings, precisely those who have watched and evaluated and appraised the tiniest details of your past behavior. It's not very far from that to God, sitting above on high, tracking your every move and writing it down for further reference in a big book. Here's a productive symbolic idea. The future is a judgmental father. That's a good start. But two additional archetypal foundational questions arose because the discovery of sacrifice, of work. Both have to do with the ultimate extension of the logic of work, which is sacrifice now to gain later. First question, what must be sacrificed? Small sacrifices may be sufficient to solve small, singular problems, but it is possible that larger, more comprehensive sacrifices might solve an array of large and complex problems all at the same time. That's harder, but it might be better. Adapting to the necessary discipline of medical school will, for example, fatally interfere with the licentious lifestyle of a hardcore undergraduate party animal. Giving that up is a sacrifice. But a physician can, to paraphrase George W., really put food on his family. That's a lot of trouble dispensed with over a very long period of time. So sacrifices are necessary to improve the future, and larger sacrifices can be better. Second question set of related questions, really, we've already established the basic principle. Sacrifice will improve the future. But a principle, once established, has to be fleshed out. Its full extension or significance has to be understood. What is implied by the idea that sacrifice will improve the future in the most extreme and final of cases? Where does that basic principle find its limits? We must ask, to begin, what would be the largest, most effective, most pleasing of all possible sacrifices? And then, how good might the best possible future be if the most effective sacrifice could be made? The biblical story of Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons, immediately follows the story of the expulsion from paradise, as mentioned previously. Cain and Abel are really the first humans, since their parents were made directly by God and not born in the standard manner. Cain and Abel live in history, not in Eden. They must work, they must make sacrifices to please God, and they do so with altar and proper ritual. But things get complicated. Abel's offerings please God, but Cain's do not. Abel is rewarded many times over, but Cain is not. It's not precisely clear why, although the text strongly hints that Cain's heart is just not in it. Maybe the quality of what Cain has put forward was low. Maybe his spirit was begrudging. Or maybe God was vexed for some secret reasons of his own. And all of this is realistic, including the text's vagueness of explanation. Not all sacrifices are of equal quality. Furthermore, it often appears that sacrifices of apparently high quality are not rewarded with a better future, and it's not clear why. Why isn't God happy? What would have to change to make him so? Those are difficult questions, and everyone asks them all the time, even if they don't notice. Asking such questions is indistinguishable from thinking. The realization that pleasure could be usefully forestalled dawned on us with great difficulty. It runs absolutely contrary to our ancient fundamental animal instincts, which demand immediate satisfaction, particularly under conditions of deprivation, which are both inevitable and commonplace. And to complicate the matter, such delay only becomes useful when civilization has stabilized itself enough to guarantee the existence of the delayed reward in the future. If everything you save will be destroyed, or worse, stolen, there is no point in saving. It is for this reason that a wolf will down 20 pounds of raw meat in a single meal. He isn't thinking, man, I hate it when I binge, I should save some of this for next week. <laughs> so how was it that those two impossible and necessarily simultaneous accomplishments delay and the stabilization of society into the future could possibly have manifested themselves. Here's a developmental progression from animal to human. It's wrong, no doubt, in the details, but it's sufficiently correct for our purposes in theme. First, there's excess food. Large carcasses, mammoths, or other massive herbivores might provide that. We ate a lot of mammoths, maybe all of them. After a kill with a large animal, there's some left for later. That's accidental at first, but eventually the utility of for later starts to be appreciated. Some provisional notion of sacrifice develops at the same time. If I leave some, even if I want it now, I won't have to be hungry later. That provisional notion develops to the next level. If I leave some for later, I won't have to go hungry, and neither will uh, those I care for. And then to the next. 
I can't possibly eat all of this mammoth, but I can't store the rest for too long either. Maybe I should feed some to other people. Maybe they'll remember and feed me some of their mammoth when they have some and I have none. Then I'll get some mammoth now and some mammoth later. That's a good deal. And maybe those I'm sharing with will come to trust me more generally. Maybe then we could trade forever. In such a manner, mammoth becomes future mammoth, and future mammoth becomes personal reputation. That's the emergence of the social contract. To share does not mean to give away something you value and get nothing back. That is instead only what every child who refuses to share fears it means. To share means, properly, to initiate the process of trade. A child who can't share, who can't trade, can't have any friends because having friends is a form of trade. Benjamin Franklin once suggested that a newcomer to a neighborhood ask a neighbor to do him or her a favor, citing an old maxim. He that has once done you a kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom you yourself have obliged. In Franklin's opinion, asking someone for something, not too extreme, obviously, was the most useful and immediate invitation to social interaction. Such asking on the part of the newcomer provided the neighbor with an opportunity to show him or herself as a good person at first encounter. It also meant that the latter could now ask the former for a favor in return because of the debt incurred, increasing their mutual familiarity and trust. In that manner, both parties could overcome their natural hesitancy and mutual fear of the stranger. It is better to have something than nothing. It's better yet to share generously the something you have. It's even better than that, however, to become widely known for generous sharing. That's something that lasts. That's something that's reliable. And at this point of abstraction, we can observe how the groundwork for the conceptions reliable, honest, and generous has been laid. The basis for an articulated morality has been put in place. The productive, truthful sharer is the prototype for the good citizen and the good man. We can see in this manner how from the simple notion that leftovers are a good idea, the highest moral principles might emerge. It's as if something like the following happened as humanity developed. First there were endless tens of hundreds of thousands of years prior to the emergence of written history and drama. During that time, the twin practices of delay and exchange begin to emerge slowly and painfully. Then they become represented in a metaphorical abstraction as rituals and tales of sacrifice told in a manner such as this. It's as if there is a powerful figure in the sky who sees all and is judging you. Giving up something you value seems to make him happy. And you want to make him happy because all hell breaks loose if you don't. So practice sacrificing and sharing until you become expert at it and things will go well for you. No one said any of this, at least not so plainly and directly. But it was implicit in the practice and then in the stories. Author's note on things will go well for you. Now this is all true. Note whether there is or is not actually such a powerful figure quote-unquote, in the sky, smiley face. Resuming. Action came first, as it had to, as the animals we once were could act but could not think. Implicit, unrecognized value came first, as the actions that preceded thought embodied value but did not make that value explicit. People watched the successful succeed and the unsuccessful fail for thousands and thousands of years. We thought it over and drew a conclusion. The successful among us delay gratification. The successful among us bargain with the future. A great idea begins to emerge, taking ever more clearly articulated form in ever more clearly articulated stories. What's the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful? The successful sacrifice. Things get better as the successful practice their sacrifices. The questions become increasingly precise and simultaneously broader. What is the greatest possible sacrifice? For the greatest possible good? And the answers become increasingly deeper and profound. The god of Western tradition, like so many gods, requires sacrifice. We have already examined why. But sometimes, he goes even further. He demands not only sacrifice, but the sacrifice of precisely what is loved best. This is most starkly portrayed and most confusingly evident in the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, beloved of God, long wanted a son, and God promised him exactly that after many delays and under the apparently impossible conditions of old age and a long barren wife. But not so long afterward, when the miraculously born Isaac is still a child, God turns around and in unreasonable and apparently barbaric fashion demands that his faithful servant offer his son as a sacrifice. The story ends happily. God sends an angel to stay Abraham's obedient hand and accepts a ram in Isaac's stead. That's a good thing, but it doesn't really address the issue at hand. Why is God's going further necessary? Why does he, why does life impose such demands? We'll start our analysis with a truism, stark, self-evident, and understated. Sometimes, things do not go well. That seems to have much to do with the terrible nature of the world, 
with its plagues and famines and tyrannies and betrayals. But here's the rub. Sometimes, when things are not going well, it's not the world that's the cause. The cause is instead that which is currently most valued, subjectively and personally. Why? Because the world is revealed, to an indeterminate degree, through the template of your values. Much more on this in Rule 10. If the world that you are seeing is not the world you want, therefore it's time to examine your values. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. It's time to let go. It might even be time to sacrifice what you love best, so that you can become what you might become, instead of staying who you are. There's an old and possibly apocryphal story about how to catch a monkey that illustrates this set of ideas very well. First, you must find a large, narrow-necked jar, just barely wide enough in diameter at the top, for a monkey to put his hand inside. Then you must fill the jar part way with rocks, so it's far too heavy for a monkey to carry. Then you must scatter some treats, attractive to monkeys, near the jar, to attract one, and put some more inside the jar. A monkey will come along, reach into the narrow opening, and grab while the grabbing is good. But now, he won't be able to extract his fist, now full of treats, from the too narrow opening of the jar. Not without unclenching his hand, not without relinquishing what he already has. And that's just what he won't do. The monkey catcher can just walk over to the jar and pick up the monkey. The animal will not sacrifice the part to preserve the whole. Something valuable, given up, ensures future prosperity. Something valuable sacrificed pleases the Lord. What is most valuable and best sacrificed? Or what is at least emblematic of that? A choice cut of meat. The best animal in the flock. A most valued possession. What's above even that? Something intensely personal and painful to give up. That's symbolized, perhaps, in God's insistence on circumcision as a part of Abraham's sacrificial routine, where the part is offered symbolically to redeem the whole. What's beyond that? What pertains more closely to the whole person rather than the part? What constitutes the ultimate sacrifice for the gain of the ultimate prize? It's a close race between child and self. The sacrifice of the mother offering her child to the world is exemplified profoundly by Michelangelo's great sculpture, the Pieta, illustrated at the beginning of this chapter. Michelangelo crafted Mary contemplating her son, crucified and ruined. It's her fault. It was through her that he entered the world and its great drama of being. Is it right to bring a baby into this terrible world? Every woman asks herself that question. Some say no and they have their reasons. Mary answers yes, voluntarily, knowing full well what's to come as do all mothers if they allow themselves to see. It's an act of supreme courage when undertaken voluntarily. In turn, Mary's son, Christ, offers himself to God in the world to betrayal, torture, and death, to the very point of despair on the cross, where he cries out those terrible words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. That is the archetypal story of the man who gives his all for the sake of the better, who offers up his life for the advancement of being, who allows God's will to become manifest fully within the confines of a single mortal life. That is the model for the honorable man. In Christ's case, however, as he sacrifices himself, God, his father, is simultaneously sacrificing his son. It is for this reason that the Christian sacrificial drama of son and self is archetypal. It's a story at the limit where nothing more extreme, nothing greater can be imagined. That's the very definition of archetypal. That's the core of what constitutes religious. Pain and suffering define the world. Of that, there can be no doubt. Sacrifice can hold pain and suffering in abeyance to a greater or lesser degree, and greater sacrifices can do that more effectively than lesser. Of that, there can be no doubt. Everyone holds this knowledge in their soul. Thus, the person who wishes to alleviate suffering, who wishes to rectify the flaws in being, who wants to bring about the best of all possible futures, who wants to create heaven on earth, will make the greatest of sacrifices, of self and child, of everything that is loved, to live a life aimed at the good. He will forego expediency. He will pursue the path of ultimate meaning. And he will, in that manner, bring salvation to the ever-desperate world. But is such a thing even possible? Is this simply not asking too much of the individual? It's all well and good for Christ. It might be objected, but he was the veritable son of God. But we do have other examples, some much less mythologized and archetypal. Consider, for example, the case of Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher. After a lifetime of seeking the truth and educating his countrymen, Socrates faced a trial for crimes against the city-state of Athens, his hometown. His accusers provided him with plenty of opportunity to simply leave and avoid the trouble, but the great sage had already considered and rejected this course of action. 
His companion, Hermogenes, observed him at this time discussing any and every subject other than this trial, and asked him why he appeared so unconcerned. Socrates first answered that he had been preparing his whole life to defend himself, but then he said something more mysterious and significant. When he attempted specifically to consider strategies that would produce acquittal by fair means or foul, or even when merely considering his potential actions at the trial, he found himself interrupted by his divine sign, his internal spirit, voice, or daemon. Socrates discussed this voice at the trial itself. He said that one of the factors distinguishing him from other men was his absolute willingness to listen to its warnings, to stop speaking and cease acting when it objected. The gods themselves had deemed him wise above other men, not least for this reason, according to the Delphic Oracle herself, held to be a reliable judge of such things. Because his ever-reliable internal voice objected to fleeing, or even to defending himself, Socrates radically altered his view of the significance of his trial. He began to consider that it might be a blessing rather than a curse. He told Hermogenes of his realization that the spirit to whom he had always listened might be offering him a way out of life, in a manner easiest but also the least irksome to one's friends, with sound body and a spirit capable of showing kindliness, and absent the throes of illness and vexations of extreme old age. Socrates' decision to accept his fate allowed him to put away mortal terror in the face of death itself, prior to and during the trial, after the sentence was handed down, and even later, during his execution. He saw that his life had been so rich and full that he could let it go gracefully. He was given the opportunity to put his affairs in order. He saw that he could escape the terrible slow degeneration of the advancing years. He came to understand all that has happened to him as a gift from the gods. He was not therefore required to defend himself against his accusers, at least not with the aim of pronouncing his innocence and escaping his fate. Instead, he turned the tables, addressing his judges in a manner that makes the reader understand precisely why the town council wanted this man dead. Then he took his poison like a man. Socrates rejected expediency and the necessity for manipulation that accompanied it. He chose instead, under the directive conditions, to maintain his pursuit of the meaningful and true. 2,500 years later, we remember his decision and take comfort from it. What can we learn from this? If you cease to utter falsehoods and live according to the dictates of your conscience, you can maintain your nobility, even when facing the ultimate threat. If you abide truthfully and courageously by the highest of ideals, you will be provided with more security and strength than will be offered by any short-sighted concentration on your own safety. If you live properly, fully, you can discover meaning so profound that it protects you even from the fear of death. Could all that possibly be true? Death, toil, and evil. The tragedy of self-conscious being produces suffering, inevitable suffering. That suffering in turn motivates the desire for selfish, immediate gratification for expediency. But sacrifice and work serves far more effectively than short-term impulsive pleasure at keeping suffering at bay. However, tragedy itself conceived of as the arbitrary harshness of society and nature set against the vulnerability of the individual, is not the only, and perhaps not even the primary, source of suffering. There is also the problem of evil to consider. The world is set hard against us of a certainty, but man's inhumanity to man is something even worse. Thus, the problem of sacrifice is compounded in its complexity. It is not only privation and mortal limitation that must be addressed by work, by the willingness to offer and to give up. It is the problem of evil as well. Consider once again the story of Adam and Eve. Life becomes very hard for their children, that's us, after the fall and awakening of our archetypal parents. First is the terrible fate awaiting us in the post-paradisal world, in the world of history. Not the least of this is what Goethe called our creative endless toil. Humans work as we have seen. We work because we have awakened to the truth of our own vulnerability, our subjugation to disease and death, and wish to protect ourselves for as long as possible. Once we can see the future, we must prepare for it or live in denial and terror. We therefore sacrifice the pleasures of today for the sake of a better tomorrow. But the realization of mortality and the necessity of work is not the only revelation to Adam and Eve when they eat the forbidden fruit, wake up, and open their eyes. They were also granted, or cursed by, the knowledge of good and evil. It took me decades to understand what this means, to understand even what a part of that means. It's this. Once you become consciously aware that you, yourself, are vulnerable, you understand the nature of human vulnerability in general. You understand what it's like to be fearful and angry and resentful and bitter. You understand what pain means. And once you truly understand such feelings in yourself and how they're produced, you understand how to produce them in others. 
It is in this manner that the self-conscious beings that we are become voluntarily and exquisitely capable of tormenting others, and ourselves, of course, but it's the others we are concerned about right now. We see the consequences of this new knowledge manifest themselves when we meet Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve. By the time of their appearance, mankind has learned to make sacrifices to God. On altars of stone, designed for that purpose, a communal ritual is performed, the immolation of something valuable, a choice animal or portion thereof, and its transformation through fire to smoke, to the spirit that rises to heaven above. In this manner, the idea of delay is dramatized so that the future might improve. Abel's sacrifices are accepted by God and he flourishes. Cain's, however, are rejected. He becomes jealous and bitter. And it's no wonder, if someone fails and is rejected because he refused to make any sacrifices at all, well, that's at least understandable. He may still feel resentful and vengeful, but knows in his heart that he is personally to blame. That knowledge generally places a limit on his outrage. It's much worse, however, if he had actually foregone the pleasures of the moment, if he had strived and toiled and things still didn't work out, if he was rejected despite his efforts. Then he's lost the present and the future. Then his work, his sacrifice, has been pointless. Under such conditions, the world darkens and the soul rebels. Cain is outraged by his rejection. He confronts God, accuses him, and curses his creation. That proves to be a very poor decision. God responds in no uncertain terms that the fault is all with Cain, and worse, that Cain has knowingly and creatively dallied with sin and reaped the consequences. This is not at all what Cain wanted to hear. It's by no means an apology on God's part. Instead, it's insult added to injury. Cain, embittered to the core by God's response, plots revenge. He defies the Creator audaciously. It's daring. Cain knows how to hurt. He's self-conscious after all, and has become even more so in his suffering and shame. So he murders Abel in cold blood. He kills his brother, his own ideal, as Abel is everything Cain wishes to be. He commits the most terrible of crimes despite himself, of all mankind, and God himself all at once. He does it to wreak havoc and gain his vengeance. He does it to register his fundamental opposition to existence, to protest the intolerable vagaries of being itself. And Cain's children, the offspring, as it were, of both his body and his decision, are worse. In his existential fury, Cain kills once. Lamech, his descendant, goes much further. I have slain a man to my wounding, says Lamech, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. Genesis chapter 4, 23 through 24. Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, Genesis chapter 4, verse 22, is by tradition seven generations from Cain and the first creator of weapons of war. And next, in the Genesis stories, comes the flood. The juxtaposition is by no means accidental. Mm -hmm. Evil enters the world with self-consciousness. The toil with which God curses Adam, that's bad enough. The trouble in childbirth with which Eve is burdened and her consequent dependence on her husband are no trivial matters either. They are indicative of the implicit and oft agonizing tragedies of insufficiency, privation, brute necessity, and subjugation to illness and death that simultaneously define and plague existence. Their mere factual reality is sometimes sufficient to turn even a courageous person against life. It has been my experience, however, that human beings are strong enough to tolerate the implicit tragedies of being without faltering, without breaking or worse, breaking bad. I have seen evidence of this repeatedly in my private life, in my work as a professor, and in my role as a clinical practitioner. Earthquakes, floods, poverty, cancer, we're tough enough to take on all of that. But human evil adds a whole new dimension of misery to the world. It is for this reason that the rise of self-consciousness and its attendant realization of mortality and knowledge of good and evil is presented in the early chapters of Genesis, and in the vast tradition that surrounds them, as a cataclysm of cosmic magnitude. Conscious human malevolence can break the spirit even tragedy could not shake. I remember discovering with her that one of my clients had been shocked into years of serious post-traumatic stress disorder, daily physical shaking and terror, chronic nightly insomnia, by the mere expression on her enraged, drunken boyfriend's face. His fallen countenance, Genesis chapter 4-5, indicated his clear and conscious desire to do her harm. She was more naive than she should have been, and that predisposed her to the trauma, but that's not the point. The voluntary evil we do one another can be profoundly and permanently damaging even to the strong. And what is it precisely that motivates such evil? It doesn't make itself manifest merely in consequence of the hard lot of life. It doesn't even emerge simply because of failure itself or because of the disappointment and bitterness that failure often and understandably engenders. But the hard lot of life, magnified by the consequence of continually rejected sacrifices, however poorly conceptualized, however half-heartedly executed, 
that will bend and twist people into the truly monstrous forms who then begin consciously to work evil, who then begin to generate for themselves and others little besides pain and suffering, and who do it for the sake of that pain and suffering. In that manner, a truly vicious circle takes hold, begrudging sacrifice, half-heartedly undertaken, rejection of that sacrifice by God or by reality. Take your pick. Angry resentment generated by that rejection, descent into bitterness and the desire for revenge, sacrifice undertaken even more begrudgingly or refused altogether, and it's hell itself that serves as the destination place of that downward spiral. Life is indeed nasty, brutish, and short, as the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes so memorably remarked. But man's capacity for evil makes it worse. This means that the central problem of life, the dealing with its brute facts, is not merely what and how to sacrifice to diminish suffering, but what and how to sacrifice to diminish suffering and evil, the conscious and voluntary and vengeful source of the worst suffering. The story of Cain and Abel is one manifestation of the archetypal tale of the hostile brothers, hero and adversary, the two elements of the individual human psyche, one aimed up at the good and the other down at hell itself. Abel is a hero, true, but a hero who is ultimately defeated by Cain. Abel could please God, a non-trivial and unlikely accomplishment, but he could not overcome human evil. And for this reason, Abel is archetypally incomplete. Perhaps he was naive, although a vengeful brother can be inconceivably treacherous and subtle, like the snake in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. But excuses, even reasons, even understandable reasons, don't matter, not in the final analysis. The problem of evil remained unsolved, even by the divinely acceptable sacrifices of Abel. It took thousands of additional years for humanity to come up with anything else resembling a solution. The same issue emerges again in its culminating form in the story of Christ and his temptation by Satan. But this time, it's expressed more comprehensively, and the hero wins. Evil Confronted Jesus was led into the wilderness, according to the story, to be tempted by the devil, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, prior to his crucifixion. This is the story of Cain restated abstractly. Cain is neither content nor happy, as we have seen. He's working hard, or so he thinks, but God is not pleased. Meanwhile, Abel is, by all appearances, dancing his way through life. His crops flourish. Women love him. Worst of all, he's a genuinely good man. Everyone knows it. He deserves his good fortune. All the more reason to envy and hate him. Things do not progress well for Cain, by contrast, and he broods on his misfortune like a vulture on an egg. He strives, in his misery, to give birth to something hellish, and in doing so, enters the desert wilderness of his own mind. He obsesses over his ill fortune, his betrayal by God. He nourishes his resentment. He indulges in ever more elaborate fantasies of revenge, and as he does so, his arrogance grows to Luciferian proportions. I'm ill-used and oppressed, he thinks. This is a stupid bloody planet. As far as I'm concerned, it can go to hell. And with that, Cain encounters Satan in the wilderness, for all intents and purposes, and falls prey to his temptations. And he does what he can to make things as bad as possible, motivated by, in John Milton's imperishable words, So deep a malice to confound the race of mankind in one root and earth with hell, to mingle and involve done all to spite the great creator. Cain turns to evil to obtain what good denied him, and he does it voluntarily, self-consciously and with malice aforethought. Christ takes a different path. His sojourn into the desert is the dark night of the soul, a deeply human and universal experience. It's the journey to that place each of us goes when things fall apart. Friends and family are distant, hopelessness and despair reign, and black nihilism beckons. And, let us suggest, in testament to the exactitude of the story, forty days and nights starving alone in the wilderness might take you exactly to that place. It is in such a manner that the objective and subjective worlds come crashing, synchronistically, together. Forty days is a deeply symbolic period of time, echoing the forty years the Israelites spent wandering in the desert after escaping the tyranny of Pharaoh and Egypt. Forty days is a long time in the underworld of dark assumptions, confusion, and fear. Long enough to journey to the very center, which is hell itself. A journey there to see the sights can be undertaken by anyone. Anyone, that is, who is willing to take the evil of self and man with sufficient seriousness. A bit of familiarity with history can help. A sojourn through the totalitarian horrors of the 20th century with its concentration camps, forced labor, and murderous ideological pathologies is as good a place as any to start. That and some consideration of the fact that the worst of the concentration camp guards were human, all too human too. That's all part of making the desert story real again, part of updating it for the modern mind. After Auschwitz, said Theodor Adorno, student of authoritarianism, there should be no poetry. He was wrong. But the poetry should be about Auschwitz. In the grim wake of the last ten decades of the previous millennium, the terrible destructiveness of man has become a problem whose seriousness self-evidently dwarfs even the problem of unredeemed suffering. 
And neither one of those